We know the identity of one champion. We will crown two more today, the final day of competition at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Sunday at the 2022 Rogue Invitational, and it will definitely be a fun day at the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Glad you are with us, everybody, for the last day of competition here at the Rogue Invitational. Thanks for being with us on the Rogue Iron Game. I'm Sean Woodland. I'm going to be joined here in a second by Dr. Bill Crawford, Jamie Hagia, and Pat Sherwood. We have crowned one champion. Alexei Novikov is the winner of the Strongman competition. More on that in just a second. And we will crown two more later on this afternoon as the CrossFit competition concludes. Here's a look at what is on tap and another full day of action. We have the CrossFit competition and we have the Rogue Record Breakers. That is going to be a lot of fun. The CrossFit competition gets kicked off at 10 a.m. local time with a snatch and press. And then the Rogue Record Breakers, weight over bar. Hathor Bjornsson's going to be here for that, trying to break his own record. Got the Denny Stones, Thor's Hammer, and then two more CrossFit events after that. We know one of them. We do not know what the 10th and final event is going to be. Joined on the desk now by Dr. Bill Crawford, and it was a blast yesterday in the Strongman competition. And once again, for the second straight year, we finished up with an incredible individual performance to clinch the championship. What was your favorite part about yesterday? Well, it had to be the start. We had a we had a fantastic implement with the Roga coaster, but we finished with the stones. The stones are over the hitching post, an homage to the, the Inver stones. But it came down to the last athlete on the last event. And if Alexi didn't lift that fifth stone, he would not be the champion. Just like last year, we had to have that lift on that stone, and that's exactly what happened. And what made that even more incredible is that last year, Alexei Novikov was unable to clear that ladder. <laughs> he does it this time. He wins the championship, and it was close. Alexei Novikov besting Trey Mitchell by just a point and a half to win his first ever Rogue Invitational Championship. Mitch Hooper won two events. He finishes in third. We'll have more on him in a second. And Martins Lietzis, your defending champion from 2021, uh, will take fourth. Alexei Novikov, though, delivers when he had to, and he was consistent throughout and really had the performance that Martins Lietzis had last year to win the title. Yes, we've seen a lot of maturity out of Alexei this year. Sometimes he was a little too impatient, and I'll say that his maturity has grown significantly over the last year. He showed that really well when he was getting himself ready for the Husafelt bag. Instead of rushing out, there was no time on the event. And he came out and set himself up. He was methodical. The other guys were finishing, running around, trying to fin do what they were doing. He took his time, and he got the best possible distance on that, on that implement. That showed me that he was mature. He was ready. The other thing that he did is he was prepared for every event. He didn't let anybody get too far ahead of him. And he didn't really have a lot of, you know, event wins except for the dumbbells. But he was consistent. He was always there all day. He did exactly what he had to do to maximize his points and become the champion. And that... Husafel bag carry, the way he took his time there. <laughs> May have gotten overlooked at the time, but when you look back on it, just a little detail that is what champions do in order to win competition. So congratulations to Alexei Novikov. Trey Mitchell finishes in second. He's from five hours away from here, got to perform in his home state, and he caught up with Kiki Dixon last night after the competition ended. Trey, congratulations on your second place podium finish here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. How much fun was it competing in your home state? Oh, it was great competing in the my home state, representing Texas. Uh, you know, all the locals cheering for me. I, you know, the energy in the stadium was uh, one of the best I've ever had in a competition. You did extremely well, finishing second place. But do you feel like there was anything you left on the table this weekend? Um, the only thing I felt like I left on the table was the the yoke to log uh, medley like just a little bit unstable and like missed up the first rep. So that cost me a point or two. So that's 
next year, if they have that again, I'm going to make sure I correct that. Now, looking back, what are your overall thoughts on the competition? I mean, it was a great competition. Uh, all the other competitors were, you know, put on their A game, and that just brought my level up even more for me to do my best. And just so the, it was a great weekend hanging out with the guys and having all the fans here, you know, cheering me on. Well, thank you, and congratulations again. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Trey Mitchell was one of the seven men who did not compete here last year and probably got overlooked a little bit coming into the competition. I don't think that's going to happen again. No, he was the tester for these events last mm -hmm. year. In other words, he was making sure that these implements were doable. There any kinks that were in the, in the implements or the events that he could work them out. He came back. He had all year to think about that. He wanted to do his best here. You know, he just kept coming and kept coming. He's very mature with, with all the events. The main thing that he did is he never fell back. What I really loved about it was that going into the log press, everybody's like, you know, Martins, Alexi, Martins, Alexi. Watch Trey. I said, watch Trey. That's the guy you're going to watch because he was in second place. He came to win, and he was only a point and a half away from doing that. So he did actually have a coming out party, so to speak, in this, in this event. And I think another guy who did that as well, who also maybe got overlooked coming in, was Mitch Hooper. What a performance <laughs> he had, especially late in the competition. Yeah, you know, some people think that, that, that he's probably had, that Mitchell's probably had one of the best rookie seasons of the top circuit and strongman ever. At least one of the best that I've seen in a long time. He went to the finals in the World's Strongest Man this year, placing eighth, and he actually won his last competition before coming in, the Giants Live World Tour Finale. That's usually a rite of passage. He got there and did it, and then he comes in, and the last two events, he smoked the yoke and oak, and then comes in and throws up all five stones Really great technique, but also just kept coming, kept coming. He came from far back in the field and got on the podium. He was a little bit emotional, you know, at the end of that. And I, I don't blame him because he really came out of nowhere and came up and got a podium at this competition. Uh, Martins Lisi's was not getting overlooked coming into this competition, the defending champion. And it just looked early on that he was not the Martins that we saw in 2021 here. I really don't know what was going on. You know, sometimes when the physical's not completely there, the mental can't be there as well. Uh, I know that you know he uh, he did what he needed to do uh, in, in certain points, the hand over hand pull with the Roga coaster. He actually won that event. Um, you know he looked like he really stumbled in the yoke and oak, and that was that was trouble for him. But he's a warrior. He came back and still went after the stones, and gave everything he had. And that's Martins. You always expect that he's going to give everything he had. He comes here to win, and that's exactly what he did again. And we are going to get to see the Strongman perform again today in the Rogue Record Breakers. There are three different events that we will bring you, and they're all going to take place out on the field here at Dell Diamond Stadium. We're going to start with that weight over bar. Hathor Bjornsson is going to be here to try to break his own record. Dr. Bill Sun is going to be competing in the Denny Stone Hold. That'll be fun to watch. And then the Thor's Hammer Deadlift. Now, other than watching your son try to <laughs> lift the Denny Stones, what are you most excited to see in those three events? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> I love all these events. The 56-pound weight over bar, some people say it's like trying to throw a, a seven-year-old on top of a double-decker bus. With Hathor, it's going to be like a triple-decker bus. The record's 20 feet, 2 inches. That is his record. He's trying to, to best that. He can sometimes clear the height by, you know, a foot or two feet sometimes. And that's what I'm looking for, forward to him, trying to punch a hole in the sky with that weight. The Denny Stone hold. We talk about barbells being heavy and stones being defiant. But this is both. Mm -hmm. This is 732 pounds of stone on metal rings. Very uncomfortable, and you've got to hold them for time. The current record, 31.77 seconds. Someone beats that, wins the event, they get $5,000. As Mark Henry says, it's good work if you can get it. <laughs> These Thor Hammer deadlift implements are beautiful. You saw them yeah. last year. To see them in person, stainless steel, they're just really magnificent. Reaching down and holding it like a pipe, yeah. standing up with it, up to 300 pounds. Uh, really, you know, the 150-pound the implement mm -hmm. is heavy enough, but these guys are really going to be going for that that top that top dumbbell. And he's act they actually have them, the Thor's Hammer. I think they've got them to 350. They get, they get pretty there. heavy. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Dr. Bill will be in the booth with me on the call. Lawrence Chalet will be there uh, as well. We're going to take a break from the strongman here for a second and turn our attention to the CrossFit competition. But first, we mentioned Hathor Bjornsson. He is here on site. He's going to try to break his own record, and he spoke with Dr. Bill Crawford yesterday. Hello, I'm Dr. Bill Crawford, and I'm happy to be here with your... 
Bjornsson. So, Thor, you know, there's been a lot of talk about your career lately. I know you came out with a video and you said that you're kind of stepping away from boxing, but boxing must have been a really terrific experience for you. What did you learn from that? It was indeed, but first and foremost, I would just like to say it's an honor to be here today with you and uh, to be here watching the Rogue Invitationals. It's a fucking fantastic event, firstly. I love what, you know, Katie and Bill are doing here. Um, um, just always trying to make everything just, like everything, the implements and the event itself is just fantastic. Um, um, but talking about boxing, um, yeah, I've uh, definitely learned a lot since going to boxing and just about myself as well. Um, what I like or what I don't like. Uh, boxing is, is, is a very tough, difficult sport as, as someone is, but um, I don't know. I guess I, guess I, I like more, more, you know, I, to be strong. I, so li I, like, I, like, I like strength sports. You said you lift, love is, your love is lifting. Yeah. So getting back to that. I mean, do you think this is some kind of training that would uh, help strength athletes anyway, the boxing training? I mean, boxing training itself can help you uh, with explosiveness. It can help your, uh, obviously, your endurance a lot. Um, uh, and, you know, yeah, those, those, those two things are the main, uh, as well as just being tough, I guess. <laughs> Well, you have to be tough, like you said, as being a strong man. So yeah. you had to change your body a lot. You had to lose some weight. So has your body weight increased again some since uh, the, the fight? So it has a little bit. I weighed at the lightest. I was, I was around 142 uh, at the lightest when I did boxing. Right now, I'm, I'm around 160 kg. I'm talking kilograms, guys. Sorry. So, you know, uh, a, a lot of speculation about your possible return to strong man and you know, I know that you're, you know, around 33 years old, which is a time when a lot of strongmen are at their peak. What would that look like if you decided to start doing some strongman? Like, you know, what would be your schedule, and, and how do you think that would look for you if you did decide to do that? That's a, that's a great question. You know, um, as the people hopefully that are watching right now know that I'm going to try to bre break my own record tomorrow, the weight over bar. I'm very excited for that. The training for that has been going very well. I think the boxing training itself helped me to uh, increase my uh, explosiveness a lot, and I'm more flexible now. Uh, uh, and I truly believe tomorrow that I'm able to break the world, world record. There's a lot more to that interview, and we will have the full version up soon on the Rogue YouTube channel. Joined at the desk now by Jamie Hagia and Pat Sherwood as we turn our attention to the remainder of the CrossFit competition. But before we do that, let's look back on yesterday. And it was it was topsy-turvy, to say the least. That's a great way to say it. Those three events yesterday just wreaked havoc with the leaderboard and gave us so many different stories. On the men's side, what a battle between Medeiros and Krenikov. Fantastic. And then you've got Ricky Garrard. What happened to him? Plummeted down the leaderboard, not in the conversation anymore. Huge battle for the third spot. On the women, Horvath off to the races. Gabriela Magala, Annie Thor's daughter. Fantastic tight race there. And then now Ellie Turner, a new name into the mix. So there's so much to talk about for the final day. And it was also cool to see the strong men do an event with a log and then the CrossFit athletes take it on as well, seeing those two worlds come together. So incredible. I mean, to start off with that Roga coaster, that looked like the apparatus alone. I wanted to jump in the cart and go for a ride. But when they got to the yoke walk, walking that like thousand pounds making it look like an empty barbell and then definitely that log these strong men were super impressive it was great to crown our champion in alexi novikov we will crown two crossfit champions later on this afternoon let's take a look at the women's overall standings with three events remaining laura horvath had a great day three she has 590 points she is in the clear right now but still more work to do gabby magawa sits in second by 10 points over annie thoris daughter and Jamie just mentioned Ellie Turner. She is only 15 points out of a spot inside the top three. But Laura Horvath has been on a tear. She won four straight events. She finished second in the one that she did not win in her streak of five incredible performances. And right now, she has momentum and is the woman to beat. Laura Horvath is now done with her first set of five, and she will be the first woman to move on to the sandbags.
257 is good for Laura Horvath, and that is a new record. <laughs> Very solid day one for Laura Horvath. Laura Horvath is in, and she's going to take second place in the event. 97 points for Horvath. is gonna get through. Laura oh, Horvath getting right to work. She is not gonna give anyone a chance to take away a podium finish from her. If you think about yokes in the Coliseum, you synonymize that with Laura Horvath. Laura Horvath exploded onto the scene her rookie year at the CrossFit Games in 2018 and then struggled a little bit after that. And there were some questions as, well, what athlete is she? After finishing on the podium the last two, two years at the Games, she's back. <laughs> She definitely is. I mean, starting off this competition with four event or you know four consecutive wins, she, it is no question she's dominating this competition with that 75 point lead. She doesn't have many holes in her games, but if there is one, it might be those handstand push-ups. And today we are starting out with that snatch and press with those nine parallel handstand push-ups. The the snatches won't be a problem for her at 70 pounds with a dumbbell, but these parallel handstand push-ups, it will be interesting to see how she handles that and if her lead is enough to do some damage control. There's a great battle going on behind her for those final two spots on the podium and as Jamie mentioned Laura Horvath is not safe yet but Ellie Turner, Annie Thorstadter and Gabby Magawa that's going to be fun to watch play out here today. I was going to say allow me to play devil's advocate for a <laughs> second even though it appears to be the Horvath story nah, not quite yet the events that we know here in the final day of competition play very well for Gabrielle Magala and Andy Thor's daughter. Very capable, and even though it seems like that lead is so huge, we have seen leads like that disappear before. Gabrielle Magala, she's young, she's hungry at 24 years old. Annie Thor's daughter is an icon of the sport. Every time she's been at the Invitational, she's been on the podium. She's won the games twice. She's been there 11 times. You cannot count her out. And as you said, Ellie Turner is looking to put herself on the map, and today is her day to do that. Yeah, Annie Thor's daughter making her first individual appearance in competition since last year when she finished second at the Rogue Invitational, so she knows what it takes to get herself onto the podium. And Pat, you mentioned you know, big leads disappearing. That's what happened yesterday on the men's side of the competition. Roman Krenikov came into the final event of the day, the Texas Oak, 60 points back of Justin Medeiros for first. Now he leads him by 10. Medeiros sits in second place. Pat Vellner currently occupies third place, but he's only five points up on Chandler Smith, who had a fantastic finish to the competition yesterday in winning the Texas Oak event. But once again, Pat, Roman Krenikov is proving to be Justin Medeiros' main nemesis in a live competition. I love the men's leaderboard. I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> let's be honest, leading up to this, who is Medeiros? You know, the man to be, he's going to run away with it. Roman Krenikov had different plans. He has been pushing Justin around this entire competition and now finds himself in the lead. And as I said yesterday, Justin has the physical tools, but now we want to see the mental side of the house because undoubtedly, as he laid that gorgeous head of hair on his pillow last <laughs> night, his head was filled with nightmares of Roman Krenikov. So let's see what happens on the final day of competition. Let's look at the race for third place right now that's going on between Chandler Smith and Pat Velder. Smith uh, has a little bit of momentum coming into today. Definitely. He finished that night on a high with that log lift. It was incredible to watch. But Chandler is no stranger to competition. He is a three times CrossFit Games athlete, as well as one of the few who has been to every single rogue competition, here, invitational competition here. He has historically done well here. And I know you guys were doubting and wondering if he still belongs here, and he definitely does. Yeah, great to see Chandler Smith uh, back in live competition. Let's take a look at the schedule for today. There are three events remaining. Now we know two. The final one that takes place at 3.40 this afternoon has yet to be announced. So interesting to see what will await the athletes in the final test. Remember last year the final test was the duel. Well, we already had that format and that took place on Saturday. We're going to get started with the snatch and press. That's at 10 a.m. local time today, followed by the goblet. And then once again, the final event of the day has yet to be revealed. So 
Hopefully we'll get more details on that soon. Joined at the desk now by the two men who have been responsible for the programming of this event, Chris Spieler and Josh Bridges. What do you like most about what the athletes are going to face today on day three? I mean, getting a good repeat in is always fun. It's yeah. fun to see if uh, anybody who got beat up by it last time came back, made the adjustments, mm -hmm. fixed the problem. And uh, I'm very excited for the finale. <laughs> 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 to be announced yeah. later on. And those handstand push-ups are strict, correct? Yes. Because why wouldn't they be? They'd be <laughs> deficit and they'd <laughs> be they strict. Be. Uh, Chris, what do you think with what we know? We don't know the final event yet, but with the dumbbell snatch, the handstand push-ups, you've got the goblet coming up. What do you foresee in those known events giving the athlete the most trouble? Um, I think the parallel handstand push-up being strict is going to be the big separator there. Uh, and I think it's a, a good example for those athletes to showcase how well-rounded they are. Uh, and then when it gets to the goblet squat, I still think that's going to be so deceiving for athletes, the bicep pump, the upper back, and how that plays a role in the muscle up. I, I was curious about that one as well, because looking at it, there's plenty of events that I see, and I'm like, yes, that's science fiction. I couldn't even attempt that. It's, it's out of the realm of possibility. And then there are some, not saying that I'd do well, look at the goblet, and I'm like, oh, that looks realistic, so I'm probably missing something. It's probably far <laughs> harder than I give it credit for. So what doesn't maybe leap out at you when you first look at the goblet? I mean, I think the run. I think the run is going to be seating, right? Seven rounds of running up that hill, right, okay. back and forth. And I think, I don't think the muscle-ups are going to be coming to play. Round like, five. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. But, that, but the last time I thought that, they blow it out of the water. But if everybody is stuck in a pace, so to speak, on the muscle-ups and the goblet squad, it's going to come down to, do you want to suffer on that run part? Right. And the, hopefully the answer is yes, because it will be a fantastic <laughs> show. <laughs> what about yesterday's events either surprised you or impressed you with the way the athletes handled them? Um, I think it was really fun to watch the log. Yeah. You know, athletes adapt to that. Chandler, it was so cool to watch Chandler. He looked just, he had more in the tank. Right? Clearly. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. And then really just like showcasing that well-rounded athlete. You know, it was the duel was super exciting to watch. I love the high-pressure environment and seeing the athletes that are able to step up to that and tackle it every time. It shows a lot of mental toughness. Without question. Yeah, going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to seeing what you guys have cooked up for that final event. Are there any hints that you are able to, to drop or not? <laughs> Don't want to get you in trouble. Be just, careful. Just, uh, <laughs> just enjoy the show. Yeah. Yeah. It will be Good a lot answer. of fun. Can't wait to see it. Let's take a look at the event description for event number eight, the first of the three events that the athletes will face today. It's three rounds of the dumbbell snatch, 100 pounds for the men, 70 pounds for the women, and then the nine strict, because why not, parallel handstand push-ups with a four-inch deficit for the men and a two-inch deficit for the women. Pat, you're a programming guy. You're a fan of fitness. What are, you, what are the keys to the event here? Oh, man, without question for this event, these athletes are so astonishingly capable that even though that dumbbell seems like a boat anchor to me, I mean, they're going to move <laughs> it really well. It's those handstand push-ups, the fact that they're a deficit, the fact that they're strict, all things being equal. If you have capacity there, that's going to make or break the event for most athletes. When you guys are cooking something like this up, I'm sure some names pop into your head about, oh, man, this person's going to crush this. Who are you keeping your eye on as you watch this event? Um, I'm excited to see if – I don't know who's going who's gonna to win it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for, uh, to see if Vellner, you know, yeah. made the adjustments uh, and if Laura made the adjustments. And it's always hard to go against the, the champ, Justin, you know. I know. If, I had to pick a, if I had to pick right a, now. If I had to pick a name, right? Like, yeah, it's going to be a great fight. I look forward to it. All right. That is going to do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for being here, and uh, really appreciate everything you've done for the competition. Let's take a look once again at today's schedule and what we have on tap. It's going to be another busy one. We have more strongman action with the Rogue Record Breakers. And again, uh, that weight over bar, Hathor Bjornsson is going to be here. The Mountain trying to break his own record. The CrossFit competition gets kicked off at 10 a.m. with the snatch and press. The Goblet, that will be at 110, and then that unknown final 10th event will be at 3.40 local time as we close out the competition and we crown our champions. Plenty to watch today, so once again, just get comfy. No need to go anywhere and keep it right here for the remainder of your afternoon. Two champions will be crowned and maybe some records will be broken. Thanks for being with us, everybody, on the Rogue Iron Game. Pat, and Jamie, and Dr. Bill will be with you throughout the day to keep you posted on everything going on. And then Laws, Adrian Conway and I will be in the booth bringing you all the action, including the Rogue Record Breakers. We will see you later here on the Rogue Iron Game. Enjoy the final day of the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
Press and it is a repeat from 2019. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway. Kiki Dixon is down on the competition floor. The men are up first, and it has been a back and forth battle these past couple of events between Roman Krennikov and Justin Medeiros. It has back and forth the entire event so far. And what I'm most excited about is, of course, we're going to do some dumbbell snatches and some strict handstand push-ups, but there's 300 points left on mm -hmm. the table for the remainder of this competition, and every one of them is going to count for these men. And we saw a 70-point swing in the last event, the Texas Oak, to close out Saturday night. Roman Krennikov came into that event trailing Justin Medeiros by 60. He now leads by 10. Pat Vellner. Currently sits in third, but Chandler Smith, who won the Texas Oak last night, is charging. He is just five points back. Event eight is Snatch and Press, presented by Tier. Just three rounds of two movements. Yeah, and it's going to be really fast. The dumbbell snatch historically there at 100 pounds for the men is something that would blow a lot of day-to-day -day athletes in a CrossFit affiliate's minds to snatch 60 times, but these men are going to make fast work of those dumbbell snatches. And of course, the nine parallel handstand push-ups are going to be strict to a four-inch def deficit for these fellows. A familiar event with some familiar movements. What are the keys to snatch and press? You know, there are some keys here, and the first one may not be so obvious, but the rich get richer in this workout, Sean. They get an opportunity. Those that can excel with the parallel strict handstand push-ups are going to have the opportunity to actually attack that dumbbell faster and with more aggression. If you can't do parallel handstand push-ups, you have to actually pace the dumbbell so you don't get back too soon. And, of course, with that strict deficit, 
you've got to know, avoid the sticking points there. Spectators, we're going to be able to see directly when athletes slow momentum from pressing out of the bottom of that handstand push-up, and when you notice it start to slow, you got to know it's not time to go. you got to kick off that wall and rest. Let's send it down to Kiki Dixon on the field. Guys, I spoke with Chandler Smith earlier today, and he said that 2019, this event, was his specific motivator for getting better at those deficit handstand push-ups. He said he went from being below average to above average, not claiming to be the best in the game, but certainly has seen a lot of improvement. I also spoke with Laura Horvath, and she said, yes, yes, I know, I didn't get a single rep in 2019. What are her expectations this time around? All 27. Your lane assignments for the men, the first of two heats. Noah Olson, who currently sits in 11th place, would love to get himself inside the top 10. He is 30 points back of Jason Hopper for ninth place. Athletes getting set on the starting mat to take on event eight, the first of three events that they will face today. They know what the next event is. They do not know what the final event will be. That has yet to be revealed. Yeah, and one thing about the unknown and unknowable is when you know the points that are available and you know the events that are available, you have got to take full advantage because it could be a big weakness creeping around the corner. We are underway, and we mentioned Noah Olson trying to punch his way into the top 10, but he's someone who's extremely familiar with uh, these two movements and could do well. Yeah, extremely familiar with these movements. I think he's an important athlete to highlight because throughout his career, we know that Noah has an ability to go fast, but can he grow, go controlled enough to execute this and allow himself to actually express his capacity and excel amongst the field of these other competitors? And we're gonna find out here in Snatch and Press. 87 total repetitions in the event, and it is Saxon Panchik right now is through 11 of those first 20 snatches. What you're noticing here with a lot of these athletes is, of course, this is predominantly a hinge-based movement. They're going to keep their hips pretty high drive through their hips with a jump as we'll see a lot of athletes leave the ground completely to help make their body in the dumbbell weightless and then receive it with a stable shoulder overhead each and every rep. Jack Farlow moving his dumbbell to the next station as is Saxon Panchik. The two of them will head to the handstand push-up wall. Nick Matthew is advancing along with Cole Sager and Scott Tetlow. Here comes Tim Paulson as well. And in lane eight, Jorge Fernandez is done. Nine strict deficit parallel handstand push-ups with a four-inch deficit. Now, I mentioned one of the keys is rich, get richer in this workout. You'll notice there's not a lot of urgency for these athletes, Sean, from the dumbbell to the parallel handstand push-up. People might be saying, why aren't they running? Like, get after it. But the bottom line is if you get to that wall too soon, you're just gonna stand there. They're trying to pace as appropriately for themselves. Jack Farlow is through and he will be the first man to start his second round of the 20 dumbbell snatches at 100 pounds. Farlow coming in, trying to punch his way into the top 10. He's got some work to do going to make that happen. Currently sits in 19th place overall. His best finish was a ninth. That was in event five. Noah Olson is back to the dumbbell, as is Jorge Fernandez. And Scott Tetlow is there as well. Now Tim Paulson moving back and picking up the dumbbell in the gray shorts. 59 rep mark. Or pardon me, 58 rep mark will be the end of round number two. At 49 reps, they will head back to the handstand push-up wall. Here's what's tricky about these combination of movements. Of course, we're taxing the legs, the hamstrings, the posterior to get the dumbbell, that 100 pounds overhead. But then it's all 
triceps and shoulders to stabilize it over your head. And then, of course, that's the same muscle group that we're building fatigue and testing on the deficit handstand push-up. Marlow continues to lead. Scott Tetlow is about five reps back of him, and uh, Nick Matthew is creeping up along with Jorge Fernandez. Noah Olson currently sits in fifth place with Tim Paulson. Farlow has deposited his dumbbell on the final lifting platform and taking some time to head back to the handstand push-up wall for his second set of nine. Saxon Panchik, meanwhile, is in the back there in the red shirt, and he is still on his first set of handstand push-ups, and now he is done. Saxon Panchik has fallen way back in the pack. Lazar Jukic is also on his first set as well. Farlow gets to work on the right side of your screen in those red shorts. Yeah, Farlow on rep five there. Just five in a row looked all extremely smooth. He's looking very composed. This could be a great combination of movements for him. And Sean, we can't forget what these athletes have already done throughout the course of the last three days. They have, four days, I should say. Um, they've run long, they've run loaded, they've back squatted weights in an event that they have never touched before in a workout for time. They lifted a really heavy log last night. And not to ignore the fact that when we compete in a sport of CrossFit, so much of the work that we do is making a large load travel long distance and quickly, and that means a lot of it starts on the ground and ends up over our head. Their shoulders have some fatigue. Scott Tetlow in lane two has now moved in front of Jack Farlow as Farlow works his way back to the dumbbell for the final time. Tetlow 18th place overall, but coming off his Best event finish of the competition in the Texas Oak. He took eighth place last night in that event. And we're watching some really smooth squat snatches there by Tetlow. He's made the choice that it favors him to drop under the load and meet it where it slows down. Tetlow threw 67 now of the 87 total reps. What we hope to see here is this is where some urgency builds for these experienced athletes. These athletes that have paced this appropriately on these final 20 alternating dumbbell snatches here, this is where they really start to create an urgency to get back to that wall and finish those nine reps as fast as they possibly can. Tetlow continuing to lead Jack Farlow. Jorge Fernandez and Nick Matthew are starting to creep closer to Farlow for second. This is honestly such a great race of, of self-awareness and, and a bit of self-preservation in order to hang on, save what you can give in the latter round, but not put yourself in a bad situation. Tetlow is done with his final set of dumbbell snatches and now just nine reps remaining on the strict deficit parallel handstand push-ups. And Tetlow made quick work of these in the last round. That's where he was able to take the lead from Jack Farlow. Looking strong, gets himself in a great position there. Head meets that mat just slightly in front of his hands. Jorge Fernandez heading back to the handstand push-up wall. He's on his final set. He has moved ahead of Jack Farlow. Now Noah Olson is moving back to the handstand push-up wall for the final time. And there goes Jack Farlow, who is your leader for about half of this event before Scott Tetlow was able to overtake him. Tetlow threw 85 of the 87 total repetitions. Two remaining for Tetlow. Noah up for a quick three there. This is where athletes really have to be cognizant of that slowing or that sticking point quickly approaching as we see Tetlow click down with only one more left. Final rep for Tetlow and then he will run across the fence. And no rep for Scott Tetlow. And folks, he pulled his feet away too prematurely from the wall there. You've got to reach complete lockout before your heels get away from that plexiglass. And that will count. So Tetlow 
is able to hang on, but now here comes Noah Olsen in a sprint to the finish, and Olsen may have gotten him. Oh, oh, oh. what a race. Three one hundredths of a second from Noah Olsen. Edging out Scott Tetlow for the heat win. Now Nick Matthew is done. He's gonna take third in the heat and here comes Jorge Fernandez. And you love to see it. Noel Olson being able to gamify that, that particular event the way that he did shows again, a lot of self-awareness there, the ability to let someone else take the lead early, not be flustered by that, and then be able to make a strong push at the end, really maximizing his own potential there. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see. And Jack Farlow is done. Farlow is across. He'll take fifth place in the heat, 922.71 seconds for the 20-year-old. These Paulson, Sager, Hapalainen, and Panjic and Jukic still out there on the field. 12 minute time cap here in this event. And there is Saxon Panjic, who is closing out round two. And we're seeing a lot of these guys down to single reps, one at a time, which there was a no rep there by Saxon, and it looked as though it was one of those issues, again, with the feet coming away from the wall. There's Tim Paulson, who comes in in 17th place overall. Also coming off his best finish of the competition, he took seventh last night in the Texas Oak. And Paulson is done. And he will trot across the finish line. With about a minute 20 to spare. Sager, Hapalainen, and Panjic and Jukic still out on the field. And we have a little more than a minute to go before we hit the time cap. And now Hapalainen is running across the finish line, so he gets in. And here comes Cole Sager. Panjic and Jukic are the only two men left. And Jukic is running into trouble on those straight deficit handstand push-ups. Noah Olsen walking back to try to coach it through a little bit. Sean, and this is something to note as we watch these athletes finish. We can't forget, this is actually a repeat workout. You know, from 2019, those that were present at the Rogue Invitational, this is something that was present there. Cole Sager has a listed time of 8.42. He just finished that workout in 11.04. Now you gotta consider the placing of this event, what these athletes have done and experienced already. Of course, some of the focus in regards to where the athletes have had their intentionality at this point in the season, and perhaps either not in the most condition that we've ever seen some of them, or it's just the simple fact that you gotta do the workout. And Noah Olson was there to try to encourage Lazar Jukic through his final couple of reps. So Jukic and Saxon Panch, the only two men not to finish event eight, the Snatch and Press presented by Tier. And Noah Olsen with the late sprint in one of the closest finishes that we have seen this weekend in a heat by just three one hundredths of a second over Scott Tetlow. Yeah, and what a race this was out the gate. We've got a young Jack Farlow that led the pack initially. You wonder, was that a lack of experience? Was it a learning opportunity for young Jack? He's got great potential, but did he come out too hot too fast? And then we've got Tetlow, the more experienced vet. We know that strict handstand push-ups is a strength of his. He took the lead right in the meat of this workout when we thought that it was going to be enough for him to hold on to the end. And then what ended up happening is that it showed that Noah Olsen gamified this workout the way that he needed to, understanding the proper pace through rounds one and two in order to edge out Tetlow 
right there for a sprint to the finish. Look at that photo finish there. You don't ask for anything better. What a great way to start day three. That's how three one hundredths of a second. That's how close that was. A blink of an eye. And keep in mind that no rep that Tetlow got hit with on that final round in his last rep. That proves to be the difference. So Noah Olsen gets the heat win as we have one heat remaining here in event eight as we close out the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Event eight is the Snatch and Press presented by Tier. Yeah, and this is a great workout. Again, I, we leaned into understanding that this is a repeat workout from 2019 Snatch and Press. Three rounds for time, 20 dumbbell snatches, 100 pounds for these, these guys, and then nine strict deficit handstand push-ups. And that's at a four-inch deficit on parallettes, which is very different than pressing from the flat ground. And there are three rounds in this eighth event. And the overall leaders will be out on the field. And Roman Krennikov and Justin Medeiros have been trading the lead here. Here are your overall standings coming in to the final three events. Krennikov took a 60-point deficit and turned it into a 10-point lead yesterday in the Texas Oak. Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner both struggled in that event. They are still inside the top three. But Chandler Smith won the Texas Oak, and now he is five points out of a spot on the podium. Well, Justin Medeiros won event six, but in event five and event seven, two very uncharacteristic mistakes for him. Absolutely, and I want to see how this young man responds. We know that he has a strong mental fortitude and ability to let things go and continue to focus on what's at hand. But we could tell last night, Sean, just by watching live that the way that he had to exit event seven flustered him. He stayed to himself. He was quiet and calm. But now this morning, he's going to get an opportunity to really unleash all those frustrations on the snatch and press. Noah Olson has the time to beat at 816.79 seconds. We have 29 reps per round, and we start with a 20 on the 100-pound dumbbell snatch. And Justin Medeiros and Roman Krennikov out front, along with Jeffrey Adler and Patrick Vellner. And a lot like we saw with the early heat, these snatches do matter in the course of this workout, but the, the leader right out of the gate doesn't necessarily end up the one winning that, and we saw that as we already noticed a significant difference in touch-and-go reps being done out there. Well, Justin Medeiros is the first man done with his first set of 20. Roman Krennikov is right behind him as Roman Krennikov advances his barbell. And now down in lane number 10 is Jason Hopper moving forward. Patrick Vellner is done. Jeffrey Adler and... Ricky Garrard are also finished. Yona Koski, Chandler Smith finishing up along with Sam Quant. So all the men moving back to the handstand push-up wall for their first set of nine parallel deficit handstand push-ups. Four-inch deficit for the men here. And Justin Medeiros and Roman Krennikov continue to lead in this opening round. First round of three. And we're watching for some key things here. Of course, the athletes need to keep their feet on the wall. Look at the speed at which they redirect themselves off the pad. This is a really good hint and a precursor to the success with this movement in the latter rounds to come. Yona Koski ripped through his handstand push-ups, and he is the first man back to the dumbbell snatches. And at the other end of the field, it's Jason Hopper working his way back to the dumbbell. So Yona Koski way out in front. Chandler Smith is now off the wall, and here comes Roman Krennikov. Chandler Smith with a time of 8.57 8 back in 2019 in this exact workout. Now Vellner, Medeiros, and Adler are all off the wall. Leaves Ricky Garrard and Sam Quant as the only two men still in their first rounds of deficit handstand push-ups. So Ricky Garrard in the background to the right of Yonikoski. Struggled with those handstand push-ups at the CrossFit Games, and once again, he is towards the back of the pack in an event that is forcing him to get inverted. 
And I'll tell you one of the frustrating things, which I have experienced as an athlete throughout my competitive CrossFit career, is that when you struggle with inverted pressing, Sean, and it's your body weight, it is a unique skill that can't just be built by bench pressing, strict pressing, and doing all these different variations. It's, you've got to get better at the movement itself. So it takes time and it takes reps. Yonikowski has two remaining before he will go back for his second round of deficit handstand push-ups. There is Jason Hopper, who is, sits in second place. Roman Krennikov, though, creeping up. Now Justin Medeiros right now is in fourth in the heat. Time to beat. Upper right-hand part of your screen. That belongs to Noah Olson, who just edged out Scott Tetlow in that tight finish by three one-hundredths of a second. Koski going back to the handstand push-up wall, as is Roman Krennikov. And now Jason Hopper as well. Sam Quant has just finished his first round. And Medeiros and Chandler Smith are finished. Again, we can see Yon in the distance there, just looking very smooth, not allowing his reps to slow down before he kicks down, very composed. Smith and Medeiros kicking up. And there is Yonikowski. He and Jason Hopper fighting for first place here, and the two of them are done. Kosey's going to jog back to the dumbbell. Hopper saw it, and he picked up his pace a little bit. Now, Ricky Garrard has just finished his second round of dumbbell snatches as Kosey and Hopper get started on their third and final set of 20. Then I'm going to tell you the beauty of watching these two guys go head to head is that we've got an athlete that weighs 190 pounds on one end. We've got an athlete that weighs 220 pounds on the other. And then here comes a 230 pound athlete in Roman Krennikov right down the center. And we're watching this beautiful combination of external loading and body weight go head to head. Roman Krennikov and Chandler Smith are back to the dumbbell, but Roman Krennikov has been slowing down on those handstand push ups. Yona Koski right now is ahead of. Chan, uh, pardon me, Noah Olson's pace. 8.16.79 was Olson's top time. Jeffrey Adler is coming back, as is Pat Vellner, Medeiros right behind him, and Bjorvin Carl Gumanson. Joining the men on their third and final round of Dumbbell snatches. There is Roman Krennikov, your overall leader, by 10 points over Justin Medeiros. And right now, he's getting the help he needs to widen that lead. But remember, Krennikov has been slowing on those deficit handstand push-ups. There goes Jason Hopper, who has moved ahead of Yona Koski. Koski has four reps remaining on the dumbbell. And Roman Krennikov is... In third place with Chandler Smith, Justin Medeiros is trying to get in that fight for a spot inside the top four. There goes Yona Koski as Jason Hopper down to four has a few reps remaining. Two left for Hopper. There's Yona Koski. Jason Hopper is getting set to close out his set. Hopper is done. Wow. And Jason Hopper can take a leisurely stroll across the finish line, and he's going to pick up his second event win of the competition. Go get it, big fella. Listen, I'll tell you, he is not the athlete that I would have coined to win this event, and what a great job of execution by Hopper. 6.56.23 seconds. Justin Medeiros is back to the handstand push-up wall. Yona Koski has two reps left. Koski with now one rep remaining. He's through 86 of the 87 total repetitions. The Noah Olson is waiting to see if his time will stand and it will not. Here comes Yona Kosi. He's going to take second place in the heat, second place in the event as he clocks a time of 746.01 seconds. Chandler Smith is off the wall. Smith will take third place in this event and pick up 
90 points. Chandler Smith trending in the right direction with momentum. We know that he is fighting for a position on that podium. And Sean, he did this workout in 8.57 in 2019. Look at that improvement to a 7.55. And he has a chance, does Chandler Smith, to pass Pat Velder. And that's going to happen now as Jeffrey Adler is across. Smith came in just trailing Velder by five points. And now Krenikov is starting to fail some reps. And that could be big for Justin Medeiros. Medeiros only has two left. He's on the left side of your screen. One remaining for Medeiros as he looks to carve into Krenikov's lead. And he will do that. Justin Medeiros sprinting across the finish line. Velner is off next. So Velner is in. So now Justin Medeiros will at least be tied with Roman Krennikov. Bjorva Gumitsen and Krennikov are in a foot race. Krennikov has got to win this, and Gumitsen's going to beat him, and that is going to help Justin Madera. So once again, it looks like the overall lead is going to change. There are five points awarded five fewer points awarded for every spot you go down in their event results. And if Krenikov had gotten in ahead of Gumanson, he only would have surrendered 10 points to Medeiros. But with Gumanson getting in there ahead of him, it looks like he's going to surrender 15. This is unofficial, but that means that Medeiros, if that is the case, will be your leader by five points. But we still have times from heat number one that could factor in. This is one of the most difficult parts about our sport is that as an athlete, you're out there, you've got ups, you've got downs. What really matters is the outcome after 10 scores are input because we're testing for the fittest that are here. And it's so easy to get caught up in if I'm leading or if I'm trailing. Be patient, continue to get every point that's available to you in each event. And it's gonna play out well if you can, you know, stay the course. Again, the deficit will be at least five, but it does depend on what happened in heat number one, if there's any times that got in there between Gumitsin and, and Krenikov, now, or even Krenikov and Medeiros. Well, Ricky Garrard is continuing to have problems on these deficit handstand push-ups, and he is in danger of getting time capped here. Yeah, and this is, this is hard. Anybody, anybody that's viewing this and watching this from home, you understand when you're doing a strict movement, particularly handstand push-ups. When you hit the wall, you can do nothing but wait. You feel helpless, you feel frustrated. You, you want this moment to change as we watch Quant still execute these singles on the dumbbell snatch. But there's not much you can do. Gerard just trying, his feet came off the wall. He just saw it wobble a little bit there at the top. And there is no more costly no rep than a deficit handstand push-up. Yeah, it's up there towards the top of the list. The only one I could think of might be a strict rope climb. We've There's watched that another one, yep. That's true. <laughs> We've watched that one eat some athletes alive. But this is truly one, Sean, where if I have to coach an athlete, if I'm out there myself, what I'm going to always say is you run this race a touch too slow to start every time versus coming out too hot because there's no turning back right. once you hit the wall. Ricky Garrard, who looked like he was getting back on track after some rough finishes in events. He had four straight of 10th or lower, but last night in the Texas Oak, he took third. And he's unable to carry that momentum into event number eight. Jason Hopper, who started the competition with an event win, gets another one in Snatch and Press, presented by Tier. And he will pick up 100 points and looks to get closer to a spot inside the top five as a result. And we've got Hopper here executing these handstand push-ups. I want you to notice how he, he turns his head so his gaze is almost towards the ground. This helps him actually purchase more of his chest, his pec minor, to help him his shoulders and triceps press his body upward. It's a great way to maneuver his body for success, which he had. But then here's our big race here. Look at Justin Medeiros fighting for every tenth and hundredth of a second as he can as he all out sprints across the finish line. He knows that all these points matter. And this could be what gives Medeiros 
the overall lead after this event. Jorvan Gumitsen getting in ahead of Roman Krennikov, because remember, Jeffrey Adler got in ahead of Krennikov as well. Jason Hopper with the event win, the only man to go sub seven, 656.23 wow. seconds. Yona Koski will take second place. And it's Chandler Smith with another top three finish after winning the Texas Oak on Saturday night. He is heading in the right direction and could be in the top three, and he is. And it is Justin Medeiros who does lead Roman Krennikov now by 10 points. Chandler Smith tied with Krennikov in points. Patrick Vellner sits in fourth place now, followed by Jeffrey Adler. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon, who is with Justin Medeiros. Justin, you just slid in as the overall leader. How strategic are you with each and every event and the competition overall? Yeah, man, I think just every event counts so much. I mean, just the ordering of the events makes it seem like the ones later in the weekend mean more, where that's not the reality of the situation. I had a couple of bad mess ups yesterday, so uh, trying to come from behind today and make every second count. Now, how do you handle those disappointments that you're just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely hard to focus on, but um, at the end of the day, they're learning experiences, and uh, I just make sure that's never gonna happen again. <laughs> With the learning experiences, you knew that this was a repeat workout. What did you do to prepare for it today? Definitely, it helps looking back, seeing what they did in 2019, but at the end of the day, I gotta run my own race and uh, come up with the best strategy for me. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, awesome, thank you guys. Fifth time the lead has changed hands here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational, and it's Justin Medeiros back on top by 10 points over both Roman Krennikov and Chandler Smith. Uh, Patrick Vellner drops out of the top three, but he is now 25 points back of Smith, and Jeffrey Adler sits in fifth place. And as a result of his event win, Jason Hopper goes from ninth up to sixth. We're going to keep it here as the women are getting set to come out for event eight, the Snatch and Press presented by Tier. As the field has already been reset for their competition. And it's Laurel Horvath who has a ton of momentum as the athletes are getting briefed on a couple things before they take the field. First of two heats getting ready. But Laura Horvath, your overall leader, she has won four of the last five events. Her streak started in event three, won four straight, and then last night in the Texas Log, she finished second. Yes, all in good effort and good preparation for an event that we assume she's going to struggle with here, Sean. And we heard Kiki talking earlier about Laura Horvath, and she was unable to complete a single rep yep. in 2019. This year, she expects to get all 27 Deficit handstand push -ups. If she can just finish middle of the pack, she will be fine. Absolutely. And and, and with the buffer that she's created, I, I hope that as an athlete, you, you take the floor and, and have that deep breath moment where, hey, you understand this isn't a workout for you to particularly win. Unless we're assuming there have been, of course, night and day changes. She needs to just run the race that she can run. Don't get caught up in the emotion and the speed of the other athletes because that will draw you out of your comfort zone and set you up for further failure than you may be facing with a movement that could already be a weakness. And it is close behind Laura for spots two and three on the overall leaderboard as just 25 points separate Gabby Magawa from fourth place Ellie Turner and Annie Thorstadter is holding in third. Thorstadter finishing second last year at the Rogue Invitational. And Annie's one of those athletes that we've got a previous time for here. She did this workout in 8.08 in 2019. So it's gonna be fun to be able to compare. Most of the men in the field vastly improved their times that they previously let from 2019. So this is gonna be a great test for Annie to really see how does she compare, not against the only of the field, but also her previous self. Judges taking the field as we are set to start women's event eight of 10. First of two, he's getting set to take the field. And 
there is Annika Greer, who will lead the women out for heat number one. Greer coming in 19th place overall. Does have a third place finish. That was in that back attack event. Took place yesterday. Friday, I should say. Ariel Lowen also in this heat. Ariel Lowen, a woman who did very well at a workout that involves some pressing gymnastics at the CrossFit Games in the form of Elizabeth Elevated. I can't wait to see how she does with the combination of a dumbbell and a gymnastics movement. She excelled extremely with the barbell and a gymnastics movement. And now we're going to get to see if those dips apply to these parallel handstand push-ups. Lane assignments on the left side of your screen. Ariel Lowen will be in lane number six. Lowen comes in 11th place overall. Best finish of the competition was in ski bar when she took second. Danny Spiegel, we also have a previous best time for her from 2019, and it's 7.09. She was the one that finished third. And, and to paint some perspective for us as we watch these athletes execute this, there was one Tia Claire Toomey who did this in 6.17, <laughs> Sean, in 2019, only to be bested by her training partner at the time, a pretty fit individual. You may know him, Matt Frazier, with a 6.10. Athletes are set for the first of two heats for the women. Danny Spiegel, who won the Texas Oak last night and didn't have to lift that Texas Oak. She'd already won the competition, but decided she wanted to put on a show, so she got out there and gave the fans what they came to see and was able to lift it. We are underway, and we start with the 20 dumbbell snatches at 70 pounds for the women, 87 total repetitions in this event, 29 reps per round. Yeah, and this is a starting about the way I expected. We're seeing more women in Heat 1 do touch and go reps than we saw from Heat 1 of the men. This weight as a 70 pound dumbbell is not light, but the women tend to handle some of these external loads a little bit better than the fellas do. Danny Spiegel is tearing through these first 20 reps. Quaid sits in second, followed by Manon Angamaze, but Danny Spiegel putting on a frantic pace here to start. And she will advance her dumbbell and head back to the handstand push up. Andrea Solberg, her rep counter right now is not working, but all the other counts are accurate. Solberg is in lane number one. She's on the left side of your screen. Danny Spiegel gets to work on her first set of deficit handstand push-ups, a no rep there early. And again, you're going to notice the same thing from Spiegel here. Watch her take her gaze to the pad below her. This allows her to press more with her chest and not only with her shoulders and her triceps. This is a stronger pressing position for a lot of the field. It wouldn't be the way that we might teach this to our day-to-day -day members. We want them to get inverted. But when you think about competition, you have to do what is within the event rule parameters in order to maximize your output. you got to get back to that dumbbell as fast as you can. And on Anganese in lane seven, and Emma McQuaid in lane four are done with their first sets of deficit handstand push-up. Danny Spiegel got hit with a few no reps. Her feet were coming off the wall before she had completed the rep. But she can certainly make up, make up some time here on the dumbbell. And on Anganese is your leader right now with Emma McQuaid. McQuaid about a rep ahead, but Manganese, Anganese, pardon me, is able to make that up right there. Danny Spiegel is creeping up as she continues to have a blistering pace on these dumbbell snatches. And she has five remaining. So Danny Spiegel is able to make up for those no reps that she got tagged with on the first set of deficit handstand push-ups and now has herself back in front here. And this is an athlete just knowing her strengths and where she can lean into providing time and potential for her. 
to have the outcome that she's hoping for. She can go to work on this external load, get a lead, create a buffer, and then manage the handstand push-ups however she needs to to continue to hold her placing. Now Danny Spiegel will move back to the handstand push-up wall. Emma McQuaid and Manon Anganes have deposited their dumbbells on the third and final lifting platforms, and they will join Spiegel on round two of the deficit handstand push-ups. Still have some women who are back on the handstand push-up walls going through their first round. There is Danny Spiegel who had at least two no reps on her first set. And you're watching these two ladies go head-to-head. -head. You notice two very different styles. One staying completely more inverted. Keeps that range of motion relatively short to lock out, makes them faster. Wow, nine unbroken reps for McQuaid. Evan McQuaid back in front. Danny Spiegel has four reps remaining before she will close out her round. So Emma McQuaid has a chance to get some insurance reps here because we know that Spiegel can do some damage on the dumbbell. Manon Anganez now in second place. She is through two rounds. And this is where we see Emma start to open up a little bit, at least with her cycling speed. She's having more urgency. She knows this is her final round of 20. Spiegel is good. And you know what she's going to do on that dumbbell. Now, even though her feet were coming off, they were on the wall when she completed the rep, and that is why she's getting credit for those. Right, yeah, you just got to show the judges your elbows are completely locked out, and then from that moment, you can kick down as fast as you'd like. And the tendency is a lot of times when you get up there and you've exerted that much effort, as soon as you lock out, you just want to kick down. It's so hard, and, and we haven't talked a ton about it, but it's very difficult with parallettes in themselves. It changes your hand position, you're less stable, so your balance is certainly affected. Emma McQuaid continues to lead, but now Danny Spiegel has her hands on the dumbbell, and this is where we saw her regain the lead in round two. Manon Anganez is still in second place. Ariel Lowen right now is in fourth place behind Spiegel. But only three women are on their third and final rounds of dumbbell snatches. And now McQuaid is done. And given how fast she was on the handstand push-ups these last two rounds, she's going to be tough to catch. Yeah, it looks like she's executed a great race so far, really towing the line of her threshold capacity. We're going to get a shot to see here for these handstand push-ups, wow. These are no problem for Emma McQuaid. She's already through four of the nine. A pause for her at lockout to ensure she was ready. Two remaining for McQuaid. Final rep will count to Emma McQuaid unbroken on her final round and she will take the heat. What a time, 6.17. 6.17.96 seconds for Emma McQuaid. Only person we've seen do it that fast was Tia back in 27, 2019. That had tied her time. Now Manon Anganez is trying to hold off Danny Spiegel for second. Anganez with four remaining. Again, Spiegel has five left. People might be, kick up, hurry, go. She's really trying to toe the line here. You don't want to get caught with a no rep. We watched how that cost Tetlo the heat win for him. And Spiegel just got hit with another no rep. She is taking a break as Anganese continues to work. She's two away from finishing. Here goes Annie Spiegel. Spiegel now with two remaining. Back to Anganez, who is on her final rep. Spiegel kicked off the wall. Anganez is done. And Manon Anganez is going to take second place in this opening heat. Spiegel is done. Danny Spiegel is across the finish line. 735.28 seconds for Manon Anganez. 740.13 for Spiegel. Ariel Lowen, your leader on the field right now, and she is heading back for her third and final set of nine 
deficit parallel and handstand push-ups. Ariel does a good job at controlling her head to the mat, using that redirection, the contact with the mat itself to help her redirect and get to lockout. 12 minute time cap here. And Ariel Lowen has plenty of time to get these final nine reps in. She has five to go. And now she's gonna result down to singles, which is a smart way to at least keep the rep count churning upward without waiting and pausing too long. Andrea Solberg in lane number one just moved back to the handstand push-up wall. She's towards the left side of your screen. She's creeping up on Ariel Lowen. Carolyn Prevo as well is back for her final set. Danny Spiegel trying to give some encouragement to Ariel Lowen. Now inside three minutes to go before we hit the time cap. Lowen is just three reps away. This is a hard movement here. It's all the encouragement in the world is not going to get you up that wall. So it's it's important to stay in your zone, hear your fans, hear your family, hear your friends cheering you on, but understand, okay, I've got to stay composed. I've got to run my race. And there is Carolyn Prevo. Most of the athletes on the field right now are down to singles. Andrea Solberg is done. And she is across, 943.86 seconds. And there goes Ariel Lowen. Lowen will take fifth place in the heat. 957.03 seconds for Lowen. Carolyn Prevo has just one rep remaining, and she is struggling to lock that out on the right side of your screen. She's going to get credit for it, and there goes Carolyn Prevo. Prevo showing us that athleticism. That's a good sprint across the finish line. But Carolyn Prevo is an incredible athlete. She has 11 national championships in four different sports. You understand why CrossFit makes a good fit for someone like that? Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Annika Greer are on their final sets. Greer now has one remaining. And she's able to lock it out, and Annika Greer takes off for the finish line. Dahlstrom, Bailey Rogers, and Olivia Kerstetter is the three women left on the field. And Dahlstrom still has another round to go, as do Rogers and Kerstetter. So the three of them will get time caps. It's just a matter of how many reps they can complete in these final 30 seconds. Yeah, and, I, and, and I'll say, Sean, this is the beauty of, a, of, a, of an event that's programmed just like this, is that we have events that are all going to be tight races, and then we have events that test unique portions of fitness in, in such a way that we literally have women that are six minutes separated from one another in a workout that's only 12 minutes long with the cat. There's Bailey Rogers, not going to get credit for that rep, but it's Emma McQuaid. 617.96 seconds. That is going to be a tough time to beat for the women of heat number two. And early on, it was Danny Spiegel, all with these touch and go reps, tremendous speed. And then she ran into a bit of a sticking point here at the wall, trying to understand what exactly she was doing wrong for some no reps, which of course it was the feet coming off the wall early. Emma McQuaid stayed consistent with her dumbbell pacing throughout. And she was able to pull away and establish herself a lead and ultimately a heat win here to start the day. 617.96 seconds. 
as we are set for the second of two heats here in event eight. Emma McQuaid, the only woman to go sub seven in that first heat. Manon Anganez finishes five seconds ahead of Danny Spiegel and Andrea Solberg with some good work late to pass Ariel Lowen for fourth. Yeah, McQuaid did a great job coming out not, and understanding that she's not just racing those women in her heat, but she's also racing these ladies right here. Keys to Snatch and Press presented by Tier. Yeah, the rich get richer, and we've seen this as the event has played out in our former heats where athletes that struggle with parallel handstand push-ups just don't have the same opportunity to grip it and rip it on the dumbbell simply because... They have to wait, they have to walk, and they have to rest. But avoid sticking points ultimately when you get inverted, folks. You have to understand that when your reps start to slow, you need to kick down and rest so that you don't get hit with a costly no rep. Overall standings coming into this event, Laurel Horbath, who has been on a tear. She won four events in a row. She finished second last night in the Texas Oak, and she has 590 total points. Gabriella Magawa. Sits in second place, just 10 points up on Annie Thor's daughter. And Ellie Turner is within striking distance of third place, only 15 points back of the two-time fittest woman on earth with Emma Lawson, the 17-year-old, sitting in fifth. But this is a huge event now for Laura Horvath. We know in 2019 she did not get a single rep. We know she has a weakness in these deficit handstand push-ups, but she has a 75-point cushion on Gabriella Magawa right now. Alexis Raptis is also in this heat, and she has been doing well over the past four events. All of her finishes have been sixth or better. Absolutely, Sean, and she's someone to watch anytime we get upside down. She has a unique ability to express upper body strength, stability, and endurance with any pressing movement, handstand push-ups, strict handstand push-ups, handstand walking. So certainly someone to keep our eyes on in this event. She won the Echo Press event back in August at the CrossFit Games. Emma McQuaid has the time to beat. That's in the upper right-hand part of your corner of your screen. And we begin with the 20 dumbbell snatches. And it's Alexis Raptis and Annie Thorstadter, who are out front along with Danielle Brandon. Thorstadter in the orange top. And Emma Lawson is also on the lead pace as well. Very tight so far here in this opening round. Very tight as we see athletes Picking and choosing when to rest and how to rest. Of course, this first round is all about keeping composure. Raptus, Turner, and Thor's daughter, the first three women done. Danielle Brandon is finished. Amanda Barnhart is done. Laura Horvath has put her dumbbell on the second platform, and Horvath taking her time getting back to the handstand push up wall. There is Alexis Raptus. With a timely rest, but right back to the wall, again, avoiding the slowing or that sticking point of her reps. Raptus now just two reps remaining, and here goes Laura Horvath. Trouble right off the bat. Raptus is done with her first round, and she's going back to the dumbbell. Forest Otters finish. Laura Horvath is just stuck again. And it's tough. It's right in the middle of the rep. She's lowering herself with control. She's trying to use the rebound or the recoil from her head to the mat to get to the lockout. And she can't keep her body firm and tight enough to press through the sticking point right there in the middle of each rep. Remember, she has a 75-point cushion on Gabby Magawa, but that could all but disappear here, depending on what Magawa does in this event. Now, Annie Thorstadter is also out front in this heat. She's 85 points back. Now, 
Alexis Raptis continues to lead this heat. Annie Thorstadter is in second, followed by Emma Lawson and Ellie Turner. And as the rest of the field is chipping away, trying to, of course, con continue to maintain their composure, they're still accumulating a lot of work with their shoulders on the dumbbell snatches. Laura Horvath continues to struggle. And, I and I'll tell you, it's frustrating, again, from an athlete, from a coach perspective. Handstand push-ups take time to build, and it's a unique movement people may not understand. You can't just press and strict press and push press to get better at it. Our scapula and our shoulder blades function completely different when our hands are fixed on parallettes or the floor and you're moving your body around your shoulder blades. You're not just pressing. It's you're pressing your entire body around those shoulders. Or Horvath in the bottom right hand part of your screen as Alexis Raptis continues to lead. Now the good news for Horvath is that Gabby Magawa just finished round one. Raptus with two, no, three reps remaining in round two. Thoris' daughter creeping up on her, and Ellie Turner sits in third place. Two reps remain for Raptus. As Raptus herself is down to doubles, right? Again, great self-awareness. She can be a strong presser. She has success even kicking down, feeling that sticking point, and being down to singles. There's, Do what keeps you moving. There's Gabby Magawa, who is in second place behind Laura Horvath. 75 points is the deficit between the two of them. Well, Annie Thoris daughter is only 10 points back of Magawa. So Thoris daughter looking to put herself into second place, possibly into first, depending on what she does here and how low Laura Horvath will finish. Now Horvath was able to get a rep in the bottom right. Alexis Raptis continues to lead as Thor's daughter works her way back to the dumbbell for the third and final time. 78 reps is what they need to get before they will start their third and final sets of deficit handstand push-ups. Raptus eighth place overall, looking for yet another top six finish. Her best finish was in event four when she took second place. Yeah, and this is a fine dance here for these ladies on their final round of dumbbell snatches. It's go fast, but only fast enough that allows you to have success with those last nine reps. You don't want to get done with these snatches in 30 seconds and then stand at the wall for a minute and a half. Raffis is almost done. One remaining. Emma McQuaid is going to win the event. That time of 617.96 seconds is going to stand. The second place up for grabs here. And that's going to help Laura Horvath. Assuming Horvath is going to finish dead last in this event, she'd be awarded five points. For Magawa to erase that 75-point deficit, she'd have to finish fifth in this event. I'm watching that opportunity slip away for Gabby Magawa as well. And Gabby Magawa at seventh place in the heat right now. And Annie Thoris' daughter is in second place in the heat. But remember, we will have times from heat number one that factor in. So there is a chance that Laura Horvath could escape this event still in the overall lead, but it's going to get a lot tighter at the top. And we just watched Raptus get hit with a no rep again. Feet coming away from the wall at any point throughout the whole entire movement is going to result in a no rep. Athletes have to not just be focused on locking out their arms, but keeping in a solid body position. Annie upside down, doing what she does, making, doing the common uncommonly well. Just keeping a rigid body position, keeping her body stacked, pressing through at the top. What's also helping Laura Horvath is that Matilda Garns is struggling as well. Horvath is now in ninth place in this heat. If she finished in 19th place, she'd get 10 points. 
So the work that Laura Horvath did in the prior five events is certainly helping her right now. Yeah, and I think she knew that, Sean. It was it was a, a reason for great urgency. Alexis Raptis is two reps away from finishing, as is Annie Thorstadter. Thorstadter is in the orange top now in the middle of your screen. As Laura Horvath continues to struggle on the deficit handstand push up Raptus is done, and it's Alexis Raptus who is going to win the heat. She comes across in 810.99 seconds. Now Annie Thoris' daughter will finish. Now Annie Thoris' daughter is in. Now the question is, did Annie Thoris' daughter do enough to put herself inside the top five in this event? Great job there by Annie. Didn't quite match her time from 2019 of 808, but 824 will be good enough for second in the heat. Gabby Magawa is on her third and final round of 20 dumbbell snatches. She is through 68 of the 87 total reps. 10 remaining for her on that 70 pound dumbbell and Horvath already got a no rep on that one. Velocity has finished up, and Lawson is across the finish line. Amanda Barnhart as well coming in. Looking like Annie Thoris' daughter is going to put herself in second place overall with two events remaining. You see a little back and forth between the judge there, even with Danielle Brandon. As an athlete, you got to just focus on doing the work. If you can ask to make sure that things are clear with your judge. Whether you're arguing a previous call, it's never going to help you get a rep back. Annie Thorstadter finishing second in the heat. We'll have to figure out where that is in the event. Gabby Magawa is still in the field. Magawa looking like she's going to get capped as Danielle Brandon is off the wall and Brandon is across. 10.18.07 seconds for Brandon. The worst score in heat number one was 49 reps. Laura Horvath, if this stands right now, will take 19th place in the event. That'll be worth 10 points. Gonna take a hit like this, every point certainly counts. There's another no rep for her. Ellie Turner, who was trying to catch Annie Thoris out of her third, is also still out there. Turner, though, on her final rep, so she will get in inside that time cap. Turner trailed Gabby Magawa by 25 points. For second. You could have a scenario where it's Horvath still in the lead, but not by much. Thor's daughter in second. And then Turner in third. All these ladies that we're watching struggle definitely got something on their list to go home and focus on for the next few months. Well, people will watch this and they'll see Laurel Horvath. And I think the question everyone always asks is how is she not getting better at this? Yeah, and it's something that you have to talk about. You, you wonder and you have your curiosities. Of course, none of us get to see her day to day and every day in her training. Um, not all training is created equal. There are certain methods and, and things that athletes have to be willing to explore. Look to other sports. What do gymnasts do? What do strong uh, men do? What do power athletes do? And hopefully her and her staff are, are doing those things that are really trying to maximize her individual capacities because this is a weakness she's got to sure up if she wants to be a champion in the sport. Laura Horvath will not take last. Looks like she's going to get 19th, so every point's going to help for her. Annie Thorstadter, second in the heat. Alexis Raptis will take first. But the event win will go to Emma McQuaid from Heat 1 with that time of 617.96 seconds. Now, Laura Horvath has to have a very short memory because two events remain here. 
Absolutely. Short memory is extremely important. Knowing that there's 200 available points still out there for her to go get with an unknown event looming. I mean, this next event, there's going to be tremendous amount of urgency. And we can look forward to some ring muscle ups for these athletes. And she does do well hanging when in the form of gymnastics and pulling. So that could be another opportunity for her to have a, a strong finish. Well, Horvath said she wanted all 27 reps of the handstand push-ups and was well short of that. Yes, it was. And we've got more of what we expected from Laura Horvath. We thought, you know, she opened up discussing with Kiki. I'm going to get all 27 of these reps. Well, I think she got a few. So it's still something that certainly she needs to work on. And then we've got Alexis Raptus, who we predicted would do well when you get upside down. And, and she did a great job at pacing the dumbbells so that she could excel on the inverted movement. And then we've got Annie Thorostadter, who also had a fantastic finish in this heat, executing throughout. And Annie, of course, doing what she does, racking up points, and being able to make some moves on that leaderboard. Event results, Emma McQuaid picks up 100 points. As she's the only woman to go sub seven. And on Anganez and Danny Spiegel, all from heat number one, have the top three times. Alexis Raptus will finish in fourth. Annie Thorsauter takes fifth. That's going to be good for 80 points in her total. And Laura Horvath will take 19th. That will be good enough for 10 points. So Thorsauter carving 70 points off that deficit, but not enough to take the overall lead as Thoris Donner came in 85 points back of Horvath. So things have gotten much closer. Horvath survives. But Annie Thoris Donner is now just 15 points back. Gabby Magawa stays in third place. As Ellie Turner remains in fourth and Emma Lawson stays in fifth. So things getting very interesting now as we head into the final two events. We know what the next one will be. We do not know what the 10th and final event of the 2022 Rogue Invitational will be. Let's go down to the field. Kiki Dixon with Annie Thoris daughter. Annie, you just took second overall with this event. You're 15 points out of first place. You went from team to individual. You're a mom, business owner. What are your expectations Excuse me, for yourself when you come into a competition? Well, my ex expectations for myself is performing the same or better than I do in training. So like, it's really funny. If you look at the standings, I think the event that I'm the most upset about is the air bike and DT because that's my wheelhouse and I feel like I can destroy that workout. So I underperformed, yet I got like fifth place or something. And then I look at the back squat event, I took 10, but I am so proud of that event because that was mentally really hard for me. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Expectations are not just placings, it's me performing to the standard that I believe I can hold. And what had you deciding to go from team to individual? And are you enjoying being back out as an individual? I absolutely am. I love taking the floor with my team. It's such a nice feeling to walk out with your support and your friends to the floor. You're so alone when you walk out to the floor, even though I have an incredible team here with me. Um, but I feel like there's pros and cons with both, and I have no idea what I'm gonna do next season, if I go individual or if I go team. I haven't decided anything yet, but all I can say is I enjoy being on a team, but there's been a year since I competed as an individual. It was last year here at Rogues, and I have been so excited to get onto the floor. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Annie Thorisauter, who finished second at the 2021 Rogue Invitational, the last time she competed as an individual, now sits in second place and only 15 points back of Laura Horvath. Gabby Magawa remains in third, and she is only 15 points up on Ellie Turner. Two events remain. On the men's side, 
once again, the lead has changed. Justin Medeiros leads Chandler Smith by five points. The scores have been updated. Now Roman Krennikov sits in third. So only 10 points separating first from third. Pat Vellner, he's still alive. 35 points back in fourth place, followed by Jeffrey Adler rounding out the top five. And Jason Hopper was able to make up some ground. He moves up to sixth place, courtesy of his event win. Well, two events remain in the CrossFit competition. We'll have those coming up later. Up next, the Rogue Record Breakers. Hathor Bjornsson, the mountain's going to be out there trying to break his record in the weight over the bar. You're going to want to stick around for that. Stay with us, everybody. Record Breakers coming up next at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. The 2022 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by Beyond the Whiteboard. Fitness is a journey. Go Ruck. Go Ruck is the rucking company. They build the world's toughest gear for rucking and training. And by Rogue. Don't weaken.
is up next here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational from Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Sean Woodland alongside Dr. Bill Crawford, Lauren Chalet, and Kiki Dixon are down on the field. Dr. Bill, I know you love this stuff. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to start with the weight over the bar. Hathor Bjornsson is here trying to break the record that he set in 2019. Yes, this is a, this is a classic strongman event started in the Highland Games uh, years ago. And, you know, 56 pounds in uh, Scotland, there's an old uh, weight of measurement called a stone, which is 14 pounds. So this is a four, four stone weight, they call it. You have to clear the bar, not just get it to the height. So there's some athleticism along with this power. Hafthor has had an, ex had an exclusive hold on this event for years. I think close to 10 years, actually, setting the record at 19.5 some years ago and going over 20 feet for the first time ever. So I'm expecting something big from him today, but a lot of other big, powerful men taking a crack at it. There is Trey Mitchell, who finished second in the strongman competition here at the Rogue Invitational, making a run at the record. They're going to set the bar at 20 feet, three inches. That would be the record. The current record is 20 feet, two inches, set by Hathor Bjornsson in 2019. And Mitchell unable to clear it on his first throw. He's got to be able to dial it in and get it to not just, uh, you know, peak, but peak over the bar. But he's just going and going. He gets three attempts. He's probably getting it close to 19 feet. That's a very, very good <laughs> height. Come on, Trey. One more throw here for Big Tex, Trey Mitchell. Oh, oh hit the bar. Wow. That's 12 feet. Well <laughs> <laughs> Give him a little bit of time go, to <laughs> go one more here. Yes. That was his best. He should have taken his time a little more. He hit the bar. I think he could have gotten it over. And Not it didn't a bad just, attempt. <laughs> it, yet, it didn't just touch the bar. It slammed into the bar. Lots of power. He just needs some time with the implement and, and maybe try to dial it in. I mean, it's not just a, it's just not, you know, how strong you are. It's also that athleticism, that ability to catch the weight in the swing and get it to go up. Well, Maxime Boudreau, who also competed in the strongman competition here, will be up next. Maxime actually tried this uh, this past year at the Arnold and uh, this year at the Arnold in uh, March. And had some very good runs on this. And uh, he's a Canadian, so he's seen this event before. It's a classic Highland Games event. And I know he's seen this event before, and he's actually done it. Jerry Pritchett's out there. He's on the right side of your screen. Jerry's a prodigious deadlifter. I'm, I'm really excited to watch this. We got to have him in the booth yesterday during the, the CrossFit event. The Texas Oak is great in talking to him. A lot of knowledge. And Oh, Jerry is, uh, he's hes like Big Laws. He's a strong man, strong man. I love that guy. And he he's kind of become sort of the de facto strong man coach for CrossFit athletes. He was at the games helping out with the uh, the sandbag. And right. yesterday he was giving the athletes some tips on the log press. It just shows everybody loves everything that goes along with this. Maxime. Here's Maxime Boudreaux. Oh, he wow. It. He caught it. First, it. wow. Oh, no kidding. He learned how to throw weight over bar in the last six months. 20 <laughs> feet, three inches. And that, is, that awesome. is a new record. No kidding. There you go. Uh, okay, so to progress, you basically have to beat the greatest weight over bar ever <laughs> to continue in the competition. That was shocking, actually. Wow. Just kind of nonchalantly stepped up there and set a record did Maxime <laughs> Boudreau on his first throw. Oh, perfect timing. Peaked right over the bar, and it got what we say the roll. The flat part of the, the implement landed right on top of the bar and rolled right over. That was fantastic. Wow. We have a new record, 20 feet 3 inches. So basically, we're gonna, you've got to clear the all-time world record to stay in the competition. I think they've, they've kept the bar at the same height, so we'll see if anybody can match that. And there is Jerry Pritchett. This is good. This is great. Getting somebody to push half Thor. Because a lot of times half Thor would actually clear by, you know, a foot or more when he would break the record. So now maybe we'll see something a little higher than just the one inch at a time. That's how he's broken it. He, uh, he broke the, the all-time world record in strongman at the New Hampshire Island Games in 2014 with 19.5 and just an inch at a time. So you can actually follow the years and the times he's done it by the inches. 
Again, Jerry Pritchett is a, a fantastic deadlifter. And really what you're focused on, it's not just standing up with it as much. You really want to get that back to front hip pop. You know, people do hip thrusters all the time. This is a great example of being able to develop that super quick hip pop. But also the athleticism to stand up tall and explode into the weight and get it to clear that bar. 56 pounds is what that weight weighs. 20 feet, three inches. Maxime Boudreau has already cleared that to set the record. Out in front of him a bit. What I would do uh, if I were down there, maybe tell him to put that other hand on his thigh and you can actually brace yourself and push up. So I need to correct this. They've started the bar at 16 feet. Oh, 16 feet. The bar feet. is at 16 feet. Okay. So we, we were told <laughs> on the on the sheet that we had that it was 20 feet, 3 inches. Okay. We're at 16 feet now, so we all just need to calm down for a second. I apologize for that. Okay. 16 feet. All right. Thank you. Well, that was still a great throw. <laughs> It's, it's a little different perspective from up here. It's hard to tell what height we're at. Kind of blocked off a little bit. But and Jerry Pritchett is such a large man that, you know, you, someone of average height, you think, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 20 feet. That's believable. You can Actually, you can see the, the, uh, the, the pipes have the, the record with the red tape if you look higher up. That's significantly higher than 16 feet. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yes. Four <laughs> feet plus. So I guess they're just giving them a warm up. They're making this a proper weight over bar competition. A couple of warm ups and then uh, into the competition. So no new record yet. So we apologize to getting that information out there. We had inaccurate data. <laughs> it felt good to whoop it up for a new record, but I was like, <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> There's Pablo Naganetsny. He was the winner of our deadlift, and deadlift doesn't always transfer. I know I've known some really great uh, weight over bar guys who were not big deadlifters, uh, but you've got to think he's got a shot at doing something with this because of his his back strength, and it, and he's a very explosive athlete as well. Pavlo, the winner of the Tower of Power deadlift, 12 reps with 900 pounds. And we saw a lot of impressive things in that strongman <laughs> competition, but that was incredible. Plenty of height. Ton, tons of height. He's, he's scaring like 18, 19 feet to death there, so that's quite good. And he's going with a left-handed approach. That doesn't necessarily mean he's left-handed, honestly. There he goes. Whoa. Yeah, that was uh, that was very much over the bar. Peak behind the bar. He's going to have to step forward a little bit or just control that peak. He hung on to it just a little bit longer and it peaked behind the bar. He wanted to peak above the bar. There's Hathrow Bjornsson. He is the record holder, and he has cleared 20 feet 2 inches before. He's been training the event also. It's obviously much lighter, but still explosive and athletic. I think it's going to translate into a better throw for him. And just uh, another detail, that kilt that he's wearing, traditional Highland Games kilt there, that is actually Dr. Terry Todd's kilt. So uh, Jan Todd letting uh, Half Thor borrow that kilt for this special event. And uh, I can tell you that's very special to Half Thor and honestly to myself to see that. Terry was a big Bjornsson, man. <laughs> he was, and Hathor Bjornsson is still a big man, and he's not even up to his com competition weight. No, no. I'm not sure that would fit him if it were. <laughs> Everybody's really excited to see Hathor again. He, he kind of disappeared on us for a couple of years. Six feet, nine inches tall, very explosive. World-class strength in every every angle, and he's great at this event. He's going to jump with this weight in his hand. Watch. Good 
15 feet on the bar, and Hathor clears that easily. Yes. Just to get it over. At least they're getting some attempts when we were doing it at the Arnold uh, initially. He really wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't get a lot of attempts at those heights. Uh, when he would go to Highland Games and try to, uh, you know, break that record, he would have a, a way to actually change heights a little more gradually. So swinging it with one hand, it, you know, it, it seems that two hands would you would get more height, but actually not because you get a longer length with, right. the, with that with just one hand. There's Mitch Hooper, who's been fun to watch these past couple of days at the strongman competition at the Rogue Invitational. It still blows my mind that he was actually running marathons three years ago. Yeah, and playing <laughs> golf. Playing golf. I, I told Laws last night, I want to put a driver in his hands and just see how far <laughs> he can hit one off the tee. It might go pretty far. Yeah. Again, he's had probably the best, at least in recent memory, the best first season at World Class Strongman that we've seen in a very long time. Excellent. Easily clear. Nice technique. He uh, peaked it right over the bar. He really cut the swing off. He got a little deeper swing and get more arc on it. So with other, like other throws, throws are radius and speed. Acceleration, actually. Radius and acceleration. So you could probably... Mitch Hooper clearing 16 feet. Explosive to the top, and he looks like he held on to the weight a little bit. He's got more in the tank. He probably got up to at least 17 feet. What do you think? Looks like he had a lot, lot left. Now we're going to raise it to 18 feet. Okay. Eighteen. Keep going, guys. So, uh, yeah, let's take a two-foot jump. Let's sort this thing out quickly. Yeah, let's, <laughs> no, now that everyone's got a warm-up toss in. <laughs> Not six feet. You're kind of able to gauge it a little bit. Not 16 feet. Magnus for Magnuson down there uh, as the judge. You know, Magnus was a great weight over bar thrower himself, cleared almost eight, uh, 18 feet. He actually placed second in the World Championships in Highland Games. I'm sorry, third in the World Championships in Highland Games twice. And both years he did that, he was also World's Strongest Man. So he knows what he's looking at. And he's been a head judge at a lot of different Highland Games. And uh, the weight over bar is a very, very familiar event for him. Kiki Dixon and Lauren Chalet are down on the field. Let's check in with them. Laws, I know you're normally up in the booth. They let you down on the competition floor. What did you notice after that first round of warm-ups? Yeah, it's nice to be down in the sunshine. Uh, really solid throws there. I mean, Thor, great to see him back. M uh, Mitch Hooper looking really good. And Pavlo, lots of power there. Missed that first throw, but you could see the height was excellent. What are you expecting for this next round out of these guys? Oh, looking for me, that is high. You know, if anyone can break this record today, it's going to be amazing. These guys here need to get behind the athletes, lots of support, and who knows what they're capable of. We'll keep you posted. Thanks, Laz. Thank you. Good to see that they let Laz out of the booth to get outside a little bit. <laughs> Enjoying but, a front row seat there. <laughs> but it is true, the athletes really feed off of the uh, energy, especially in an explosive event like this, to dial in. Well, Maxime Boudreau will be up first as we begin round two, now at 18 feet. We did a lot of shouting for him the first We did, and we apologize for that again. <laughs> we, were, we were told that the bar would just be set at the record height. That obviously was incorrect, so. That's the way they did it before. Poor Hefter would walk out and just nail it. Right, it's okay, yeah. new record, and then we <laughs> go home. Yeah, people would go in the back and <laughs> kind of warm up a little bit yeah. with the cold Ohio wind in the parking lot and come inside and nail it. Very different conditions. The nice Texas warm sunshine. Notice they're, lift, they're using uh, lifting shoes, most of the guys. I would agree with that. So there's a couple attempts left. 
Yeah, if he, if he would reach back a little more, and uh, he's cutting it off at the top. But also, too, most of these competitors have been competing all weekend. Yeah. That had the height. So he's got to clear the bar. Lots of spin. He's hanging on to it just a little too hard. Third attempt for Maxime Boudreau at 18 feet. Good run at the weight. That was good. A little more time left. Oh! Hit the bar pretty solidly. Maxime Boudreau unable to clear 18 feet. So what you want to have is a, a, a longer arc and then extend your hips fully. And, and you want your hand to go above your head. I always tell people to try to point your hand at the bar at the top. So look it up and, and see, the, see your hand point towards the bar. That way you're not cutting off the throw. You see if, the, if the, that implement spins really hard, you're, you're letting go late. So you want it to sort of have that nice transition where it sort of peaks over the bar and, and maybe one rotation up. But really good throws, uh, you know, many times will not rotate at all. Another thing, too, is, it's, is that there, some people use a hook grip with rings, but if you use a hook grip, that'll make it stay in your hand also. So you, some athletes don't even have a true grip. They just let it hang in their fingers. They get a little more length in the, in the throw. Um, but I think these guys are probably wrapping their thumb because most of them haven't done a lot of this weight over bar before. Pablo Nakanechi coming back out. He looks thick from up here. <laughs> he is huge. That guy's back is so big it has its own zip code. I think he's 6'4 wide. When he's, if he were to lie on his side, he would be the same height. He is a wide person. Bar set at 18 feet right now. The record is 20 feet 2 inches. Let's see if he can dial this in. Doesn't even Whoa, wind yes. up and gets it over. Wow. <laughs> Somebody's got to walk up and just talk to him a little bit. Just say, swing it a couple of times, you know. Make well, it look like everybody else. <laughs> in the strongman competition, and Law has talked a lot about it, just the raw potential of Nakanechi right now. And if he can just dial in his technique, I mean, he is going to be a threat. Oh, absolutely. Just uh, not only in this event, just as strong, in strongman in general. I mean, we keep talking about him. And, and uh, you know, you could talk all day about it, but Basically, if he continues to progress as a strongman, he needs to learn the events. Uh, you know, um, and honestly, his athleticism, he's got all the strength in the world. I would just work on his, on his athleticism. He's got all the tools. The physical person that he is could definitely be one of the strongest guys on the planet for a while. You watch the Tower of Power event. You mentioned that, the deadlift event that he demolished. You see the raw power there, but last night in the stone over hitching post, you can see the difference between his attempts and him just trying to wrestle those stones and, and more proficient stone lifters and what they were doing. Uh, you know, and no offense to him, but he, he, there were a lot of uh, deficiencies in the technique. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just so incredibly brute strong. I was sitting next to Jerry Pritchett, and, and after he lifted that 400-pound stone, which are not Atlas stones with tacky. These are, right, right. These are natural stones with just some chalk and a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of uh, tacky cloth on your hands and arms, and he just put it right over. So I think, you know, he's just got all the tools. He just needs more time. And that's, uh, you talk about man muscles, you know, like, like we talk about that in Strongman, like mm -hmm. 28 to 33. He's got that already. He just needs more athleticism, more time with implements, more influence from all the other athletes. And that's, and that, that's the great thing about strong men and, and strength athletes in general. They help each other, mm -hmm. and they're happy for each other. I want to beat him. Only if I'm at, if he's at his best, and I am too. Right. That's all. The Hathor Bjornsson, the record holder of 20 feet 2 inches, stepping up to the 56-pound weight, 18 feet now. He really wants to dial this one in, get it over. A naturally left-handed person, left-handed thrower. Oh, oh, that wow. was no problem. <laughs> that cleared. <Yeah. laughs> With room to spare. 
Great job. Oh. <laughs> That's his son. There's half throw with his. <laughs> with his Front row seat family. for dad. That's fantastic. <laughs> Everybody just loves seeing Hafthor back. He's not the uh, uh, he's he's <laughs> he's pretty wide from up here too. <laughs> and like I said, talking. you know he's slim for Hafthor. Right, right. He looks phenomenal. He feels great. Hafthor Bjornsson took one attempt with that fifty-six pound weight and got it over eighteen feet with little trouble. Nice long radius. Nice long pull. He peaked it right over the bar. He's been training on this. He looks great. He did. He didn't really. Uh, he didn't really jump at the weight either. So he's. There's still more in the tank. In other words, he's so explosive. He will come off of the ground okay. with his hip thrust. And I think he hasn't even started that that bit of movement. He didn't even step step up on his toes. He was still flat footed when he when he pushed the weight up over his head. Well, Mitch Hooper will be the next man up at 18 feet. I would love to see this. Uh, I would love to see this clear. Keep pushing half Thor up. And Mitch Hooper was having some fun with the CrossFit athletes and the fans yesterday. They were strongmen were warming up for the yoke log event, and it was while the CrossFit athletes were competing, there was a barbell out there where the, some of the CrossFit athletes were warming up, and he ran over there and, and snatched it and tried to do an overhead squat and put it down and looked at the crowd and gave him the sort of the ta-da, and they, they all cheered for him, and then he had, a, he had a foot race with the sandbag with Chandler Smith uh, behind the scenes that he posted on social media, so he's been a lot of fun to watch. And I think the fans have really taken to him. Hung on to the weight a little bit, so that, that means he doesn't get the uh, he doesn't transfer what he's doing with power up into the implement. But it had, it had good height. He can clear this, no question. He's taking his time a little bit. He's got uh, looks like they're giving them a minute. Nice block weight with a ring. Oh. Mitch Hooper unable to clear 18 feet. That sort of had the look of, uh, it's been a long, long weekend, folks. Thank you. Well, now we will move the bar up to 20 feet, 3 inches. So now we can get excited if someone clears yes. it. And I believe it's Nakanechny and Hafthor, who the, the two men who are left here. Yes. I'll just say it, I, I, and uh, if Brian's listening, I, I apologize, but I saw Brian yesterday, actually last evening, and I was begging him, jump in this. Yeah. The half Thor uh, brian Shaw battle on weight over bar would be epic. That would be a really nice competition to see. Because, uh, you know, Brian's so great with uh, height implements, his, his fantastic power and his, his physical person being 6'8", um, very explosive. Uh, that would be fantastic to watch him be able to do the weight over bar. I think he holds the world's record in the keg toss uh, for height and time. He's just a really explosive athlete vertically. So that would be a lot of fun to watch. They both have the similar build in that they're very tall, and they're both basketball players. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that explosiveness, that athleticism, along with a ton of muscle, means that that uh, that implement doesn't stand a chance. And while we are waiting for everything to get set, let's go back down to Kiki Dixon and Lawrence Chalet. Laws, I was talking to Jerry Pritchard earlier. I said, hey, what is your goal with this event? He said, to not get a concussion. You know, you've been working with Hooper. What were his what were his goals for this event? Well, not getting a good concussion is definitely number one goal. His focus was a competition yesterday. He's having some fun today. I think he can do very well on the nickel stones coming up in a little bit. The Dinny stones, sorry. Uh, that was all about fun. But how good were Pavlo and Thor on this? The record could go. We're ready for it. And I think everyone is ready on the field. So Pablo Nakanechi looks like he will be the first man up. If he can get a couple of swings on, I'm sure the guys are talking to him because, you know, he's obviously it's not, a, not very familiar with this uh, implement. If he got a couple of swings on it, a little more radius and squats down some and stands up explosively, you know, we could see it. 
No question, the raw power is there. Oh my goodness! It's uh, you know physically, he's got he's got the the tools to get this over. But it's also timing. You know, you can get it high enough. It's just uh, it's got to clear the bar. It's way over the bar, not way up to the bar. Which it's disappointing when you see that, but it's just how that works. <laughs> yeah. And I think the uh, officials are checking the height to make sure that that's where they are. They are securing the ropes that help lower and raise that bar to make sure it doesn't move. Right. A nice, uh, a nice uh, weight over bar standard. I mean, they're this. They've made this weight over bar standard up to basically 22 feet, and they've got it almost to the top. I just hope everybody understands what they're looking at. So uh, a little over 30 years ago at the uh, Pure Strength Competition, um, when uh, John Paul, John Paul Sigmarsson and, uh, and Kaz and Jeff Capes were gunning for the world's record, it was like, you know, not even 18 feet. Yeah. So this is how far the sport's gone and the, and the level of athlete that's been drawn into the sport. Here comes Pavlo. You can tell guys are talking to him. So I, I wouldn't overload an athlete in this situation. I would just give him one or two pointers because, you know, he is, a, he is a great athlete. He's very strong. I would just want him to focus on standing up as hard as possible and looking at the bar when he stands up to see if it will clear it. Pablo Nakaneshny, who needed just one throw to clear 18 feet and didn't even wind up. <laughs> it was more of a snatch just than anything. <laughs> Said, what, this over that? Okay. And now he does not wind up and didn't get close on that one. Does get a long pull, though. Look great. I mean, you know, for for uh, basically, you know, looks like he's just trying this maybe for one of the first times. He looks really good at it. Good wind up. Got a couple of them. I would go with his approach with just doing one because that looked like that sort of. Yeah. Few, now let's look at him shake his hand. There's a ton of pressure mm -hmm. when you pull when you put that torque on on that on that weight. A ton of pressure is in your hand. Yeah, Fifty six pounds is what that weighs. Oh. Three Not quite there, from Nakanetsky, yeah. but. The record stands, 20 feet, 2 inches, and the man who set it in 2019 is coming up next. I really would love to see this, this happen in front of this crowd, with this enthusiasm. I mean, does it get better than this? I mean, we're, we're here at the Rogue Invitational. We're watching record breakers. It's a beautiful day. This gets, this gets no better than this. Perfect setting. And I've seen Hathor clear uh, weight over bar attempts in uh, cold weather and rain. So, <laughs> and we've had both <laughs> here the, the past couple of days. Here we have we've had every condition possible. I think Friday was a really rainy day. We they actually pushed competition back a couple hours to avoid the worst of the weather. We had some wind on Saturday, and it seems like we have the ideal conditions here today to close things out. And I see Brian Shaw in the background over there. He's eyeballing the, the event. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Maybe ask if they have one of those red T-shirts back too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just hand it to him. Let yeah. him have it. Come on, Half Thor. Really want to see this. Wearing Terry Todd's kilt in Texas for the weight over bar record. Yeah, come on. Bring back the magic, Half Thor. You got it. Wow, now that was legit. Whoa, and easily. Wow, at least six inches above. That's what we were talking about. You have to see it in person to understand. It's not just that he clears the height, that he puts so much room between the bar and the weight. Unbelievable. 20 feet, three inches, a new record for half Thor Bjornsson. <laughs> and it took him one attempt. <laughs> but you also saw, you know, he did some... 
he put on some extra, you know, some extras on that. He was just trying to clear, warming up, and then on that one he did the things that he needed to do, which was a little more radius and a little more explosion up. That was a great moment. <laughs> Good job, Dad. <laughs> oh wow. But he, uh, he, if you'll notice, he did come off of his feet some there, and, and he got up on his toes and really ex ex just exploded into the weight. His vertical power output is phenomenal. Now the question is, does he go again? Do they raise it up a little bit more? Well, you know, that's his <laughs> choice, I guess, as the only athlete in the competition still, and he would have, you know, have another set of attempts. Or does he say, okay, maybe we go up an inch or two the next time? You know, we just, we just hold off on that and, and keep moving upwards. What an impressive throw from Hafthor Bjornsson to break his own record, the record that has stood for now three years is no more. 20 feet, two inches, the old record. 20 feet, three inches is the new mark. I think he's uh, feeling pretty confident, and he's just letting it rest. Why not? Always Why not? End, on, end on a positive. Absolutely. He did break the record. He came here to do that all the way from Iceland and nailed it. First attempt, no questions asked. And uh, that just shows he's still, got that, he's still got a ton of explosive power in his body, and his athleticism stands out also. I mean, the fact that he hasn't been in competition some, some time, and that's it. Let's take one more look at Hathor Bjornsson's record throw before we hear from him. And Long radius. He's reaching way back. Up on his toes. Wow. Good six inches over the bar. Perfect. Peaks right over the bar. Fantastic. That is absolutely perfect. No questions asked. Hathor Bjornsson. New record for Hathor Bjornsson, and he is with Kiki Dixon. Hafthor, it's great to have you back on the Strongman competition floor, especially when you're setting records. But how good does it feel for you? Uh, it feels amazing, especially being here at Rogue Invitationals. Um, Bill and Katie do us such a great job um, doing this, and obviously everyone else involved. Uh, thank you to the fans for coming. Uh, it's been a great show. Uh, my record today, it's in honor of my good friend, Terry Todd. Um, he actually gave me this kiss right here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased, I'm super happy, and uh, I actually can't wait to see the rest of the show, see the rest of the records, see the rest of the people in CrossFit competing. It's a tight competition. Uh, and congrats to Alexi Novikov yesterday for, for winning the show. No, I feel like we're missing some of you. You found your ideal fighting weight, right? And now there's talk of you coming back into the strongman side of things. But what does ideal fitness look like to you if you make a comeback? Uh, so. I'd be lying if I would not say um, Really, it's really tempting to come back, especially to compete in a show like this. Um, you know, you never know. I haven't made up my final, I haven't made up my decision to, today, but I can tell you this, I might come back. <laughs> we will certainly keep our eye out. Congratulations on your record. Thank you so much, and thank you guys. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> Hafthor Bjornsson with a new weight over bar record. We still have two more events to go. Yes. But uh, impressive performance. And as you alluded to, and as he mentioned, it, it makes it extra special that he's here in Texas and he's wearing Dr. Terry Todd's kilt. Yes, that was, that's very special. And to break that record in that kilt in these conditions. But, you know, he's, he's thinking he's, uh, he's, he's compromised. Not compromised. He's negotiating with himself. You know, everything that goes in, into becoming a world-class, top-level strongman. Because, you know, our conversation yesterday and, and the interview and just talking with him around that, he, he's not going to come back just to come back. He's going to come back to be – he doesn't want to just uh, right. participate. He wants to come back and be half tour and win. We have one event down. We have two left. The Denny Stonehold and Thor's Hammer coming up next. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return – 
see if we can break some more records here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
One record has already fallen. Will we see another? The Denny Stone hold coming up next year at the 2022 Rogue Invitational from Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland alongside Dr. Bill Crawford and Lawrence Chalet and Kiki Dixon are down on the field. Who's this young man, Dr. Bill? That would be my son, Billy Crawford. Uh, he held the uh, replicas last year for uh, 17 seconds and held the actual Denny Stones this year uh, for 27 seconds. That is the fifth longest time with the Denny Stones themselves. So he, he's only 20 years old, just turned 20, uh, but uh, is uh, second in the U.S. in Moss Wrestling for his weight class and competing in the World Championships in December. Very experienced with these implements. Um, so... Hope we can line up a pretty good time. He's been working with the crew all this weekend, so <laughs> 732 pounds of weight. We like to say that they are, this is uh, stone, steel, and pain. Not only just having the strength to lift them with your hands and your back, but also the ability to lift them and hold them. He, when he's trying to get them in the right place where they, they balance when he picks them up. Showing his experience, that's going to help the other strongmen also. The record is 31.4 seconds. That was set by Mark Felix at the Arnold in 2020. Actually, it was broken last year. Was uh, it really? Yeah, Josh Digpen from Texas came up, 31.77. Okay. So, 31.77. So, Billy's straddling them. He's going to use a hook grip, and he's going to likely uh, lift the, the back stone first and then ballast the, the front stone backwards. Get a big pull, getting them off the ground first before he can hold them. That's it. You got to lift them first. Judges down on the floor to see if he gets them up. They're up. Off the ground. Keep going. You want to breathe now. Come on. Break your, break your time from last year. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You got it. Keep going. You got it. Keep going. Great time so far. Great time. Keep it going. Oh, great time. That was impressive. Very impressive. Only 20 years old. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be awesome for you to watch that. That's more than awesome. I, I have to say something. Uh, we were the first uh, father-son that we know of that actually lifted the Denny Stones on the same day. That was a great honor. Jan Todd lifted the Denny Stones with straps some years ago. 40 years ago. 20.81 seconds. 20.81. That's a better time for him. He actually said that these were harder for him than the Denny Stones. Hit the Denny Stones, he said they just fit me better. So there is a difference. One is the handles are different. The uh, the rings on the Denny Stones, the big, the, the uh, large stone has a thicker handle. Next up is Romark, who many of you know is Martins Lietze's sort of assistant slash hype man. So this will be fun to watch as Lietze now gets to play the role that Romark plays for him. Being his hype man. Yeah. I like it. Romarx is very strong. Um, he actually can do uh, uh, hack squats. There are videos of him doing hack squats, so repetitions with 500 pounds, meaning that he deadlifts the bar from behind his heels. That's a, an incredible uh, lift because also it's not, you know, not cross-handing and all those things. So Romarx is strong. Uh, Jack Shanks, who lifted these stones in 1972, uh, for the first time since Donald Denny himself without straps. He himself was, was only about 180 pounds. So this lift is really about leverage and hand strength. Come on, that is great to see. <laughs> That's having your friend back you up. That's great. Not a bad guy to have in your corner. No, no. Here goes Romark, who is usually trying to fire up Martins Lisi's and he They're has up. them oh. up for Oh, come on now. Get them up. Stand up with them. Pull, pull, pull. Uh, I don't know if that front quite, one is off the ground. No, he just can't quite break it. Needs to get his feet out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but what a great attempt. Great attempt. I mean, it, it takes guts to get out there in front of this crowd and try and do something like that. Absolutely. Particularly, this is like a five-time body weight lift or something. Speaking of that, Chloe Brennan. Chloe Brennan that's here at the, at the Arnold. That stole that whole show, this whole massive competition with the Denny Stones. And here comes 145-pound Chloe Brennan, and she picked them up, barehanded off the floor, and held them for almost two seconds. 
Kevin Ferris is coming up next. He's a man who's very experienced moving these stones from one point to another. But you mentioned Chloe Brennan and, and the Arnold. And when she came out there, you met 140 pounds. And you think, okay, well, this is going to be That's nice. good for you. <laughs> you know. And then broke them off the ground and probably was the moment of that entire weekend uh, festival. Unbelievable. Just so cool to watch Chloe Brennan lift those. We, we, we saw her become a star. You know, she was already a star, but she set up. She actually uh, goes to, uh, she lives in England. She's been to Scotland before. And so Kevin Ferris has carried these, carried these, not just held these. He's carried these for 25 feet. And so that was a total of 27 seconds. So I think if he just hangs on to them for the amount of time they had to carry them, he'll get a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, time out of this. I think it also puts in perspective, you know, Billy Hilden for 20 seconds. You know, maybe he felt like he could have done a little more. But, you know, that another competitor didn't get him off the ground. They're heavy. And they fight you. 31.77 seconds. So the Denny Stones the are named after the great Donald Denny. Um, he would use them to ballast uh, basically a platform to sw uh, hang over a bridge. And he and his father would repair uh, stone bridges. And uh, there was a myth that he'd carried them the length of the Petark Bridge, which is like 200 feet. That's not what happened. He carried them from one side to the other, which is 17 feet, exactly 17 feet. So, so that's, a, uh, that's a record that, you know, that's the record that people are looking to do. So, and so Kevin is as asking for a little bit different orientation of the stones. I guess you could say dealer's choice. And these, these uh, replicas were made in Old Meldrum in Scotland. Uh, if you watch Stoneland, we went to the actual uh, stoneworks where they were, they were fashioned. And they were, uh, if you'll see some kind of like, looks like some chips were knocked off of them. They were to make them exactly the weight of the Denny Stones. And I think from up here or on the screen, they don't look so big, but when you get next to them, they are yeah. huge. Oh, look, side to side. He's not straddling. He's doing a side to side technique. Well, this is what he's used to doing when he's moved them. Right, exactly. This is like Mark Haydock, the great stone lifter from Scotland, who's, who's done this quite a bit as well. So. Easily up. Notice he's got a hook grip. He's got a great hold. He's breathing. He's concentrating. He's going to his happy place. <laughs> That's, a, that's what you need to do. Just keep that hook grip in place and stand. This is 732 pounds on those rings. He must be over 10 seconds. See the strain on his upper back. But he's talking to the crowd. Keep going. Make sure you're breathing. This is the big one. Make sure you're taking a breath. You feel like you're going to black out. He's fighting it. Oh, down. Oh, no. Oh, wow. I'm not sure that was the 3177. Great, great work, though. Impressive effort for Kevin Ferris, and he'll check the time. Official time going on the card 37. 37 seconds. Did I hear that 37? correctly? 37? 37, 37 seconds, that's it. 57 58 for wow. Kevin Ferris. <laughs> 37-58. Now that is the record. So there's no more dispute about what, what the record is. That is it so far. Wow. Wow. You know, a uh, little on the inside, he did say 40 seconds was the goal, so there you go. <laughs> he didn't break the record. He shattered the record. So this isn't just record breakers. This is re record shatterers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're two for two so far. That's Half fantastic. Hathel Bjornsson beats his weight over bar record, and now Kevin Ferris sets the new mark in the Denny Stone hold, 37.58 seconds. Taking a different type of technique, Kevin stands up with them side to side instead of a straddle, which in many ways is harder because that's right against your legs. You've got the hook grip on the implements holding them, no shaking whatsoever. He's breathing, he's concentrating on just taking the next breath and going to that nice happy place. I don't know if he had anyone calling time, but he went way over the record, over 37 seconds. That is phenomenal. 
the actual uh, Denny Stone hold time is about 40 seconds. So we're seeing we're seeing phenomenal times here. John Eklund is going to be up next. There's been a lot of attention to uh, the Denny Stones and Denny Stone holding some, uh, for the last several years, and that's been really great. It's to keep the memory of these stones alive and keep them in, in people's hearts and minds. And you can actually train these at home. You know, you can use uh, get some loading pins that uh, that uh, actually Rogue sells and get the uh, handles, uh, get the ring handles. So he's setting up with a with a hook grip. He's a great boss wrestler. Great grip. The muscles standing out in his forearms as he pulls on them. He's got them up. Good hold. He's breathing. He's holding straddle technique. I hope that was close to 10 seconds. That was a very good attempt. Excellent. <laughs> he had to catch himself. You run out of breath. Yeah. You forget to breathe. It's a lot of strain, Valsalva. <laughs> And he's an under 105 competitor. Not a bad effort. Great effort. I mean, really, just to lift these stones is that's the that's really the goal, just to lift them. We're do, they're doing it for time. How how long can you hold these stones? I don't think me and three of my strongest friends could hold them for that long. <laughs> so David Webster found the original Denny stones in a river, the River Potark, and they had been lost for probably close to 100 years in the early 50s, uh, 1953. He found them and pulled them out of the river, and he and his friend Alex Thompson, who was his Alex Thompson, who was his uh, training partner, dragged them out of the river and got them up to the stands and up to the uh, to the pub, and people were shocked by that. Clint Martin so will be the next man to go. Clint Martin, who is from right here in Austin as a University of Texas strength and conditioning coach, had a chance to talk to Clint last night. He's been training, and uh, he's. He's really uh, he's really keen on getting some getting a good time here. Billy's going to go help him set up the stones and be a second for him. Clint's a very strong guy and and uh, and he's trained some some of the top throwers from America for some time. I believe someone named Ryan Krauser, two-time gold medalist in the shot put, world record holder. So he knows. The, Clint knows what strength is. Come on, Clint. Get a big time here. It's just exciting to see new faces trying these, these stones. That, that, that shows that a lot of people are focusing on these. Come on, get them up. Come on, Clint. Up easily. Very nice. Hold him. Keep going. Don't forget to breathe. Oh, great, great effort. Again, just to get him off the ground is fantastic. I can't imagine what that feels like after a while in the palm of your hand with that much weight pulling down with that ring. Well, with the hook grip, you actually hold it a little bit further down, not just in the palm, but really just above the joints of your fingers. Um, and, some, and if you don't hold it with the hook grip, you'll turn your wrist over a little bit so it pulls back mm -hmm. and, you, and, it, and it kind of digs in. But if it's a hook grip, it kind of lays a little bit further down and get a little bit longer so you can see people doing that. I can tell you this, the hook grip is extremely painful. Yeah. So you have to overcome that pain. You have to train your thumbs and your, your hands to handle the hook grip. It's actually tougher than just the regular grip. But it does offer that ability to... It's like using basically a strap, using mm -hmm. your thumbs like straps, which, you know, flesh and blood, and it does it does hurt. Oh, boy. Here comes Mitch Hooper. Oh. I also love to see the, the strongman competitors from this weekend coming out to mm -hmm. do the record breakers. That is fantastic. And we still have Thor's hammer coming up. You can see those beautiful implements laying out there on the floor. Let's see if Mitchell can beat that record, 37.53. Wow, that is just a really great time. Over six seconds above the time. That's fantastic. And 
Mitch is getting set for his attempt on the Denny Stones. So it'll be interesting to see what technique he uses. I bet he uses a side to side because that straddle is just awkward. And he's a strong man, so he's going to pick him up like a farmer's walk. It'll be interesting to see if he actually hook grips or if he just reaches down and picks them up. And he's a Canadian, so he's going to have a great grip. <laughs> I always say that, but it is true. Oh, he's setting up a hook grip. Okay. <laughs> side to side with the hook grip. Mitchell, easily Oof. up. Yes. Okay, keep breathing. That's it. Hold on to him. He looks really solid. He's not shaking. He's just focusing on taking that next breath, going to his good place. Focusing. Come on. Come on, Mitchell. Keep going. Keep going. You got this. That's it. Break 40. Hang on. No shaking. He's looking good. He's looking pretty comfortable. That's He's it. He's got to be getting close. He's got to be getting close. He's right there. Don't you put those down. Hang on to them. He's got it. I think he's going to get it. I think he beat it. Oh, wow. I think he did it. That was a great effort. Unbelievable. Thirty-nine seconds. Wow. <laughs> this is great. This is even better than we thought it would be. That is great. Two times broken. Not just breaking it, shattering it, and then re-shattering it. This was creeping up by, by you know, like a tenth of a second. 39.85 officially for Mitch Hooper, so sorry, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and $5,000. 37.58 seconds we thought was. I thought that was it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mitchell. 39.85. Well, it, it, I mean, he's, he's on the podium for the Rogue Invitational Strongman. So, you know, he's, he's obviously got the strength to uh, do such a thing. Some of it turns into, does it, you know, the technique and can you actually, can you, actually uh, you know, stand up with them. But when he hook gripped and took the side to side, and with his back and hip power, mm, we knew that would be close. Is that our last competitor? Well, the two men who break the record use the same technique. Yes. Great pickup. Easily done. He's not shaking. He's focusing. He's focusing on breathing. Why do I say that? Because all that pressure on your chest and you're straining and you're holding and you're straining and you're holding. Intense pressure in the hands. Your body says stop, and you have to tell your body to stop that and keep going with it. Unbelievable time. Beautiful effort for the new record of 39.53 seconds. Shattering the old record that was just set over two seconds. Astonishing. Wow. Kevin Ferris beats it, and then... Mitch Huber says, hold my beer. Hold my beer. Let me see <laughs> I'm going to go hold some stones. <laughs> after, the whole, after this whole week of competition, look at that. We have one event remaining, and it is Thor's Hammer. And Martins Lietzies won this event last year. He was able to lift the 300-pound hammer. These are beautiful implements. I'm really excited for this event. And uh, Rogue just, you know, they made something that's super special. Uh, and it's very deceptive as well, you know. I mean, but it's one hand. It's a one-handed lift, and the even the 200-pound hammer that they're going to start with is that is a fantastic lift. Just just really really beautifully engineered, putting a little bit of chalk on the handles, and they're they're weighted exactly to each each weight. And the best part about it is they're all the same size. They just filled the uh, the implement with the correct amount of, uh, of shot or weight to be able to pick them up. Well, Martins Lietzies will be out first, who won this event last year. And the weights go from 200 to 225 to 250 to 75, 300, 325, and then finally at 350. Uh, 
Yes, her first one was no problem. Easy, no problems whatsoever. Looked great. Warming up both hands just in case. <laughs> Because you don't know which which hand's going to really uh, mm -hmm. really be the one that you can lean on. And there are those beautiful hammers out there, and we, we talked about this. Laz and I were talking about this you know, throughout the competition of the, in the strongman competition that you, know, you can test the elements that of strength that were tested these past couple of days in, in a lot of different ways, but. You know, let's build a roga coaster. Let's build a tower of power. Right. And it, the implements that are used are, are spectacular to see too, and it, it certainly adds to the viewing experience. Absolutely, it's uh, it's 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 wonderful to watch these very unique implements, and it's a unique event. Basically, there there are a lot of grip tests that are that that you can have, but this being essentially a new one. Okay, Romarx is coming out. And this would definitely be over body weight. He pulls this 200. That shows that shows an extraordinary amount of hand strength. Come on, Romarx. Love the fact that he's getting out there and going after these things. I love it. But he's from Ode Haugen's gym, which is a grip gym. Oh, my goodness. He wow. just stood up with that. Yes. Wow. So, basically, the other guys would have to pull closer to 325 or 350, which, be, which would be the record. Just to do what he just did, that's an over-body weight lift. Great job, Romarx. But uh, these are beautiful implements, and I do agree. Have, being able to uh, fabricate these, these, these new events and continuing to push the ideas of, you know, what, are this, what, is, what is strength comprised of? And, and continuing to make sure that the past is also honored as well. Kevin so, Ferris is going to be up next, who was briefly... The Denny Stone <laughs> record holder at 37.58 seconds until Mitch Hooper beats it at 39.85. You know he's got the grip to, to be able to do very, very well in this, this event. I don't think this is going to be much more than a minor inconvenience for Kevin. Nope. <laughs> Easily no done. No problem. Easily done, no problem whatsoever. You know that when you uh, Big Laws uh, actually competed in this last year, but we had a chance to kind of play with these implements when they first brought them out last year. And, you know, you know, pull on the handles. You can easily lift the say the 200. You get to the 225, and you can't break it off the ground. That 25 pounds is nailed to the ground. So, as we move on, it'll sort itself out very quickly through the athletes. But what this does do is actually. It's not, just a, it's not just a grip, it's also supporting strength. How well can you hold on to something? And this thing wants to slide out of your hands once you start. John Clark Eklund will come out next. Again, a world-class Moss wrestler. Oh, that was easy. You mean just like this? Okay. <laughs> Very easy. No problem. Well, Moss wrestlers do have uh, fantastic grips. They have to. Uh, anyone that we keep saying Moss wrestling, Moss wrestling, but that's the event where you try to pull each other over a board mm -hmm. while uh, pulling on a stick. It's like a moving deadlift. Um, how much pressure do they exert on those sticks and how much grip do they have? I've actually seen those, those uh, Moss wrestling sticks broken, and that is – an unbelievable amount of force. So Moss wrestlers are known for their back strength and their grip strength. So we've got a couple of Moss wrestlers who have been competing in this. This is perfect for them and the strongman. Dale Shoemaker will be out next, and he is a rogue employee. Big Dale. Just for the work he does, he's probably got a yeah. fantastic grip. He's been working hard all weekend, all week really, to get everything here, get it all set up. No problem. Blowing right through it. So far, every man who's come out has been able to lift that. And Maxime Boudreau will come up next.
looks like he's focused and ready to pull on this. And I'm pretty sure this is the first time he's seen this. But he is also a Canadian, and he'll have a great grip also. Easily done. Remember him when he had his, uh, his big splash in 2020 at the Santa Monica show, mm -hmm. the Santa Monica Arnold show? And uh, he showed his grip there as he won the, he won the farmer's walk. Yep. And they had, to, they had to carry, set him down, carry, set him down, then carry again. And that really tests your grip. Okay, next up is Pavlo. Just so powerful. I can't wait to see the rest of his career here. We're, we might be entering into a new uh, time when we have Pavlo as part of the mix with all these great strongmen that we're seeing. No question that he has just the raw ability. You know, he does do his deadlifts with straps, but you still have to have fantastic grip strength to even, you know, pick, lift the kinds of weights that he does. I doubt this will be any sort of problem for him. No. There we go. No problem. Being told that he had to move his supporting arm away from his body. You can't use that to help you push. Right. Which is really not a problem. It's not a back strength thing, really. It's more of a... It's more of a, uh, the effort with the hand. Ode Haugen is the referee. Ode himself is a unbelievable. At 72 years of old, is still a world-class grip specialist. Can still pull 200 kilograms on an Apollon's axle. Anybody at home that hasn't done that, go try it and, see, and, and let us know how you do with that. Saxon Bar, all those, all those great standards. Mitch Hooper coming out next. He's already. Broken one record today and is your current record holder in the Denny Stone hold at 39.85 seconds. So he piled up another $5,000 when he won that event. Well, we will see what he can do here with Thor's hammer. It's been a real treat to see him this weekend. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Nothing to it. He just picked it up. <laughs> He did tell me he's the most handsome man in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of chuckled when he yeah. said that. You know what he, he, he reminds me? I don't think me. anything anybody's going to argue with him about that. No, I don't, no one argues with any, uh, yeah. about anything with him. You know, he does, lo he does look a little bit like a young Bill Kazmaier. Yeah. He actually does. Uh, so. And this man looks like a young Dr. Bill Crawford. That is Billy Crawford. He's on Team USA Moss Wrestling also. Somewhat of a grip guy himself. Billy Crawford at 200 here. Come on, get it up. Got it. Oh, no, they didn't hold they didn't it. Count it. Right. Didn't count it? They counted I it. I thought they did, yeah. They did. Okay, good. Honestly, I don't think he's ever done this. We need one of these Thor's hammers. <laughs> he doesn't have one sitting in his college dorm room. I'll just let it, leave it at that. I'll tell you, the, the, the 150, they have a 150, and, and mm -hmm. that is incredibly hard. This 200, they're starting at 200 this year. What's been fun is seeing, if you go into the row 10 here on campus at the Dell Diamond Stadium, they have some of these implements out. They have the log out there. This morning. They do, yes. Uh -huh. And given what happened yesterday with the CrossFit athletes and the strongmen, there are a lot more people in there trying to pick that thing oh, up yeah. and play with it. It's cool to watch. That is really cool to watch. So that's going to light up the uh, CrossFit world to go after those logs. And I hope a lot of people want to start doing this and come here ready to do it. So we got Clint. Wow. That was easy. Clint Martin. Excellent. Well, Jerry Pritchett will be coming out next. Speaking of hand strength. Love to see Jerry back on the uh, on, on the scene with us. Hopefully he can get himself into the back into the strongman arena, top level. One of the best deadlifters around, so yeah, it's <laughs> He's a metal fabricator. Yeah. That's a, that was a, okay. Whatever. Here we go. <laughs> he got it. Yay! <laughs> Fantastic lift, though. 
I would love to have seen him in his prime on the Tower of Power deadlift. We talked about that last mm -hmm. night. Uh, man, he could have, that would have been a battle between, between those two. 12, 13, 14 repetitions, no question about it. Martins leads, he's his back out, and he will move to the 225 pound hammer. And he is your record holder at 300 pounds. Romark's coming out next. That's it, support each other. Romark's really made that 200 pound implement look pretty easy. Come on. And he will get 225. Yes, awesome. <laughs> that is great. Yes. That was something. And now Kevin Ferris will step out. Kevin's got prodigious hand strength, obviously. I mean, to be able to uh, hold those Denny Stones for that, Denny Stone replicas for 37 seconds plus. I, say, I expect him to go deep into this competition. Easily done. John Clark Eklund. We're good there. Excellent. Now Dale Shoemaker. Big Dale. I think he'll make uh, quick work of this as well. <laughs> no doubt about that. He does it quickly. Maxime Boudreaux. That laugh is out of respect. That's a, <laughs> that's a wow, look at that. Maxime with his great grip. And that was easy. Just running right through these. Pablo Nakanetsny will be the next man out. You really have to see Pablo in person, not just on television, to understand, you know, how wide he is and how thick he is. And a very serious competitor. I mean, he is, he is here. Love to see him. That wow. was easy. That was <laughs> simple. Yeah. We have yet to see anyone really get be taxed by any of these. And here comes the most handsome man in Canada, Mitch Hooper. <laughs> The smiling strong man. <laughs> that was one of the things that people always loved about Jan Paul is he always was smiling. Easily done. And now Billy Crawford coming up. Yes, hopefully he can get that grip on. He's only 20. You know, as you mature, your grip gets stronger. So as a 20-year-old, to be really battling it out with these guys, it's, uh, you know, I, I know he's my son, but that's pretty exceptional, frankly. I think you're allowed to be very proud right now. <laughs> I am. <laughs> very. Oh, come on now. Break it off the ground and keep pulling up. He's good. <laughs> I think honestly, if he had the, you know, if he, you know, he worked all weekend, not to make an excuse for him, but these other guys were competing. But you know, um, that's how you make your hands hard and strong. Is, is and when you're the young guy in the crew, they ask you to do a lot. <laughs> yeah, they do. But I'm just saying that that's how you make your hands strong is by working them. So I think this is good for him. Here's Clint Martin. That's easy for him. Nice lift. Good job, Clint. And Jerry Pridgett. Jerry has a huge set of forearms and hands. He did great on the mic last night, by the way. He was fantastic to have up here in the booth. Just so much knowledge to, to share with the, the viewing audience and great insights to some of the little technique things that athletes need, needed to, to work on or change and was really able to point out just the subtleties of that uh, log lift that made a difference. Yeah, so Jerry's son, uh, Bubba Pritchett, won the under-16 strongman championships for U.S. at age 11. So speaking of sons, we always talk about our sons. 
We are at 250 pounds now. Martin Glesis is able Good to hoist job. that. I think we're going to sort through things pretty quickly now. This 250 is going to there comes Romarks. pose quite a challenge. I think we'd have a Chloe Brennan moment if he breaks this thing off the ground. It would be pretty impressive. That would be awesome. Come on, get that thing. Get it up. Uh, it's budging. Oh, come on. Oh, man. Uh. You typically see Crocs out there when people are trying to lift, Dr. Bill? No, not necessarily, <laughs> but. <laughs> the fact that he moved it is impressive. Yes. <laughs> Good job, Romarks. Yeah, Crocs is probably not the uh, standard <laughs> footwear here. <laughs> here comes Kevin Ferris. But he did get the 225. That was a fantastic lift. Kevin making short work of the others. Let's see what he has here at 250 pounds. He will get that. Wow. You know, talking with Laws uh, last year, when you're at your strongest, your grip is at your best. And so, you know, these, these guys are really showing that. These are the top strongmen in the world on the planet coming here to compete. Comes John Clark Eklund. And he is able to move 250. Wow. Going head to head. Showing that monster wrestlers really work their grip. Dale Shoemaker stepping up. Big Dale, work strength, we were just talking about that. Terry Todd and I talked a lot about work strength, and that is real. Come on now. Wow. Wow, easily done. Not a problem. Huge hands. Very big man. And, you know. Here comes Maxime Boudreau. Maxime, we talked about the fact that um, the strongest man in the world might not know it. He's on some loading dock in some faraway country. <laughs> working every day, and he's got the potential to, to be that strongest man. Nice. Gets through 250. I also like to see the fact that our strongman competitors are coming out here and exposing themselves to these novel implements and, and uh, to try these, try these things and, and, you know, to show that, hey, I'm here to compete, and there's more competition. I want to keep going. Here comes Pablo Nakanesni. <laughs> no problem. It was even swinging around in his hand. That, that seems like that would make it a little harder, honestly. Mitch Hooper up next. <laughs> Yeah, I think from the side he did look like this, the uh, most handsome man in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you got to hold it. And Hooper doesn't, or is he going back to the chalk? Yeah, get a little chalk, chalk there. There we go. Clearly has the strength to move it. He's got to be able to hang on to it. There we go. Stood right up with it. He switched hands. So I think a lot of guys maybe are doing left hand to save their right hand, but I'd want to warm up that hand. But that's this is their choice. Clint Martin is up. Got the uh, Denny replicas off the ground. Come on, Clint. Bite into that. Get it up. Oof. Almost. It's just sliding on him. Ugh. Come on. Stand up. <laughs> Almost had it, did Clint Martin. But to hey, you get got a 225. That, that is impressive. That is great. That Here is comes Jerry Pritchett. They've already pinned them in for the lift. <laughs> <laughs>
Great job. Okay, 275 is next. Martin's a record holder with 300 pounds. And that is a, that, that lift is unbelievable, actually. I mean, when you feel the, you know, these implements to actually get to 300 pounds. 275 pounds in one hand, and Martins hits that. No problem. Two seventy-five. Wow. Kevin Ferris coming out now. Martins throwing down the gauntlet with the two seventy-five. Ferris is able to get that. Oof. Serious strength competition, serious grip competition here. And John Clark Eklund. He made the 250 look fairly pedestrian. Not a lot of chalk on his hands. No, he doesn't have any, hardly. Huh. Impressive set of forearms. He's going to be unable to lift the 275-pound hammer. But he got the 250. Excellent lift. And now Dale Shoemaker, who has looked like he's barely breaking a sweat out, the, out there with some of these lifts. I know, right? You think he's, he's practicing at, at Rogue with these? I mean, how can you not? <laughs> you got that stuff laying around everywhere. Yeah. Come on, Big Dale. He was able to budget. Oh. Just can't keep his grip. That's what it's all about. That is so incredible. I mean, the 250 just came right off the ground, and that one didn't budge. You were talking about it earlier. I mean, there is a... Big difference between 250 and 275. It gets nailed down, and I knew it, 275 would sort all these guys out. 25 pound difference with one arm is a massive increase. It is. Here comes Maxime Boudreau at 275. <laughs> Boudreau. Oh, he down too quickly. I don't think he got credit for it. I don't think he did. It looked like it was slipping as he picked it up. Ruud Haugen getting him back out to. Oh. His first attempt was his best one, but the grip just failed at the top. Right. And here comes Pablo Nakanetsny. So Maxime will finish with 250. We knew this would sort out very quickly. But again, you know, uh, there's no better grip referee that you could find anywhere than Ode Haugen. I'd like to know how much Ode Haugen could actually do with this implement. <laughs> I, I am being honest. Pablo, no problem <laughs> at 275. Wow. <laughs> okay, Pablo, it's just, you just have to deadlift. You don't have to snatch it. There we go. Here comes Mitch Hooper. <laughs> Mitch has been impressive with this. He hasn't struggled so far, but let's see what the 275 does for him. World-class strongman, world-class grip. That's, that's what we're seeing. On the podium, third place in the Rogue Invitational. Uh-oh. Trying to go with the left hand. Yeah. Things swinging around on him. And your, imp your impulse is to go further down on that, that knurling. So if it slides, you've got, some, right. you've got some issue. You know what, though? He did hold the Denny replicas for a record amount of time, and he competed all weekend. So finishing with a 250-pound hammer is excellent. Now Jerry Pritchett coming back up. Isn't that incredible? I mean, just reaching down, 
grabbing the 250, no problem. 275 is nailed down. Wow. Getting close is Jerry Pritchett. Huge forearms and hands. He's just a he's very impressive personally you know, when you see him in person. Pritchett won't be able to get through 275. And now Martins Litzies will come back out. Okay, so we're down to Litzies, Ferris, and Nakanechny. We were at 300 pounds. This was the lift that yes. won it for Leeds <laughs> last year. And there's no 305. It's 325. Oh. Come on, Martins. More chalk. <laughs> Ten seconds. He's got to hurry. Get some chalk and maybe some stick and whatever else he can find. He's got to get right to work. Oh, oh. <laughs> it was close. <laughs> so not this year for Martins Leeds. And here comes Kevin Ferris. Well, let's see if Ferris can at least tie the record. He had the Denny Stone hold record earlier and then... Mitch Hooper blasted through that. <laughs> Broke his heart. Very exciting. That was so fantastic to watch. Oh, and Ferris has wow. it. Wow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so he has tied the record. Woo. And now comes Pablo Nakanechny. Oh. So he'll get a shot at uh, the 325 at the very least. Come on, Pablo. Young man with a huge future. And Pablo, oh, it oh, slipped. Got They're going to give it to him. He had enough control at the top. Well, it's a matter of like, when, as soon as you stand up, it's a down signal. You know, it's, you know, is it assuming control? Because he did, what you're watching is, did he give the down signal when it started coming down? They will get two, sorry to interrupt, they'll get two minutes rest before we yes. continue. Okay, good, great. And we go up to 325 pounds, has yet to be lifted. This would be really fantastic to watch. I, I think that, um, you know, going from 300 to 325 and continuing some interest in this, and getting people to train. Last year we just had, what, how many, three or four people that tried this? It wasn't and that, it wasn't as many as we have this year. No, not even close. And so, you know, you've got a lot of interest in this, and it's, it's turned into a thing. And, and you saw last year they started at a lower weight. And uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, or at the very least, the 200 is a, is a very good lift. Um, so people are actually training these and coming out and doing it. We've seen some very impressive lifting. And we've already seen two records fall. Hathor Bjornsson beat his own record in the weight over bar. And Mitch Hooper is your new record holder in the Denny Stone hold at 37.58 seconds. And he's with Kiki Dixon. Mitch, you had a podium finish for the Rogue Invitational. You just set a world record. I'm starting to wonder, is there anything that you can't do? There's plenty that I can't do. <laughs> Not much in strong, man but plenty outside of strong. My fiance is here, that's a better question for her. <laughs> <laughs> you just went after the hammers, what happened there? I can't feel my thumbs. <laughs> um, these guys have incredible grips. Uh, I'm not of that caliber even if I could feel my thumbs, but it's hard to back up from those stones into the hammer. Uh, but hats off to the two that are still going. All right, maybe we'll see you give it another crack when those thumbs are working again. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you. And this was Mitch Hooper on the Denny Stones earlier. I think he's telling us that that hook grip really took a lot out of his thumbs, and it really does, all that pressure. 732 pounds. 37.58 yeah, seconds. We are down to our final two, Kevin Ferris and Pablo Nekonechny. Ferris will be up first. 
Okay, come on. Come on, Kevin, hit it. Oh, they're enthusiastic. They got the 350 out there also. Come on, 325, make it happen. Here it is. Pull, pull, pull. Is, oh, oh, he oh, broke it off the ground. Come on, Kevin. Hang on to it. Push it up. And he has yes. it. Wow. A new record for Kevin Ferris. Oh, wow. The man has a grip. Wow. <laughs> he broke the record, although uh, just for a short amount of time in the uh, Denny Stone hold and then. 325. We'll see how long he stays there by himself at 325. I don't know. Pablo Nakaneshni <laughs> was very impressive on the 300 pound hammer. I know, right? And here goes Nakaneshni to Ty Ferris. And, ooh. Oh, broke it off the oh, ground. Oh, Same thing we saw with Ferris on his first attempt. That's your temptation is to keep turning and turning and turning and turning. I just can't budget right now. Yeah, it just won't won't happen. Going back to the chalk bucket. That's good. Come on, Pavlo. Get this thing. Stand up with it. Oh. And he's not gonna get it. So Kevin Ferris is your new record holder in the Thor's hammer. A pretty impressive record breakers for Ferris. Had the Denny Stone record. Yes. Now he has the Thor's Hammer record. There we go. The man has a grip. 325 pounds. Very impressive. I honestly, um, that was the way it was going. The 275 looked a little slippery. Then he got the 300 and then the 325. He failed on his first attempt, but was able to lock it in. Stood and right up with it and got the down signal. That's really turning his wrist over and applying that pressure with his wrist, and that's also important, not just the grip. Great effort. Three events, great lift. three records, and Kevin Ferris now has one that sticks, and he is with Kiki Dixon. You went after the stones earlier. You had the record for a few minutes, came back with the hammers, were able to secure a world record. What does it mean to you? Uh, it's actually not even what I came for, so uh, that was a surprise to me. Yeah, I came for the Danny Stones today. Uh, had the record in the walk uh, in March and um, was hoping to get the hold today, but hey, it's another day. Well, congratulations on your pleasant surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Three events and three records broken. Hathor Bjornsson, Mitch Hooper, and Kevin Ferris all setting new marks in their respective events. And we still have two events to go in the CrossFit competition as we get closer to crowning champions for the men and the women. Very exciting, Sean, and I, it's uh, great to call this with you. I love the record breakers of banner year. Action continues here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Coming up next, event number nine for the CrossFit individuals, the Goblin.
Two events remain before we crown our 2022 Rogue Invitational Champions. Final day of competition here for the CrossFit competition at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Thank you so much for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway. And Adrian, every time we think, hey, maybe we'll get a little clarity on the overall leaderboard after this event, it just gets tighter. The excitement is just building and building and building. And honestly, to be here on site, you don't want it any other way. Everyone has showed up to compete, and everyone wants to go home the champion of the Rogue Invitational. Only 10 points separate first place Justin Medeiros from 10th, third place, pardon me, Roman Krenikov. Pat Vellner sits in fourth. He has 550 points. He's 25 points back of Krenikov. And Jeffrey Adler, still alive, but needs to have a couple big performances here. In event number eight, it is the goblet presented by GORUCK. And this workout is a beautiful combination of a monostructural movement with the gymnastics movement, and then of course we've got external loading. It's seven rounds of seven muscle ups. The hill run, I'm gonna categorize that thing as a run. I don't know how many sprints we're gonna see. And then 11 goblet squats at 88 pounds for these gentlemen. What are the keys to this event? You know, I really think one of the important things to recognize is that smooth is fast here. With this combination of rep scheme and the order and sequence of this event, it's important for people to stay in a rhythm so that they can actually understand where they want to break things up and how. I think that could be a huge separator here in this one. And of course, those goblet squats are more than just a squat. It's often a movement that's overlooked and undervalued, especially for elites out there. 
that love to load themselves with a barbell overhead or on their back rack position, and even in the front rack, but to hold a goblet could fatigue their upper body in a new way that they haven't experienced. Lane assignments here for the first of these two heats. Athletes are getting set on the starting line. Noah Olson taking the time to acknowledge the fans. And you got to love it. Take some time, soak up the moment. You're out here right now. You're going to have fun in this workout. Give the people what they want. A lot of that's just some simple interaction. We are underway. Seven rounds. The seven muscle-ups, a hill sprint, and then the 11 goblet squats. You know, in Saxon Panchik, Sean, is an athlete that I really like to watch on a workout like this. Again, with the combination of movements, it's pure CrossFit. And I think that Saxon has hadn't really had a performance the same way that he would have expected or desired for this weekend to go. And I know that he wants to really finish strong. So this is a workout in a combination that I really like in favor for him to show his capacity. 147 total score repetitions in the event. Now they will take off up the hill. And we'll get a rep with every pylon that they pass. Yeah, and, you, and we can already see very clearly that this is where the vast majority of this event is going to take place. It's important to pace accordingly so that you can have success on the the goblet squats and the muscle ups, but you can't lose valuable time here because you're going to spend a lot of time on your legs. Saxon Panchik in lane four and Scott Tetlow in lane two will be the first men to the kettlebell. Here come Bell, pardon me, here comes Cole Sager along with Heinrich Hapolainen, Noah Olson, Nick Matthew, and Jorge Fernandez. Lazar Jukic now at the, was the top of your screen, far end of the field, is back as is Jack Farlow in the bottom right and Tim Paulson. So every man starting his first set of 11 goblet squats. And they make short work of it, which is exactly what you would expect. 88 pounds for these athletes is on the lighter side. It's it's the rack position that they were all holding, and we saw a, a variety of, of ways that athletes were going to hold on to that goblet or the kettlebell, which is certainly something that we'll see as this event continues to unfold. Back for round two, as Scott Tetlow and Saxon Panchik are your leaders early in this heat. Second of seven total rounds. Tetlow is off the rings. He's heading up the hill. The hill sprint counts as three reps. Each pylon you pass counts as a rep. That will be one rep for Tetlow and one rep more for Saxon. They don't need to go around the pylon at the top. They just need to break the plane, and then they'll head back down. 42 rep mark is what they're looking to hit to close out round two. And this hill adds, again, a unique challenge where what I'd be looking for and cueing my athletes to do is almost build a bit of speed in the last seven to eight strides prior to hitting the hill to almost help carry you upward with some momentum instead of having to fight stride for stride to keep your pace as you hit that incline. Scott Tetlow and Saxon Panchik continue to lead here to the back half of round two. Here comes Cole Sager and Noah Olson. Heinrich Hapolainen is right behind Noah Olson. As Tetlow, Sager, and Panchik, along with Olson, now are getting to work on their second set of 11 goblet squats at 88 pounds. Sager, Panchik, and Tetlow done at the same time, and they will start the jog back towards that hill. Back towards part of the ring is to start round three. And a lot of these athletes are going to be trying to pace in such a way that the seven ring muscle ups are cool, calm, and collected. When we when we watch ring muscle ups done on an apparatus like the Zeus here, this vast rig, the, the straps are long. And on a day outside with the wind blowing a little bit, that can get those rings flying in all kinds of directions. The last thing that you want to do is have to navigate that obstacle to break up your ring muscle upsets. 
Petlow got off just ahead of Saxon and Panchik. Cole Sager is now solidly in third place as the top three men have separated themselves from the pack. Noah Olson is in fourth. He's towards the top of your screen, making his way towards the hill. The 63 rep mark, they will be done with round three. Scott Tetlow, 18th place overall, but coming off his best finish of the competition. Took fifth place this morning in that snatch press event. Tetlow will be the first man back to the 88-pound kettlebell, followed closely by Sager and Saxon Pagic. Noel Olson gaining a little ground as he currently sits in fourth place. And these squats here as they're loaded in front of the body, the chest and shoulders and upper back are working tremendously just to squeeze onto that 88 pounds and keep it where it needs to be as you pin it against your chest. Not that it's an obstacle for these athletes, but it can be coined as extremely annoying to, while you're trying to recover to get ready for those next, next set of ring muscle-ups. Three rounds down, four remain as Tetlow leads Sager and Panchik. Noah Olson is still in fourth place, along with Heinrich Kapolainen. The two of them have also finished their third rounds. Scott Tetlow is off. Cole Sager and Saxon Panchik right behind him. Sager gaining a little ground on Tetlow up the hill and almost pulling even with Scott. Sager again accelerating at the bottom of that hill to close the gap slightly on Scott Tetlow. 11 more goblet squats at 88 pounds. Starting to see that run play slow down just a little bit. Almost down to a walk even as Saxon gets ready to prepare himself for these 11. And Sager is continuing to have a very fast pace on these goblet squats. Cole's historically a great squatter, legs a lot like pistons. Very upright torso in the bottom of his squat, which, which tends to be a tremendous advantage. When you move well on a particular movement, it allows your body to be efficient, and we also know that he's got great strength and endurance as capacities. Tetlow, Sager, and Saxon Panchik have all been going unbroken on these muscle-ups. Tetlow is done, Sager is done, and Saxon Panchik is just about finished up as well. Now Sager and Tetlow starting to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. As Noah Olson stays in fourth place behind Saxon Panchik. And you notice Cole take a bit of a at, a, at a kick to his step there right before he hit that hill. And now he's just a few strides ahead of Tetlow, knowing what we know and see, what we've seen from Cole. When he gets back to the squats, he can also have an opportunity to create some further separation with the way that he's cycled those goblet squats so far. You may have seen Jorge Fernandez in the yellow shirt running up the hill. He's a full round behind the leaders right now. That's Cole Sager moves in front of Scott Tetlow as they Run back to the goblet squat. 11 more reps. Looking to get to the 100 five rep mark. You notice these athletes taking big breaths right before they get to the load. They're, they're trying to 
clear as much lactate as they can and gain a control back under with their heart rate and their breathing prior to getting more work done. Cole Sager has kept this pace throughout the entirety of the event. He is done with round five. Two rounds remain. This is where we really start to see that key that we mentioned earlier before the workout was getting started, Sean. Smooth is fast. Who can keep the sustained rhythm that they've already established in the workout without breaking, without pausing? But for two more rounds for these gentlemen, who can hold on to what they've established is who's going to come out the lead in this heat? Tetlow and Sager have yet to break up any of these sets of seven. Saxon Panchik. Taking a break before he gets to work on his sixth of seven rounds. And now Tetlo breaks for the first time. He has two reps remaining, and Sager now way out in front. Tetlo just getting off the rings. And that's where you see the difference. Again, an acceleration by Cole just prior to the hill. This allows you to feel like you hit a rhythm about halfway, and then, of course, your legs got to do some work. And these small decisions that he's made in this event so far are what now have created a buffer for him against Tetlo. Sager 16th place overall with 310 total points. His best finish of the competition was seventh in event six, the duel two. Cole looking very composed, controlled. Of course, at this point, everyone is suffering. Everyone is, uh, you know, is, is feeling the, the heat out there under the sun and all the reps that they've accumulated, but it's who manage it, the, manages it the best. And Sager is done with his goblet squats before Tetlo even starts. One round remains for Cole Sager. Saxon Panjic and Noah Olsen are fighting for third place along with Lazar Jukic. And Nick Matthew, Heinrich Hapelainen also in that battle as well. Final set of seven muscle-ups for Cole Sager. Still showing us a really beautiful swing. Driving his hips open to help use his upper body to get him through that transition. The dip is no problem for Cole, even with all the pressing and upper body stressors that we've put on these athletes through the course of the event. He's out. Sager off on his final hill run. Matthew has two muscle ups to go, breaking again. Second straight round, he's broken after five. And it was that first break in the last round that really allowed Cole Sager to open up this lead. Matthew is done with his sixth round, and he will pass Sager on his way out towards the hill. This is where Cole's got to find that kick. He's almost there. The next more than ten minutes are just left. Yeah, and the next 10 men are just watching, trying to see what's going to be the time to beat. How did he do this? How did he pace this? Cole's got a full send here on these squats, which he showed us in almost every round. Has kept the same pace throughout. And Cole Sager is going to take heat number one. 13 minutes, 16.29 seconds. And now Scott Tetlow to finish things up. Noel Olsen right there with him. Noel Olsen back to the goblet squats as well and trying to put some pressure on Scott Tetlow. Tetlow is going to get across the finish line. Will not have a close finish with Noah Olson this time. Olson is in. Lazar Jukic is back for his final round. And 
Now a lot of these athletes are just going to be battling against that clock. How far can they get before they reach the time cap? Saxon Panchik will be the next man to start his final round, along with Nick Matthew as Jukic is in. Fourteen seventeen point nine eight seconds, and, and lazar has been gotten through an ankle injury. He rolled his ankle on Thursday in the Texas Trail event, and has decided to just keep gutting it out. And now a race between Panchik and Matthew, and I don't know who got there first. Matthew by two one hundredths of a second. Now that is the closest finish we have seen so far. Wow. What a finish by Matthew. Kind of walked down Sa Saxon for the last two rounds, gaining ground little by little, and then a sprint to the finish. That was impressive. And that is the time cap. Nicole Sager, 13 minutes, 16.29 seconds with the top time heading into the second and final heat. And once again, we get a really close finish between a couple of athletes as Nick Matthew and Saxon Panchik are separated by just two tenths of a second. And Nick Matthew, you had that tie, remember, at the games with Guy Arrows. He's used to those super close finishes across the finish line. He is. He certainly understands that urgency that's necessary. Let's take one more look at Cole Sager's effort. And it was really the pace that he kept on these squats that allowed him to stay ahead of Tetlow until Tetlow broke those muscle ups and then it was pretty much over. Yeah, it really was. We, we talked about it being more than a squat and it certainly mattered. And again, Cole had this awareness in him to surge up that hill each and every round. And wherever you can start to make up seconds, Sean, when there's seven rounds in an event, you scrap for those seconds because they accumulate over time. And this is what we allowed Cole to have that strong lead and strong finish to be our leader so far in this event. Cole Sager, 13, 16.29 seconds, followed by Scott Tetlow and Noah Olson. And then look how close the finish was between Nick Matthew and Saxon Panchik, just two one hundredths of a second. Six men finish inside the 15 minute time cap. Second and final heat getting set to come out on the field. And here are the overall standings as Justin Medeiros and Roman Krenikov first through third separated by just 10 points. Patrick Vellner and Jeffrey Adler hoping to get into the top three. Jason Hopper sits in sixth with an even 500 points. Brother, we have got a show down. This, this workout being, this, this event specifically being textbook CrossFit here, the goblet, seven rounds of seven ring muscle ups, the hill run, and the 11 goblet squats at 88 pounds. I love that we're here at, at pretty much the apex of the competition with only 200 points left on the floor. The race is so tight. And now we're just gonna do exactly what we do in the form of traditional CrossFit. Here are your lane assignments, and your three leaders will be in lanes four, five, and six. And Justin Medeiros with precious little room to spare between himself, Chandler Smith, and Roman Krenikoff, as we have seen five changes on top of the overall leaderboard so far in this competition. And we are underway, and Roman Krenikoff, third place overall, coming off a 12th place in that last event. Exactly, and that's what we've seen throughout the course of this entire Rogue Invitational is back and forth, back and forth. How are these athletes, specifically Roman Kronikoff, going to rebound from a 12th place when he is right there within striking distance of taking home the gold here this year? And, and that's what we're going to really see. He's a bigger athlete. How will he manage the high volume of 49 ring muscle-ups and all of this running compared to some of the lighter athletes in this field? Everybody getting off the rings at about the same time. Patrick Vellner in that light blue shirt was one of the first men. Ricky Garrard with no shirt on the right side. Slightly in the lead on this first hill run. 21 reps per round. Ricky Garrard and Vellner are out front along with 
Jeff Adler. He's in that tank top. Patrick Vellner currently in fourth place overall. He's just 25 points back of Roman Krennikov for third. And, and I want everyone to remember one of the keys to focus on this particular event is smooth as fast. You know, we weren't talking about Cole Sager in the first two rounds of that last heat. All of a sudden, he continued to sustain his pace, establish one that he knew he could hold through the seven rounds, and that allowed him to have an advantage on the rest of these competitors, some of which came out too hot. And Velder is off first, going back to the rings along with Adler and Garrard. All these athletes doing textbook ring muscle-ups, smooth in their swing, driving those hips open, fast transition. Chandler Smith there is catching pretty high above a right angle with his elbow. This is going to allow him to save some of his shoulders and his triceps, which are, I would imagine, extremely fatigued after what those athletes did this morning. Belner, Adler, Gerard, and Koski, the first four men off their second round of muscle-ups. And they're making their way back up the hill. Garrard on the right side of your screen along with Jeffrey Adler. You saw Patrick Vellner looking over his left shoulder to see where his competition is at this point. He makes the turn. There goes Medeiros and Chandler Smith. Lean and fall, boys. When you turn and you get going down that hill, allow yourself to lean and fall as best you can. Try not to decelerate your body. That's going to suck more energy out of your quads. And you got to use those things to squat. Ricky Garrard leads the way here back to the goblet for the second time. Adler and Vellner in second and third. Quant, Gumanson, along with Yonikowski behind them. Jason Hopper, closest to your to the camera on the bottom right hand side of your screen. There's Chandler Smith, who is just five points back at Justin Medeiros for the overall lead. Patrick Vellner staying in front with Adler and Garrard. Koski in fourth, followed by Gumanson and Quant. Medeiros right now fifth in the event, but he's ahead of the two men immediately behind him in the overall standings. Chandler Smith and Roman Krennikov, as Roman was the last man done with that set of goblet squats as he heads back to the rings to begin round three of seven. And that's what you've got to assume about Justin is that he has the awareness Clearly being a two-time champion, it's, it, it would be remiss to go and said that he knows exactly what he needs to do and who he needs to beat. And he's going to try to run this race appropriately so that he ends up with more points than those that are nipping at his heels. So Ricky Garrard out front here. And Garrard got off to a great start. Back-to-back third-place finishes, but then an 18th, a 10th, an 11th, and an 18th. Four straight events outside the top 10 or 10th or lower, and then a third place looks like it was going to get him back on track in the Texas Oak, but then came back this morning and finished 17th. He currently sits in 12th place overall. Pat Vellner is in second place, followed by Jeff Adler, top three, starting to put some distance between themselves and the rest of the field here in the second and final heat. Cole Sager's time to beat is in the upper right-hand part of your screen. And Sean, there was a time when, a, when an event like this would get announced and I'd automatically say, hey, Pat Vellner's going to run away with this one. An individual with extremely high capacities for just work, let alone he's an excellent mover and excels tremendously at the ring muscle up. And now we've just got athletes that have come up through this sport that can challenge his ability to, even on a workout like this where he would notoriously have high levels of success, and he still can. He's certainly an athlete that I'm keeping my eye on. Well, three rounds are down for Vellner, Adler, and Gerard as Roman Krennikov is in last place in this heat right now. And that's our story there. He's, he's one of the, the, the bigger competitors on the field right now, which allows him to have great success in many tests. This one was one where my question mark was, how will he respond to the volume of the 49 ring muscle-ups accompanied with the light load and all the body weight moving on that run? Gerard and Vellner, along with Adler, are still your top three. 
They are in rounds four of seven right now. Justin Medeiros is staying ahead of Chandler Smith. Medeiros only has a five-point cushion over Smith for the top spot in the overall standings. We still have one event to go here as Roman Krennikov is back onto the rings. And there goes Justin Medeiros. He's trying to become the first man to repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion. And Patrick Vellner is trying to keep his streak alive. He's been on the podium every year at the Rogue Invitational, and he was your 2020 champion. Yeah, and right now, with the way Roman is appearing in this event, Pat certainly got a chance. The door is going to be open for him, being only 25 points off. There is Roman Krennikov, who is in last place in the heat. Medeiros is on his goblet squats. Velner and Gerard are done, and Adler is finished as well. And they are through four of the seven rounds. In the back half of this event now, 147 total score repetitions. Yeah, and here we are. We're at this point where Medeiros is just going to do what he can to conserve what he can and still stay just out of arm's reach of Chandler. He knows at any given point another competitor could potentially make a run or make a push, and he wants to conserve as much energy as he can while maintaining his lead. Pat Vellner trails Medeiros by 35 points. Now, to make that up, if Vellner were to win this event, Medeiros would have to finish eighth. Vellner and Gerard are starting to pull away from Jeff Adler. Adler making his way up the hill. Sean, there's something uniquely trying about this test, too. The way that Chris Spieler uh, and Josh Bridges, you know, beautifully wrote this thing up is that because there's seven rounds, it turns into such a psychological test. We're so used to in competition, fast events, three rounds, chipper style, one round through. But to see the same competitors beside you seven rounds consecutively, it becomes very mentally trying. How can I keep this lead? How do I stay close? They're all questions that you start to have to manage and deal with individually as you're out there in the field of battle. And there we are with, with Roman. Striking distance within first place and just backing off to a trot, essentially. You got to wonder, has this accumulation of volume for the last four days starting to really add up for Roman? Is this a response to a, a training season for him? Has he not had the same intensity and volume and preparation for the Rogue Invitational? And as a rookie here, that's, that's a legitimate concern. Ricky Garrard has finished round five, as have Adler and Vellner. And the three of them are right around Cole Sager's pace from round one. We talk about smooth as fast. If I had to judge simply by looking at these athletes, Pat and Ricky are both gearing up for a heck of a ladder run here in this event because they both look under control. Feller done first, back in the lead here. We're going to learn a lot here about how Pat chooses to, or not to, attack this hill. But I think right now, composure-wise, he looks like he's in complete control. Adler has moved about a couple steps ahead of Ricky Garrard on the right side. Pat Vellner all by himself here in round six. One round remains after this. Roman Krennikov has fallen way off the pace. He is closing out round five. And here comes Vellner back to the goblet squats for the sixth time. Great to work, no pause, no hesitation.
He was able to get nine reps before Adler started. So Vellner is done. One round remains. He's trying to track down Cole Sager's time of 13, 16.29 seconds. And the way this is shaping up, Pat Vellner could find himself very close to Justin Medeiros for the overall lead. Again, Vellner trails Medeiros by 35 points for first. If Pat wins this event, he earns 100 points. Medeiros has got to finish better than eighth place to hang on to his lead. And this is where that competition expands beyond Medeiros and the two men beside him, right? You've got to have this awareness of what is the point separation? How well do I need to fare even to the competitors who are sitting in fourth and fifth? Final muscle up for Vellner. He is done. Chandler Smith is behind Medeiros. Medeiros is on the right side of your screen, just leaned over to take a breath and is getting ready to hop up on the rings. Chandler's had a great past three events. Nothing worse than third place, and he has an event win in the Texas Oak. Belner crests the hill and works his way back down for the final time. 13, 16.29 seconds, and Belner's going to have to hurry here. Yeah, and you wonder if he's aware. Does he see? Does he even know how close he is to that time at this point out on the field? Or is he more concerned with coming away with a win here in this heat? Vellner for the final time. Really going to have to rip through these to have a chance to catch Sager. Sixteen seconds. Now eleven. Sager might have, or pardon me, Felder might have a gotta chance. Go. He's got a sprint. I think he may have gotten I think there. He got it. 13, 15.08 for Vellner and an event win when he absolutely had to have it. Now here comes Adler. This is going to help Vellner a lot. 13, 28.43. Ricky Garrard will be the next man to finish. Now, Medeiros is on his final round as well, so doing some damage control is Justin Medeiros. Here comes Ricky Garrard. Great finish for Ricky. Medeiros is on his final two reps on the goblet squats, and he will come in. So once again, every time we think we might get some clarity in the overall standings after an event, it looks like it's just going to get tighter at the top with one event remaining. Couldn't write a better script, Sean. We had BKG cross the finish line. Yona Koski here. Koski's in. That leaves Hopper, Krenikoff, and Chandler Smith, along with Sam Quant, left on the field. Here comes Smith across the finish line. And Roman Krenikoff, who came in in third place, going to fall out of the top three. And will get capped. He needs to get another rep if he can hurry down this hill and pass that pylon. Yeah, when you see an, an outlying performance from someone like this as Roman, I mean, this is why we watched him. We didn't know how he would respond to this particular event, but you got to wonder, is it is it fatigue? Is it cramping? Is it lack of nutrition? You'd think everybody has everything dialed into a science, but you never know, and there's so many factors that lean into affecting the way a competitor can perform in a four-day series of events like this. Pat Vellner with the event win, his first of 2022, his sixth career event win at the Rogue Invitational. He's second all time to Tia Toomey, who has 10. And trying to keep his podium streak alive here. He needed to pick up 30 points on Chandler Smith to get into second. I've spent some time with Pat, gotten to chat with him in, in various settings. Pat Vellner's never going to show up just to have a good time. He is here to play and here to go hard to get on top of that podium. Vellner unofficially is going to pick up 30 points on Medeiros. He will only trail him by five going into the final event. Oh, man. Roman Krenikoff is going to have some work to do as he finishes outside the top 10. 
Yeah, it looks like that could leave him close to 17th place, Sean. So Pat Vellner with 100 points. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon. Pat, congratulations. You just picked up 100 points. Capacity for volume comes to mind with an event like this, but where do you feel that the event was won for you? Uh, consistency. I think this was a really long workout, and you know, we're kind of peak heated today, so if you came out too hot, that hill got real high real fast. So, I mean, taking a little control at the start, consistency between rounds played off a lot. Now, you came in just ahead of Sager's time that was in the previous heat. Were you aware of how close your scores were? Or times, I, rather? I wasn't. I watched him go for, like, the second half. We saw his time. I knew it was low 13s, to be honest. When you finish that last set of muscle ups and turn and look at the hill, you kind of turn your brain off. Just stay ahead of the guys in my heat. Try not to start walking in that last 30 seconds of the workout. Get those 11 squats out and get to the finish line. Shut it down. Congratulations, consistency won. Yeah, thank you. 100 points takes the sting away a little bit. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Vellner hit the nail on the head with his pacing. Smooth as fast is something we said these athletes need to focus on, and he did it absolutely perfect. He knew exactly his pace, and he ran it, and it allowed him to finish with urgency and speed. And of course, just like he said, when you get 100 points, it takes this thing away just that much more. And then, of course, there's our storyline. Vellner now knocking at the door to Justin Medeiros. And Sean, we have got something exciting now, here going on. This is unofficial, but this has Vellner by 10 over Medeiros with Chandler Smith in third. Unofficial right now. Wow. But what a turn of events. Our sixth at this hold lead change of the competition. And Vellner looking to pick up his second Rogue Invitational Championship. It's going to be a fun final event for the men. The women coming up next in event number nine, the Goblin. Stay with us, everybody. Action continues at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Final day of competition at the 2022 Rogue Invitational gets closer to the finale. We have two events remaining for the women here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland alongside three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway, and Kiki Dixon is down on the field. Event number nine is the Goblet, presented by Go Ruck. And this is a beautiful combination of movements. We have got a gymnastics movement and ring muscle ups. We've got a monostructural movement in the hill sprint. And then of course we have got a weightlifting movement in the goblet squat. It's gonna be seven rounds and that's one of the most difficult parts about this particular event. Round after round, you've gotta stay on task and on pace. After watching the men go through this, does it change the way that you view the keys of this event at all? It really doesn't. We've seen that if you start 
smooth and can finish fast, that's the way to go. And that's why point one is, to, is smooth and fast. You got to establish that pace and obviously understand there's a flow to this workout. And of course, the second one is that that goblet squat, while it is not a limiter here, it is annoying and it's much more than just a regular squat because it can fatigue your upper body in new ways. First of two heats for the women getting set. Here are your lane assignments. A lot still needs to be decided here in this event. Emma McQuaid is in this heat. She's coming off that event win earlier in the, in the day in the opening event. She currently sits in 13th place overall. These athletes have been through a lot over the last four days, and to hit them with a workout that's going to go the distance like this one and accumulate as much volume, it is a rude awakening to some. 30 seconds before we start. And mentioned Emma McQuaid, who's coming off her best performance of the competition. Yeah, when, when I think about this athlete, I, I think about work capacity. She has a very unique ability to suffer at a very high level and do it well. And she's coming off of that momentum swing from this morning. I think that could mean a lot. She has trained with Sam Briggs, and no one knows how to turn off the pain receptors better than Sam Briggs and just continue to suffer through long, grueling workouts. Round one is underway. 147 total scored repetitions, 21 reps per round. Emma again showing us just a, a clinic with these ring muscle-ups. Beautiful long swing, long legs in the swing, driving her hip open to save her upper body. Catching that dip still slightly at a, a right angle with her elbow, which is gonna tax her tricep just a bit, but not really low. Well, eight of the ten athletes are done with their first set. Solberg and Kerstetter are still on the rings. And on Enganez, who is towards the front here. And also Bailey Rogers. Yeah, and with as much running in this, this event here, you got to like what we saw from Bailey Rogers in event one earlier this week, having a great performance on the Texas Trail. It's Rogers, Anganese, Ariel Lone in the pink shorts, and then Annika Greer on the right side of your screen. As they head back to the kettlebell for their first set of 11 goblet squats at 62 pounds. What we'll want to watch more closely even as the women attack this event is, is Will, will the ring muscle-ups affect them in a different way at all? Is this a, a place where more athletes can create separation from one another, which I believe with 49 listed in this workout, if they complete it, I certainly think it can be a focused aspect for the women. And on Angonese, Ariel Lowen, and Bailey Rogers, the first three women done. And Jacqueline Dahlstrom at the bottom of your screen and Annika Greer are heading back to start round two. Carolyn Prevo in the white headband and Emma McQuaid heading back to the rings. See Jacqueline Dahlstrom even fighting just to grab her rings. And this is one of those issues that I, that I warned about or mentioned earlier is that when you break up the ring muscle ups or you hit them wrong with your hands and they get swinging and they're out of reach outside with long straps, it's a challenge. And on Anganez, who's on the right side of the screen is Ariel Lowen is now in front. First off of the rings for Ariel Lowen here in round number two. Her best finish came on day number two of action. That's back on Friday when she took tied for second in ski bar. Sierra Lowen with a slight lean forward in her posture to help her get up that hill. 
And Alan Anganez is in second place, working her way down the hill with Lowen, and Emma McQuaid is now on the descent. Anganez starting to catch up with Lowen, and here comes Emma McQuaid. Anganez has a great descent down the hill. Ariel Lowen was fighting gravity just a touch there. Anganez just let the momentum take her down, which allowed her to catch up and gain a bit of a lead. 11 more goblet squats at 62 pounds. 42 rep mark. They will be done with round number two. Well, Adam Ganez in 12th place overall, but has really put together a nice string of events here. Her last three, a sixth, a sixth, and then a second earlier today. Lowen done first. Anganez right behind her. Into round three. McQuaid remains in third place, followed by Bailey Rogers. The two of them coming back to the rings. Both these ladies moving pretty well. It almost looks like Ariel Lowen favors the left side as she transitions through her ring muscle ups. And that's something that we've got to watch as the reps continue to climb is will this become a fault? Will it be a limiter in her transition in the later rounds? Lowen out ahead of Anganez, but Anganez has been able to reel her in and pass her on these runs. And now Emma McQuaid is off the rings. McQuaid in the back there in the black. Olivia Kerstetter in the yellow is just starting round three. Here we go. Ariel Lowen. Mimicking what she saw Aganez do on that last round to overtake her. And that's, that's a smart adaptation for any athlete. Use what works. Don't be afraid to abandon what you know to do what works. Lowen and Aganez going back to the kettlebells. 63 reps. They'll be done with their third rounds. Emma McQuaid. We'll join them shortly on the kettlebell. McQuaid on the left side of your screen in the all black. It's passed out of view. And again, these goblet squats being more annoying than anything from a loading perspective. These athletes have really nowhere to rest it. It's not a barbell. You can't just hold it snug against your throat in a front rack position. You're, you're using your arms, you're using your shoulders and your upper back to sustain that load as you squat it up and down. Lowen and Anganez now through three of the seven rounds. And McQuaid is done. Ariel Lowen again immediately to work, showing confidence in her ability to jump up and, and, and get all seven of these reps. Ariel Lowen has been to the CrossFit Games the last two years, finished 11th this past August. She gave birth in 2019, that took two years off, and then went to semifinals in 2021, just thinking that it'd be cool to get her nameplate to put in their new house, and she ends up winning the competition and qualifying. Again, a bit of a slap in the face to other athletes out there, including myself, Sean. I never showed up just for a name placard and then walked away with a gold, but... Whoops, I guess I'm fit. I, I guess I have what it takes to go to the CrossFit Games. Now, Lowen and Anganez have slowed their pace as they work their way up the hill here in round four. Danny Spiegel is a full round behind. Lowen kind of skipping her way down the hill. Here comes Anganez. And then McQuaid is halfway down the hill as she remains in third place. And this race is going to become interesting as we understand this time cap set at 15 minutes for these women. Where do they need to stay if they don't have the intention or the capacity to finish? Where do they need to stay and how can they manage that against the clock against the rest of this field? Yeah, 
Lowen to work just ahead of Anganese. And here comes Emma McQuaid. Final few reps for both athletes. Lowen and Anganese are done. And now into round number five. McQuaid turning to go back to her ring muscle-ups as well. And this is where you really get to start to see how well did they pace the front half of this event? Was it too fast? Did they get caught up in a battle that they probably shouldn't have been trying to fight so early? And how well can they finish? Emma McQuaid has been inching closer to Lowen and Anganez. These two are still your leaders in the heat. And there we see our first break in the ring muscle-ups for Ariel Lowen. And that will allow Manon Anganez to move in front. And we saw this with the first heat with the men. Those breaks on the muscle-ups can be costly. And now it's Emma McQuaid who has moved into second. Lowen is done. Anganese, your leader on the left side. Emma McQuaid in second place on the right. And in the background, there's Ariel Lowen trying to catch up to the top two women in this heat. We're watching some great pacing so far by Anganese, and I just can't help but ignore the work these athletes have done throughout the course of the four days. Already 40 bar muscle ups, already 80 GHD sit ups, heavy back squats, heavy box jump overs, or high box jump overs. They've, they've accumulated a lot of volume, legless rope climbs, wonder at max log lift, and now we're starting to see a lot of this accumulate in a long chipper style workout like this one. Anganese and McQuaid now your top two. And Emma McQuaid will get back to the kettlebell just behind Anganese. And, and I like Emma's body language. Runs all the way to the platform before she begins her goblet squats. Not hesitating at all. Ariel Lowen now in third place. Let's put down the kettlebell at the same time. Five rounds down for McQuaid and Anganese and Lowen trying to close out her fifth round. Two rounds remain. Four minutes before we hit that 15 minute time cap. And this is where the race, again, really gets interesting, Sean, because it's, it's, it's less about now, how do I finish these seven rounds and how do I get in how, uh, enough work to, to be the winner of this particular heat within the next two and a half minutes? Quaid, Anganese, and Lowen, your top three. We'll see if Ariel Lowen is able to hang on for all seven reps here with the break in the prior round that really cost her. Now, Emma McQuaid has put herself in the lead. Lowen's going to break. Anganese is done. But Emma McQuaid, your new leader with a round and a half remaining. Still three minutes left to work here. Emma looked over her shoulder to, to make sure that Manon was also walking with her hands on her thighs. Here comes Emma McQuay down the hill and back to the kettlebell. Ariel Lowen in the pink shorts is just starting her ascent here in round six. So can these women give themselves an opportunity to get back to this kettlebell? Three minutes, now two minutes, pardon me, to go until we hit the time cap. I 
Dragon Ace has yet to start her sixth set. So Emma McQuaid starting to put a little distance, more distance between herself and Manon Anganese. Yeah, that hesitation really could have done it. Because now it allows Emma to have, gain composure before she goes to the ring muscle-ups. She still looked the smoothest of the three ladies that are leading this heat so far up on those rings. About a minute 15 left now as Emma McQuaid gets set to start round number seven. Final round for McQuaid. We have 60 seconds to go before we hit the time cap. So it doesn't look like any woman in this opening heat is going to be able to finish this event inside the allotted time. But McQuaid still has some time to accumulate more reps if she can get through these muscle ups and get herself to at least the first pylon. She breaks. This is the first break we've seen. I think she has one rep remaining. got a race, 30 seconds. But Emma McQuaid and Manon Anganese with now 20 seconds to go before we hit the time cap. And here comes Anganese and Emma McQuaid, as long as she just stays even, she took a look to her right and just saw Anganese gaining on her. That will be another rep. Can anyone make it to the kettlebell? And if they can sprint back and get to the kettlebell, that will count for rep. So McQuaid is trying to empty the tank and won't be able to make it, but an impressive event for Emma McQuaid, who reeled in the leaders in the front part of the event, and then it was in these final two rounds where she really built on that lead and is able to tie Manon Anganese for the heat victory. Yeah, and you mentioned it earlier, Sean, she, she trains with Sam Briggs. She's gotten a lot of opportunities to, to, to suffer with someone who excels at that particular skill set, and, and it is a skill set. Uh, to be developed. So she showed great self-awareness there and, and started with exactly one of our keys. Smooth is fast. Still have one heat remaining for the women and the overall leaders will be out on the field. And just like it was with the men, there's a lot of intrigue at the top of the overall standings for them. A lot of intrigue, a lot of suspense. Each and every score, each and every point carries a, a lot of weight. Overall standings for the women coming into this event. We haven't factored in Heat 1 yet, but Laura Horvath has a 15 point lead now over Annie Thoris' daughter. Horvath taking 19th in that last event. Gabby Magawa is in third, 20 points up on 17-year-old Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner is tied with Lawson in points. Turner still has a shot at getting herself onto the podium, as does Amanda Barnhart. Yep. Plenty to be decided over these final two events, as the women for the second and the final heat are on the field. They will take some time to just make sure the ring height is correct. Before we start, the goblet presented by GORUCK. And this event at this point in this test is grueling. We saw it on the men's side. We saw the first heat of women. No one to finish. It's seven rounds of seven ring muscle ups, one hill sprint, and 11 goblet squats at 62 pounds, which a lot of people, they're going to look and say, no big deal, but boy, can that take it out of you. No woman in heat number one was able to finish this event inside the 15-minute time cap. Laura Horvath, in the middle of your screen, had a great events three through seven. She won four straight, the first time anyone has ever done that. She finished second in event seven, and she needed to pile up those points and build that cushion because she saw it almost disappear in event eight when she took 19th place overall. And Laura Horvath should like this event a lot more than she liked the last one. 
tremendously, Sean. She's shown throughout her course of a career that she does well with hanging and pulling. Of course, her background as a climber is going to play into that. But I also expect her to be extremely hungry. After coming off a setback of an of a event like the last one, she needs these points. She could definitely be someone that comes out and gets 100 points right here in this, in this event. Well, someone in this heat is able to finish the event. They will win 100 points, as obviously, if they finish ahead of everybody else in the heat. So Laura Horvath is out towards the front here, along with Danielle Brandon. There's Emma Lawson right next to Annie Thorstadter. Thorstadter gaining some ground now on Lawson in the opening stages of the second and final heat. First of seven rounds here. Yeah, and I really like how, again, it showed Annie. Annie took a bit of a surge just prior to that hill. I think it can save some energy in your legs. Using momentum, we see it in Brandon now too. Use the hill's momentum, use that downgrade to help you build speed. Don't resist it as you come down. And then just glide across the flat to get to that, to get to that kettlebell. Matilda Garns on the left side of your screen. She's down in lane one. She's towards the front too. So it's Garns, it's Brandon, Horvath, Thor's daughter and Lawson all to the kettlebell first. And then Alexis Raptus in lane two, right behind them. Annie Thor's daughter looking to finish on the podium once again here at the Rogue Invitational in her first individual appearance since taking second at this competition in 2021. Matilda Garns is done first, followed by Danielle Brandon and Laura Horvath. Lawson and Thor's daughter finished as well as they head back to the rings to begin round two of seven. Hey, Thor's daughter taking a little time to gather herself before she starts the set. Horvath and Lawson got right to work. There is. Gabby Magawa in lane five. Magawa falling off the pace early here. She came in in third place overall, trying to hold off Emma Lawson. Something I think about, although it's not present in this particular test, rope climbs, upper body pulling strength. We know that Gabby Magawa has struggled with that throughout the semifinal season last year and into even events like the one that we saw yesterday. And we know that that's a strength for Horvath and a couple other of these ladies in this particular heat. So she just probably has an understanding. It's no need for me to get there too soon because I'm already going to have to break these up and I'm already going to have to manage fatigue. Magawa takes a break. Amanda Barnhart just finished her second set of ring muscle-ups as Danielle Brandon and Matilda, Matilda Garns are working their way back. And Laura Horvath and Emma Lawson behind them. It's Brandon, then Garns, Lawson, and Horvath in fourth, but Horvath ahead of Annie Thor's daughter right now. Again, a lot like we saw in that earlier heat. It's, does the pace that the athletes are setting now matter? Yes, but it also is not a direct correlation to what we're going to see in the, in the four rounds to come. So who is pacing it appropriately for themselves to build speed and, and build momentum? 42 reps is where the athletes need to get to close out round two. Danielle Brandon is done. Emma Lawson is done, as is Matilda Garns and now Laura Horvath finishing up. They are now into round three of seven. Seven more ring muscle-ups. Brandon and Garns got right to work, as did Emma Lawson. There was Laura Horvath. And Thor's daughter walking back to the rings. This is one of those workouts for even Emma Lawson as we see her executing her ring muscle ups right there beside Annie. She can seize the moment here and find herself back into the top three with a solid finish in this event, only being 20 points removed from Gabby Magawa. Matilda Garns and Emma Lawson are done. They're your top two in the heat. Now, Daniel Brandon is in third, and Laura Horvath will be the fourth woman to head back to the hill. Annie Thor's daughter is leaning over, breaking her muscle ups on this third set. And now she is done. So Thor's daughter falling behind the lead pack here as Laura Horvath is trotting up that 
Hill, and now she's down to a walk. And for Laura, she's, she's probably thinking, where's Annie, where's Gabby? If Gabby's an afterthought, now she's gonna really be focusing on Annie's pacing and staying just ahead of her. And Gabby Magawa continues to break up these muscle-ups, and she is in 10th place right now in the heat. So very much in danger of falling out of the top three heading into the final event. Danielle Brandon and Matilda Garns are on to the goblet squats for their third set of 11. Emma Lawson there as well in the white top and gray shorts. And here comes overall leader Laura Horvath to begin her set. Annie Thoris daughter coming back. So she is keeping Horvath within reach is Thoris daughter. And we watched Annie Executed ring muscle up. She broke her, her setup already. Laura went unbroken on the last round. I'm anticipating that we'll start to see Laura break hers up here soon, and not necessarily due to the hang and pulling, but it looked like her dips could have been starting to fatigue a bit, uh, which again are, is another press movement that's going to be strongly correlated to what we saw earlier in that handstand push up. Matilda Garns and Danielle Brandon, along with Emma Lawson, are your leaders. Lawson coming in in fourth place with 530 points. She's got to make up 20 points on Magawa to get into third. 70 points on Horvath. And 55 points on Annie Thorstadter to get into second. And Emma Lawson is now your leader in the heat. See her in the background getting to the very bottom of that hill ahead of Matilda Garns. Great adjustment here by Horvath on her ring muscle-ups. There's a pause now on her transition, and what she does is redirects her legs to allow a kip and a drive of the knees to help her with the lockout. Really great adaptation and great self-awareness there. Emma Lawson continues to lead as Matilda Garns is down to a walk up the hill. There goes Laura Horvath, now in third. And Cara Saunders has moved up into fourth. There is Saunders on the far side. Emma Lawson now back to the kettlebell for the fourth time. Horvath and Saunders making the turn and heading back down. Cara Saunders 10th place overall. Not a threat right now to Laura Horvath. Laura was able to also create some more separation between her and Annie on that as they literally just pass one another. Laura approaching the running under that Zeus again for her next set of goblet squats coming up here. And that's gotta be something that helps her feel a bit more at ease with her placing so far in this heat. There goes Annie Thoris' daughter. Emma Lawson, meanwhile, has finished her fourth round. She is your leader. Matilda Garns sits in second. Garns is done with round four. And there is Laura Horvath on her fourth set of 11 kettlebell squats at 62 pounds. Horvath in third place now in the heat, but only about a couple rep lead over Kara Saunders. Emma Lawson back there in the background making short work of her ring muscle ups, catching every rep fairly high. She's already taken off on her run, looking smooth and composed. Well, Emma Lawson one event two, ski bar. She got through every single rep, was just not able to get across the finish line. And we may be looking at another event where nobody finishes, and it's the athlete who gets the farthest who's going to wind up with the win. <laughs> Malawson and Matilda Garns out front, but Lawson, pardon me, is really putting some distance between herself and Matilda Garns. Matilda Garns on the way up that hill is hands on her legs, leaning forward, really laboring to get to the top. There goes Laura Horbath, who sits in third. Cara Saunders, though, has passed her, so Saunders has moved into third place. Horbath holding steady in fourth. Cara executing 
smoothly so far. Really started smooth. Again, kind of out of the conversation as a leader in this particular heat. But here she is, another athlete that has great ability to, you know, acknowledge how they feel, where they're at in the course, not just through this event, but also through the weekend and just managing her pace based off of that, which is right now playing to her favor. Emma Lawson done with five rounds to remain. Annie Thorstadter has fallen back into seventh place in this heat. Now this is big for Laura Horvath because Horvath only had a 15 point lead on Thorstadter coming into this event. There goes Annie. As Laura Horvath is walking back to the kettlebell to close out round five. And this is one where times from and scores from heat number one are certainly going to be a factor. But Laura Horvath right now staying ahead of the woman she needs to beat. And that's Annie Thor's daughter. Yeah, and she's doing a great job specifically as we watch her make her way back to the rings. I am thoroughly impressed with her ability to navigate fatigue and what would create a need to break up this set for most athletes. She pauses, she waits, she redirects her legs and it allows her to stay up there unbroken. And it has so far, and it's already paid off. Even between the race that we earlier saw between her and Danielle Brandon, she's now at least one spot up on her. And of course, every point matters we discussed throughout the course of this weekend. Annie Thoris' daughter to the kettlebell to close out round five. Emma Lawson and Matilda Garns continue to lead as Emma Lawson is coming back to the kettlebell for the sixth time. She's on the right side of your screen in that white top as Laura Horvath is on her sixth set of seven muscle-ups. And notice how all of our ring muscle-ups have, have a traditional momentum. And then she changed it right there. About three reps to go in each of the last three rounds in order to show that lockout at the top, she pauses, she drives her knees up, and allows her body to get to that lockout using the momentum of her lower body. It's, it's a great way for her to, again, establish her placing right now in this heat where she sits. Laura Horvath off once again for the sixth time as Emma Lawson gets closer to finishing this event inside the time cap. A little more than three minutes to go for Emma Lawson. She is through six of the seven rounds. And what we're seeing right now from Emma is just extremely impressive, being, you know, the, the youngest competitor out there on the floor, or the second to youngest now that we've got a young Olivia Kerstetter out there. I can't forget about the 16-year-old Sean. But, but the, the self-awareness and the ability to pace, her gymnastics capacity is, is certainly impressive uh, for, for an athlete that is so, so young in our sport. Well, Emma Lawson came in in fourth place overall with 530 points, and she only trailed Gabby Magawa by 20. She is definitely going to make up that deficit here and look to put herself into a podium spot with just one event remaining. Lawson has a chance of finishing this event if she can hurry. And Gabby Magawa continuing to struggle on those muscle-ups. She has just started round five. Annie Thoris' daughter trying to move up the standings here in this heat. She is in round five as well, around six now. And you, and you watched Annie just make a, a veteran move. She looked up at the screen, she checked what time it was, and she immediately picked up the pace of her run. She understands that as time wanes away, every rep is going to lend itself to her advantage. She's got to get back to the kettlebell and get some work done. And Emma Lawson, to win this event, has got to get back to the kettlebells. Has plenty of time, 40 seconds to go. So Emma Lawson looking at her second event win of the competition. No one even close to her right now. So as long as she just gets a rep or two in, that's some insurance for Emma Lawson. Twenty seconds to go. And Lawson does not need to finish. She's already the leader. She just has to just amass some insurance reps here in case Matilda Garns suddenly finds a seventh gear.
And Emma Lawson, for the second time oh, in this wow. competition, is going to get every rep in, just not across the finish line. Second event win, and will be inside the top three. What a great showing there by Emma Lawson. Impressive. Only trailed Magawa by 20 points. She was 55 points back of Annie Thorstadter. Now, depending on some of those scores from the prior heat, she could be really close to Annie for second. Now, Laura Horvath is going to pick up points on Thorstadter. It's just a matter of how many. She will be the overall leader heading into the 10th and final event. Gabby Magawa is going to find herself outside the top three after finishing towards the back of the pack in that second and final heat. And Annie Thoris daughter is going to have some work to do if she wants to hold off 17-year-old Emma Lawson. So unofficial results, it's Emma Lawson who is going to win the event as she completes all the work, just doesn't get across the finish line. Two times from heat one will be second and third, Anganese and McQuaid, followed by Matilda Garns, Cara Saunders, Laura Horvath is going to take seventh. That'll be good enough for 70 points for her. And we will have to see where Thor's daughter and Magawa finished to figure out what those points are going to look like. So Thor's daughter is going to take 11th. So unofficially, Horvath is going to pick up 20 points on her. Magawa finishes 15th. She'll get 30 points. So Emma Lawson well ahead of her. And Lawson's going to pick up 50 points on Thor's daughter as well. And Sean, the goblet did not disappoint. One of the key things as we watch these athletes navigate this test was they had to make some executive decisions at particular times. While the race is there, the race is for points, podium spots, everybody's got this big finale on their mind. Where are they gonna finish when it's all said and done? They had to be where their feet were. Emma Lawson gave us a great example and a showing of her raw capacity with gymnastics movements. And this is pure CrossFit here, monostructural gymnastics and weightlifting. And she showed us with winning that event there as a 17 year old. Second event win of the competition for Emma Lawson. Unofficial overall standings. Laura Horvath with 670 points is now 35 up on Thor's daughter. Emma Lawson inside the top three, and she has a comfortable lead over Ellie Turner, but now just five points back of Annie Thor's daughter for second. Gabby Magawa now tied with Turner in points, but sits in fifth because of the tie break. Oh boy. Send it, send it down to Kiki Dixon with Emma, Emma Lawson. You just secured another 100 points for that leaderboard. This looked to be an incredibly challenging event. What was the biggest difficulty for you, and then how did you go about overcoming that? Uh, definitely the hardest part was the ring muscle ups. Um, but yeah, I was just trying to run at a pace that would allow me to kind of recover my grip. Um, and yeah, I just kind of started out hot and just kind of went for it again. So I had a lot of fun with it. At 17 years old, you're fighting for a podium spot right now. Is that running through your head as the fatigue sets in? What mantra is going through the mind? Well, I mean, as a competitor, it's always kind of running through your mind. But at the end of the day, I'm just here to have a good time and do my best. So whatever happens, happens. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Win for Emma Lawson as we now have just one event remaining in the CrossFit competition before we crown our 2022 Rogue Invitational Champions. Want to update you on the men's standings as those are now correct. And it is Justin Medeiros who is in the lead by five points over Patrick Bellner heading into the 10th and final event. Chandler Smith, he's still very much alive. 630 points, 25 back of Medeiros and Jeffrey Adler knocking on the door for a spot on the podium. Going to be an exciting finish for the individuals. Oh, yes, it is. We'll take a quick break. When we return, the legends out on the field for the final time at the Rogue Invitational.
For the final time this weekend, the legends are taking the field at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas, as the final day of competition at the Rogue Invitational comes to a close. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway, and Kiki Dixon is down on the competition floor. We're going to see a spin on DT with a spin. Yeah, it's a spin on DT with a spin. You hit the nail on the head, Sean. It's six rounds for time. I go, you go style. 15 calories on the Echo Bike, 12 deadlifts, 155 for the men, 105 for the women, nine hang power cleans, and six push jerks. The way this plays out is that an athlete does the entire round, gets back to their partner, slaps off, and then they do an entire round. Each partner will be responsible for three rounds of this event. The keys to this one for the legends. Yeah, we do got some keys, and it's run fast and hidden element, a lot like we talked about yesterday for the individuals, is, is blended here in the transition. Now, we weren't exactly sure of the layout of this floor, but it's a tight distance there between the barbell and the bike. You want to get your partner started as soon as possible. And then the next one is really fun. Full send till the end, and everybody knows what that means. There's no time here to rest, no reason to really break up a lot of barbell reps. Get your work done and get your partner onto the floor as fast as possible. Less than 10 to go is, it looks like it's going to be Rich Froning and Josh Bridges paired. Pairing's on the left side of your screen. And Jason Kalipa, you saw him cranking away on that thing. I remember the 2014 Invitational in San Jose where Kalipa got on a rower, and I think it was Julie Fouché who had to put her foot on the back of the rower to keep it from moving. Absolutely. This guy could probably break a rower, literally bend <laughs> it in half as he's sitting on there. He can produce a tremendous amount of horsepower, which is why you see him out there working all by himself. He did that in the Echo just to start this event. Well, Jason Kalipa got through almost every single deadlift before Dan Bailey and Josh Bridges touched the bars. And what's cool about Jason historically as an athlete is that he got this identity early as a master of the barbell. He knew how to full send. And then as he matured as an athlete, it really started to show the fruits of his ability to pace and build his aerobic capacity around that type of power output. And that's what made him a great and why he's a legend here today. Well, 2013 was really the year that that aerobic capacity showed up where he did so well at the beginning of the games. Won the burden run. Yeah, that's an event. No, no one really selected him to pick right. and win an event like that. It was long. There were lots of running. There was an odd object thrown into it, and, and he had such a great run that year, especially to start. Rich Froning and Josh Everett are on their rounds. Everett paired with Kalipa. Froning paired with. Rich with, spends uh, a lot bridges. of bridges, and yeah, and Rich, Rich spends a lot of time on ergs. So he knows exactly what pace he needs to hit. At 253 total scored repetitions. There's Annie Sakamoto. One of the original nasty girls. Nico Salo, the 2009 CrossFit Games champion. First European to win the title. The last European to win the title, in fact. Yeah, Miko, Miko. Miko was one of the reasons, Sean, that when I first started CrossFit, I wasn't taking off my shirt like all the other guys. <laughs> and I certainly wasn't going to lay on the ground after a workout because Miko uh -oh. would have walked in and told me I, you know, was showing some weakness there. Josh Everett took a spill and kind of grabbed at his knee. And he's going to continue to work here. And he'll tag off to Jason Kalipa, who could... Probably do the rest of this event by himself if he wanted to. So we hope Josh is okay. He's going to get checked out by the, the medical staff. There's Margot Alvarez. And she is paired with Stacy Tovar. And Dan Bailey working with Miko Salo. Yeah, there's a lot of capacity there with that, with that tandem. They're going to both be putting each other a little bit in the hurt locker, asking each other, hey, why don't you slow down on this next round just a little bit here, Miko, or vice versa. Well, early in Dan Bailey's career, he trained a little bit with Miko Salo when, the, when he was working at Rogue. Dan Bailey, Miko would be there. Samantha Briggs, the 2013 fittest woman on earth. 
I'll tell you. I had, I had a unique experience with Sam Briggs. We, we shared breakfast one morning together at the 2014 CrossFit Games where we both were, were sitting out, not competing. I watched her put peanut butter on her eggs at breakfast, Sean. <laughs> and I had done that and thought it was weird to do that. When I saw her do that, I knew I was in good company. <laughs> so if you guys want to be some of the fittest, I'd maybe experiment with peanut butter. That's on your as simple eggs. as it is. I heard Rich Froning does the same thing, okay, man. Well, now, <laughs> now it's happening. There's Matt Chan, who finished second to Rich Froning in 2012, and was the oldest man to stand on the podium that time in his career. I think still is in the individual competition. And there's a, a great story in the rope sled event for Chan, as you see Stacy Tovar, but. His wife, Cherie, was on the media team that year. And I remember her cheering for Matt during that event. And I asked her, you know, what would you say to him beforehand? And she said, I told him, you better not, things I can't say on air, yes. run <laughs> or, or walk. And uh, Matt did not between the rope and the sled. There's Rich Froning, who has, all, has been a legend for a while, but just coming off a... Another Affiliate Cup championship in the CrossFit Games. But Josh Everett is back out there, so that's good. And now he grabbed at his knee again. And he's just going to call it. That's a smart thing to do. No reason to push through this. Jason Kalipa is going to be responsible for the rest of the work. But that's the kind of competitor that Josh Everett is. Absolutely. And, and, and none of these legends are, are, are superhuman, right? And, and I think that's a reminder to us all. We're all out there fighting the same battles. We're trying to navigate as we age, as we deal with injuries or setbacks, is how to navigate that, how to scale workouts, how to stay in the fight, because that's what matters in the big picture, is continue to stay in the fight in some way, shape, or form. And these legends are a great example of that. There's Josh Bridges. He helped program this competition along with Chris Spieler. Bridges known for some of those epic moments that he had back in the tennis stadium in Carson. Push-pull and the, the finish there with Rich Froning. Yeah, you want to talk about energy. Watching, watching both these two get after their fitness fires me up. Chris Spieler, Josh Bridges head-to-head. -head. And Chris Spieler was so popular and still is so popular when he was competing because he represented that thing we've all been told, whether you're too slow or you're too short, you're too small, you're too big, because he was one of the smallest guys out there but always found a way to get it done, and so many people could identify with what he was going through. Tanya Wagner, who won the CrossFit Games in 2009. Tagging off the... Back of White Miller. Chris Clever on the right. You know, Beck of White Miller, if, if, if we ever were looking for a logo for our, for our sport, she could be in the conversation. 100%. What a career. You're talking about staying in the fight as you aged. As a Masters athlete, she was out there in semifinals throwing down with the individuals. There's Stacey Tovar, who was six months pregnant at this event last year. Another great example of blending, blending fitness and lifestyle. Life hits us in times and seasons. <laughs> Jason Kalipa got through his portion of the work, and he's done. And we hope that you know, Josh is okay. He seems to be... Moving around all right, but making the smart decision to just shut it down. Sam Briggs tagging off to Annie Sakamoto. Master champion from 2021, didn't compete this past season. No, I was lucky enough to experience my first CrossFit Games on this side with Annie, and what a pleasure. I mean, she showed me the ropes, <laughs> took me under her wing, told me not to screw it up, of course. <laughs> but she, she offered plenty of advice. It was, it was great to get to work with her on, on, on the back side of things this year. And there's Carrie Pierce, whose memorable moment came in 
2019 in Mary, the event inside the Coliseum at the Alliant Energy Center when she had the best score out of both the men and the women in that event. Sean, and I'll never forget watching her do Atalanta. That was incredible. In, the, in that odd year where, of course, the CrossFit Games took place with only top five at the, at the ranch, but the capacity that she showed at the end of one of the most grueling tests of fitness that we've ever seen, I was astonished at that. Not only did she win the female side, but she obliterated the whole entire field. Chris Spieler, who's had some incredible performances in his career back in 2012, qualifying for the games the way he did. I can remember uh, we didn't have that broadcast live at the time, and we had Justin Judkins on a phone calling the action in a conference room, and everyone was around the table just listening to the call uh, and describing the action. And the, the, room, the room went nuts when Chris Spieler did what he needed to do to qualify. Margo Alvarez and Stacey Tovar getting set to finish up. Yeah, hanging on to that barbell. The three pairs still working. It's Annie Sakamoto, Tanya Wagner, and Margo Alvarez, the athletes going through their cleans. Chris Clever's on the bike. Alvarez is done. Even as we watch the athletes wrap up these rounds, their natural inclination is to like step over the barbell and look yep. for something to touch or a finish line to cross. You can tell they're like, wait, where do I go? How do I finish this workout? Stick a leg across the, the timing sensor. Tanya Wagner is through. Good job, Tanya. Chris Clever to close things up. One short break for her, right back to work. Oh, look at that fast rebound on those hanging power cleans. We saw a lot of that when we watched the individuals go through DT with the spin. 2010 Plus Games champion. The last American woman to win the games. Sam Briggs, what should be her final round. Another great depiction of our community. Just the, some, of the, some of the most talented competitors in our sport historically, out there on the floor, competing for, for none other than to put on a great show and have a great time together. And they're out there making sure that she slugs it through. Not, not for a particular time, but just literally to make sure she's giving the best that she has. And every athlete out there right now has played a part in getting the sport to where it is today. And it's so great that we get to see them in this setting and celebrate their achievements and see that they are still pretty dang fit. <laughs> Still extremely fit, still class acts. No better group of folks out there to represent the history of, of what this sport has grown into than, than this group of folks. It's good to see Josh Everett up. A little worried about him, but looks to be okay. And the legends for the final time will head off the field. Equipment team floods back on, and they have done a heck of a job of all the volunteers here, moving equipment on and off, keeping this thing running on time. They don't get enough credit for what they do. We do not get to do these competitions without the help of all the volunteers. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon. Guys, you just wrapped up your Rogue Invitational Legends Weekend. Josh, you've been CrossFitting since 2003. What are the biggest changes that you've noticed that, and the progress that you've seen and the momentum that it's created and generated for fitness? Oh, I mean, the level of the athletes that are out here today competing in the individuals is, we couldn't even imagine back 20 years ago. Like, uh, 
I'm basically uh, less fit than the teenagers now uh, at my prime. So it's been amazing to see the progress of the sport. And you started, Jason, in 2006. Do you remember the first time that you heard of Josh Everett? Yeah, I heard of Josh Everett. He would go around, he would just be the proving grounds. He'd go smash everybody in their own fitness. And I remember watching videos of him doing King Kong and getting ready for the 2008 CrossFit uh, Games, getting inspired by him. So yeah, he's motivated me over the years. I'm glad to be a partner with him right now. You guys are all legends, of course, meaning that you've had incredible careers. Becca, what's the biggest highlight that you've had so far? What's a favorite memory for you? I think a few memories for me are highlights, making it as a spirit of the games, but also being next to these amazing human beings. Um, I'm really excited to be around them, and I'm honored to be a part of them. Speaking of being excited, Margo, you guys are having one event a day. What are you doing in between the events, and what's on deck for tonight? So I've been trying to go around and connect with the community. The community has been number one for me from the beginning. Obviously watching all these athletes over the years, Becca was one of the first, as well as Chris and Katie Hogan. So to be able to share this floor with them and to be able to have Katie and Bill provide this and the Rogue team provide this for not only us, but for everyone else, even those watching, it's a special place in my heart and being able to see everyone is amazing. And of course, tonight I'm gonna wind down. <laughs> Thanks you guys. And thank you to the legends for putting on a good show over the past three days for us and the crowd here. We're going to take a break. The Rogue Iron Game is coming up next. And then the 10th and final event for the individuals here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 2022 Rogue Invitational. I'm Pat Sherwood, and I'm very pleased to announce I have some breaking news. Event number 10, the final event for the individuals, has been released. The athletes are being briefed right now, and I'm going to go ahead and bring in the full event description so that we can enjoy it together. It is heavy grace. 30 clean and jerks for time, 225 pounds for men, 165 pounds for women. An amazing twist on a classic CrossFit named workout. This absolutely changes everything. Do not fall in love with the leaderboard. However it looks right now, there's an excellent chance it will not look that way shortly. So don't go far. The Rogue Iron Game show is coming up very soon. We'll have a full event description, a breakdown of event 10, record breakers, full recap, and everything else you need to stay engaged with the competition.
one event left on our final day of competition here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. The leaderboards are tight, so you're going to want to hang on to your hats and glasses. All of that and more, because the Rogue Iron Game starts right now. Welcome to the 2022 Rogue Invitational here at a sunny Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Jamie Hagia, joined here by Dr. Bill Crawford. And Dr. Bill, earlier we saw the Rogue record breakers take place. People were on their feet, and we are going to talk about Hathor breaking his own record in the weight over bar. Hathor Bjornsson, the 2018 World Strongest Man, three-time Arnold Strongman Classic Champion, has the world record in the weight of her bar, the 56 pound weight of her bar at 19 feet, two inches. He's shooting for 19 feet, three inches and cleared it easily. He punched a hole in the sky. Great effort. He also was wearing Dr. Terry Todd's kilt, which was very special. And to do it here in Texas really meant a lot to a lot of us. What a special moment that was. Taking a look at all of the rogue record breakers, there were multiple ones broken throughout the day, but we did see the Denny Stones. We're gonna get to those record breakers in a second, but first, in the Denny Stones, your son, Billy Crawford, got a chance to get after that. How was that seeing your son out there? Well, he's lifted the actual Denny Stones uh, 27 seconds this past summer. He's held these 17 seconds. He, he held them for over 20 seconds. He's only 20 years old, so he's grown up around this. He had a great effort, did a great job. Taking after his father, you must have taught <laughs> him well. But the two men, it was not broken once, but twice. Kevin Ferris and then by Mitchell Hooper. Well, the old record was a little over 31 seconds, and here comes Kevin. We knew Kevin would do a great job. He held him 37 seconds, and I thought, wow, that's it. Well, then comes Mitchell. I didn't know how Mitchell would do because Kevin is a specialist in carrying stones like this. Mitchell picks him up, holds him for over 39 seconds. Unbelievable time. I think we didn't see the record broken. We saw the record obliterated. And Kevin must have been a little heartbroken to see his <laughs> record beaten, but he couldn't be too disappointed because next up was Thor's hammer where he did set that record in that event. Well, he even said, I didn't see that coming. You know, honestly, of the three records, this was the one I thought would be a little more secure. Martins Lisi's lifted the 300-pound Thor's hammer last year, and there he got it, 325. Great lift by Kevin and a world record and the $5,000 record breaker check. That is nice, indeed. Well, that is a wrap on all of our strongmen and all of our rogue record breakers. Dr. Bill, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you for talking all things strongman. Congratulations to all the participants and to those record breakers. But coming up next, you won't want to go anywhere because we have a full recap of CrossFit with Pat Sherwood. I'm joined now by Pat Sherwood, and we are, now that we know the final event, which is very exciting and we will get to in a second, we need to break down what has happened today, Pat. I know, but it's so hard not to talk about the final event right away, but we won't. It's been a great day four of competition. Yesterday I said that I couldn't believe what happened to the leaderboard, the ups and the downs, and every time I refreshed my phone it seemed like things changed. 
I thought today would be a little bit more calm, but I was completely wrong. It was once again leaderboard thrown into a blender, which is fantastic because we still have a great race. I don't know how this thing ends. Before we preview and get to our final events, let's talk about what the women took on this morning in event eight. This is how event eight shook out. Emma McQuay took that top spot. It was Annie Thor's daughter working her way up that made a very needed, much needed fifth place finish. And two people who were on top of the leaderboard in Gabby Magala and one person that the, the overall leader in Laura Horvath, we do not see them in this top 10. Pat, what does that do for Laura Horvath? Oh man, leading up to this event, we were very honest that we know, historically speaking, if we're talking strict deficit handstand push-ups, as capable as Laura Horvath is, this is not what she wants to see come out of the hopper, so to speak. But she is a very capable and smart coach in Ben Smith. They know what they're doing. I don't buy for one second that they're not aware of this weakness and working on it constantly, but some athletes just have their thing that they're always going to be doing more and more work on, and this obviously is Laura's. Incredibly capable, but this is not what she wanted to see, and it knocked her down. That is not what Laura wanted to see, but someone who did enough to move up in the leaderboard is Annie Thor's daughter, and Kiki Dixon caught up with her after event eight, the Snatch and Press. Annie, you just took second overall with this event. You're 15 points out of first place. You went from team to individual, you're a mom, business owner. What are your expectation, expectations Excuse me, for yourself when you come into a competition? Well, my expectations for myself is performing the same or better than I do in training. So like, it's really funny. If you look at the standings, I think the event that I'm the most upset about is the air bike and DT because that's my wheelhouse and I feel like I can destroy that workout. So I underperformed, yet I got like fifth place or something. Then I look at the back squat event, I took 10th, but I am so proud of that event because that was mentally really hard for me. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Expectations are not just placings, it's me performing to the standard that I believe I can hold. Pat, now Annie, Iceland Annie is a veteran of this sport. She made up 70 points and moved from third place to second after event eight. How did she do that? I feel bad. I feel like I just lied to you because when we were talking about Laura Horvath, I mentioned, you know, we all have things to work on. Well. What does Annie have to work on? I actually struggle to think what that might be. She is so well-rounded and so capable. She can do it all, but that's why every time she's been to the Invitational, she's podium. That's why she's won the games a couple times. She's been there 11 times. And since the very first day of competition, she has been gradually gaining ground. And here she is in the conversation. She's crushing it. Absolutely. After that, the women took on event nine. And here is a look at your event nine results for our women. Coming into this event, Laura Horvath and Annie Thor's daughter were in that one two spot. But it really was that 17 year old Emma Lawson who took an event win on the goblet in event nine. Now, how did Emma Lawson do to shake up this leaderboard? She's such a capable young athlete. I think her future is very bright. What's interesting in competition is. Don't get me wrong, every athlete out there, they want to win. They want to take the number one spot. But Emma Lawson winning, I don't think it upset Laura Horvath that much, as long as Andy Thor's daughter didn't win, because Emma Lawson winning, that created separation and got Horvath back some of that cushion. So in all, in all honesty, it was good for Emma and good for Horvath. Bad for Thor's daughter. We will take a look at our overall leaderboard after nine events, heading into the final event with one more event left before we crown our 2022 Rogue Invitational Champion. It is Laura Horvath in that top spot with 670 points. Annie Thor's daughter is behind by 35 points after that, followed up only by five points behind in the 17-year-old Emma Lawson. But don't count out Ellie Turner and Gabriella Megala, who are only five points separated in that 585 and 580 spot. Pat, looking towards that final, what are you expecting from these women? How is uh, this going to shake out? The race right now, 
I know we'll dive into Event 10 here in a second, but Event 10 plays really well for Laura Horvath. She's sitting in first place with a 35-point cushion. I think she's relatively comfortable. So for me, there's a great race for who's going to be second and third. I think that could change very much. That's where I'd be watching as a fan. That's a wrap on our women for now, but taking a look over at our men's side, the men also took on Event 8 earlier this morning, and the results for that was Jason Hopper taking that event win with a 6 minutes and 56 seconds. We see Chandler Smith coming off that event win last night to a third place finish in Event 8 here, and then we see Justin Medeiros in the eighth spot, but very important, we do not see Roman Krennikov on there. So, Pat, Justin takes, uh, he is sitting in that eighth spot, or eighth in event, in event eight. How is he looking after this? That was actually a fantastic event. I got to just ease my way into the crowd. I enjoyed it as a fan. It was fantastic. And there was something that stood out to me in the third and final round. I was watching Justin on the handstand push-ups because up to then, Roman had been ahead of him the entire time. And I said, okay, I guess Roman's just gonna win this thing and that's bad for Justin. Justin locked out a really tough handstand push-up, and anyone who's worked out, you know that feeling where you're like, this next one's probably a bad idea, but I'm going for it. That's what Justin did. It paid off, and that put him ahead of Roman. A couple other people snuck in, so Justin rolls the dice every now and then, and that one paid off for him. He definitely does. Kiki Dixon caught up with Justin Medeiros after event eight. Justin, you just slid in as the overall leader. How strategic are you with each and every event and the competition overall? Yeah, man, I think just every event counts so much. I mean, just the ordering of the events makes it seem like the ones later in the weekend mean more, where that's not the reality of the situation. I had a couple of bad mess ups yesterday, so uh, trying to come from behind today and make every second count. Now, how do you handle those disappointments that you're just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely hard to focus on, but um, at the end of the day, they're learning experiences, and uh, I just make sure that's never going to happen again. <laughs> another man who had another great event eight, coming off a of first last night, a third today, is Chandler Smith. We did talk about him, but he closed the gap, and he was only five points behind in that second place behind Justin Medeiros. Thoughts on Chandler? I'm so happy that Chandler's in the conversation. Great guy, great athlete, has tremendous capacity and can knock things out of the park. And he showed up, got the points that he needed, mixed up the leaderboard, moved himself around. This is his fourth appearance at the Rogue Invitational. He's been to every one so far. He's been in the top five twice, but he's never stood on the podium. And it looks like today could be his day. Then the men took on event nine, and let's take a look at our event nine results for our men. What we're gonna see is we have Justin Madero sitting in that seventh place spot, and the two men chasing after him in Chandler Smith and Roman Krennikov, you do not see them in this top 10, but the person who needed a much needed victory and first place finish in this was Patrick Vellner. And when times get tough, he shows up. How was Pat in event number nine with all this pressure? Vellner is such an interesting and capable athlete. He's got so much physical work capacity, but sometimes he just makes himself, uh, makes work for himself. He has to dig himself out of a hole. And it was the same this year at the Invitational, and he really needed this win. Entered in fourth, left in second place. That's a massive swing on the leaderboard. And he also has been to every single Rogue Invitational. He's been second twice. He won the whole thing in 2020. And right now, he's not looking to go quietly. Things have definitely been shaken up on the men's overall leaderboard. Let's take a look at that to see how it has panned out. We still have Justin Medeiros in that top spot with 655 points. But if you look, Patrick Vilner is only five points behind him in second place. Chandler Smith is sitting in that third place spot with 630, looking to podium for the first time here at the Rogue Invitational. And Roman Krennikov moved to that fifth place spot behind Jeffrey Adler. Now, Pat, what do we think about this men's overall <laughs> leaderboard? It has been all over the place. That's a fantastic leaderboard. Whoever you're a fan of, if they're somewhere in the top five, they have a chance, especially now that we know what event 10 is. It is going to mix up the leaderboard. Medeiros could take it. Chandler Smith could bump himself up. I don't know how it's going to shake out, but it's going to be exciting. 
Exciting indeed. We, indeed, we are in for a great show, but here is a look at our last event of the Rogue Invitational. Event 10 is Heavy Grace, 30 clean and jerks at 225, 165. It seems very simple, but it seems a little deceiving because it seems so easy. Oh. So what are the keys to this event? Uh, this is just an absolute beast. Let's not sugarcoat it. Just grace to the 10th degree right here. You need to be strong, but we're not talking one rep. This is muscular stamina and endurance. 30 reps is a lot of reps at what is a decent percentage of everyone's one rep max. I'm sure you're gonna see steady singles right from the get-go and then finish strong. If it comes down to that final five to seven reps where it turns into a sprint, can you get to the finish line? With one event left and the leaderboard so close, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Who, what are our predictions for the women's side? I'll tell you what, this lays out really well for Horvath. So I'm gonna say that she holds on to the overall lead, but she may not win this event. Again, this could be a Danny Spiegel knock it out of the park sort of a deal. On the men's side, I think this might excite you a little bit. Chandler Smith, I think this lines up really well for him. I think it's a wheelhouse workout for him and he might even advance a bit up the leaderboard. So Justin Medeiros, with just five little points between him and Vellner, he's not safe, and Chandler Smith can bring it on this heavy grace. Well, I know we are all excited to see this final event, and after this, we will have a men's and women's 2022 Rogue Invitational champion. Event 10 is coming up next.
still replacing right now. But the question is, is that where they will remain as we get into this final event? Here is how close it is on top of the overall standings with one event to go. Justin Medeiros has a five-point lead over Patrick Vellner. Chandler Smith sits in third. He is 20 points back of Vellner for second, and Jeffrey Adler is still very much alive for a spot on the podium. The event, it's grace, but since it's these athletes, it's heavy grace, presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. 30 clean and jerks, more commonly seen at 135 and 95 pounds. It is now escalated to 225 pounds for the men and 165 pounds for the women. What a way to finish here for event 10. Keys to an event that everyone knows very well when it's done at 135 and 95. Everybody knows that in Grace, you just kind of come out and you go for broke, right? Grip it and rip it, how long can you hang on? Well, there's gonna have to be a tremendously different approach and strategy here. Point one is create a rhythm. These athletes have to get in sync with their clean first. Don't overlook that element of the lift. It sets you up for a successful jerk and then build momentum as you go. Sean, a lot of the separation in this workout is gonna happen after rep 16 and beyond. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon. Guys, you may notice that that final barbell looks a little different. That's the money bar. They figured final bar, money bar, might serve as a little motivation for these fellas. It's not bad to be reminded what you're competing for when you get to that final barbell. Your lane assignments on the left side. There is Ricky Garrard who comes in a little bit surprising, 11th place overall had a really tough stretch of events where he took an 18th, a 10th, an 11th, and an 18th. Bounced back today to begin the last night with a third and then took 17th earlier today. And as we're gonna get we're gonna get into a point in this in this event as we, we look at Nick Matthew there who a man with a 545 pound listed back squat someone who absolutely crushed back attack earlier with these heavier loads. This is someone that we can make the assumption with quality movement could have a strong, strong finish here in heavy grace. 10 reps at each barbell and the athletes will move forward after the completion of those reps. And they will end on that money bar. And Tim Paulson, who is towards the front along with Lazar Jukic and Saxon Panchik. Paulson and Matthew advancing to the second barbell. One of the hidden elements of, of when you do an event with high levels of barbell cycling is even managing the downward fall or downward motion of the load. You have to, quote unquote, babysit the bar to a degree, which means guide it or follow it down so that it doesn't get out of control, get into your opponent's lane, and perhaps cause you a no rep or the need to reset your barbell. Paulson and Matthew are about halfway through. Jack Farlow, who is closest to the camera right side of the screen, he's on the lead pace as well. The only athlete's now separated by just about four reps. Paulson and Matthew now are in the back half of this event. And Sean, as we approach the two minute mark, I can't help but take everybody back on a little history lesson of an athlete they might be familiar with in the name of Rich Froning Jr., who we've seen do this exact workout, heavy grace, in three minutes and 15 seconds. That was back in 2014. And of course, that's when we saw double grace to close out the 2014 CrossFit Games as Nick Matthew now moves to the final barbell. Here comes Jack Farlow and now Tim Paulson as well. Matthew seems to have established a really steady rhythm. Same with Farlow. We see him get set for his next rep. Executing a clean, a clean, an, I'm sorry, a quick jerk out of these cleans where the athletes aren't pausing and redipping. They're jumping that thing directly off that clavicle into the next rep. It, re it removes or minimizes time under tension. Jack Farlow now with five reps to go. Nick Matthew with 
six. Tim Paulson has fallen off the lead pace by about a rep. Jack Farlow, the youngest man in the field at 20 years old, showing off some power. It's right there. Stay at the bar, Jack. Hands to the bar. This is where mantras matter. Your self-talk, your self-language is important. You can will your way to picking up that bar for the next rep. One rep remains for Jack Farlow. Nick Matthew has two to go. What a great way to finish for Jack Farlow, who is going to get across the finish line. Nick Matthew just completed his 29th rep. He has one to go. And Matthew is done. Wow. Tim Paulson almost squatting that rep. He's got two left. Ricky Garrard has two left. And athletes are fighting with every ounce of energy they have left. This being event 10 of a long four days, it's been an incredible test, and we're, we're starting to see some residual fatigue. There goes Ricky Garrard. Right behind him is Tim Paulson. Lazar Jukic had to quicken his pace at the end as Jorge Fernandez was bearing down on him. Saxon Panchik with a no rep. There is Cole Sager, who has a couple reps left. Heinrich Hapolainen coming across the finish line. Three men left, Panchik, Sager, and Scott Tetlow. Now Sager is in. Great finish back there. Sager is one of the men here who actually faced double grace back in the games in 2014. Noah Olsen is the other. Final rep for Saxon Panchik. And the entire heat gets in inside the six-minute time cap. It is Jack Farlow, the 20-year-old, who sets the time to beat at 351.60 seconds. The only man to go sub four in that heat. And certainly not the last we're going to see of this young man competing on this stage. Absolutely not, Sean. And you mentioned him before we got on. You were like, hey, is, is Jack Farlow one of those guys? And I said, I don't know. We got to see how his ability is to pace a workout like this because it's fast but not quite a sprint. And right there, he really showed that he's learned quite a bit through his experience so far. And even through the course of these four days, he's now beginning to quickly put some things together. Jack Farlow came in in 19th place overall, but this was more about experience for him than it was about having a legitimate chance of maybe winding up on the podium or inside the top 10 system. Great knowledge and wisdom gained by Jack Farlow competing here at the Rogue Invitational. 351.60 seconds. Sub four for the young man. Nick Matthew will finish in second, followed by Ricky Garrard, and then Tim Paulson. And you wondered, strategy-wise, how would Farlow look when he got into the latter part of this event? I'd say he did pretty well. He did a great job here as we, we get a glimpse at his final few reps, holding it together with his technique, finding room to breathe with the bar in the front rack position, which is difficult when it weighs 225 and it's bearing down on your soul. And here, his final rep, he didn't hesitate, dip drive, great jerk to finish. And way to finish on the money bar. Jack Farlow, your Heat 1 winner. As we get ready for the second and final heat, the final heat for the men's competition here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational Heavy Grace presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. And it is all on the line for these 30 clean and jerks that these athletes are going to face at 225 pounds. It'd be a different story if this was event one throughout the course of a four-day test, Sean. But it is event 10. They have been through so much so far. And this is why this pure test of strength and stamina is so appropriate for us to hit a home run here at Dell Diamond to finish this thing. Here are your overall standings coming into the event. Have not factored in any scores or times from that prior heat. Justin Medeiros clinging to a five-point lead over Patrick Vellner. 
Chandler Smith currently sits in third place. He's going to have some work to do to hold off Jeffrey Adler, who loves getting his hands on a heavy barbell. Justin Medeiros trying to become the first man to ever repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion. Patrick Vellner trying to wind up on the podium here at this competition for the fourth straight time. Consistency, consistency by Mr. Pat Vellner. And he is a competitor of all competitors. He shows up. We, we've seen him have high finishes. We've seen him have low finishes throughout the course of his career. But he's always someone that we're talking about. And it's due to his consistency and performance over the course of four to five days. See Medeiros in the back right behind Vellner, Chandler Smith there. As well, along with Jeffrey Adler, Roman Krenikov, who has had the lead on a couple different occasions in this competition, but ran into some problems in the last two events, a 12th in event eight and then a 17th in event nine. And that's really what took him out of contention for the championship. Yeah, and this is, this is unique as we just kind of panned in on those guys final moments before they take the field for this final event with, with so much on the line for each of them, whether it just comes down to, hey, the finances that you get as a, as a spur along moment, you know, when you, when you get your placing, or if it's really just to contend because you are at heart a competitor above all things, they're feeling the pressure. And 10 years ago, you were in a similar situation, winner take all event at the CrossFit Games. I know there's always anticipation before you go out on the field, but what's it like when that is on the line? When, when you are in this moment in itself, before you take the field, guess what? You're feeling a little tired. You're feeling a little fatigued. You're feeling worn down. And then all of a sudden, in this moment right here, as they begin to announce you and you take your place, your body hits a new state. You almost go numb, and your focus hones in on you and the barbell. And what will it take to maximize your output here? Because you came to win, and now is your opportunity not to just prove that to everyone here that's watching worldwide, but also to yourself. There are your top two men, Pat Vellner, who's coming off an event win in the goblet, his first of this competition. And Justin Medeiros, who made a couple uncharacteristic mistakes back in event five. And then in event seven, the Texas Oak was unable to get his lift inside the cap. He took 16th in that event. That is very uncharacteristic for, characteristic for him as he is usually always inside the top 10 of this, these events. And that's what has opened the door for this now winner-take-all finish between him and Vellner. Yeah, and as these guys get ready to take on this event, I can't help but think in the back, I mentioned there's some fatigue. They've done a lot of work. Again, hats off to these athletes. Hats off to the programmers and Josh Bridges and Chris Spieler. And the show that this Rogue Invitational has been up to now, that barbell felt pretty darn heavy to them in the back during the warm-up, guaranteed. But now when the sun's shining and the crowd gets loud and they hear that beep that initiates this event, it's going to feel very different here on these first 10 clean and jerks. Chandler Smith, third place overall, just 20 points back of Vellner for second, 25 back of Madero for first. So he is very much alive here as far as the top spot on the podium is concerned. And I like Chandler. I like Chandler in this event. Power-based. He can move a barbell. We know that. Think about the similarities that this shows even to the log max out event that we watched last night. Simon's on the left side of your screen. Vellner, Medeiros, and Smith will all be right next to each other. And also, keep an eye on Jeffrey Adler. He's in the red tank top on the right side of your screen. Who wants to be the Rogue Invitational Champion? We're going to find out here in Event 10. Heavy Grace presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. Exposure here early is important. Again, focusing on the clean, creating a rhythm for the jerk. That's what makes it feel more weightless as you go overhead. Catch the bar high into your throat. Finish the pull. Don't get lazy. Jack Farlow has the time to beat the upper right-hand part of your screen. 351.60 seconds. Adler, Vellner, Medeiros, Smith, Krenico. All out front. There's only a couple reps separate the entire field here. Adler is through his first set of 10. He will move up. Here comes Roman Krenikov. Yep. Vellner and Madeira's done at the same time. 
along with Chandler Smith. So the top three men just hanging right next to each other here. Roman Krennikov threw now 13 of those 30 reps. Miller continues to lead though. I love the sureness of Justin's overhead position. As fatigue starts to build, the clean becomes not the limiter, but sometimes where your lockout is and where you receive the barbell. And Justin, due to his finish, really secures that barbell up and back. See Jeff Adler on the left side of your screen in the tank top. He is your leader. Remember, fourth place overall, 615 points. Only 15 back of Smith for a spot on the podium. Right now, Pat Vellner has a couple rep lead on Justin Medeiros. As Vellner is past the halfway point, as is Medeiros. And now Jeffrey Adler continues to move forward on to the third and final barbell. Adler moving smoothly. Right back to the bar. Cadence picks up just a touch. And now Vellner on to the final barbell. He's ahead of Medeiros. And he has men between the two of them as Chandler Smith has now moved ahead of Medeiros. Here comes Justin. He's got to make up some ground here on this final barbell. Vellner has eight to go. And here comes Justin Medeiros. We'll see if Medeiros picks up his pace here. Vellner through 24. Adler is staring at an event win. He has three to go. Chandler Smith is through 23 of the 30. Vellner with five left. And he misses a rep. And that's that overhead position, Sean, where, where Justin locks it out and gets it there. Pat struggles with the bar out in front of him. He's got to finish his drive through his hips to get the bar up and back. Adler's going to win the event. He is in, and he is very much alive for a spot on the podium. And Pat Vellner and Medeiros are now tied. Medeiros ahead of Vellner. Here comes Krenikov. Smith with one rep to go. Chandler Smith, he hits this. He's getting it across the finish line. And there it is as Chandler Smith comes in. And Vellner has three to go, and he is missing reps. Justin Medeiros on his final rep, and Justin Medeiros may have done it. Wow, what a finish by Justin Medeiros there on that last money bar. Hopper and Gumanson are in, and Pat Vellner was a handful of reps away from the Rogue Invitational Championship and failed, and Justin Medeiros was able to storm ahead of him. And now Vellner is across. And you can tell he is upset. Noah Olsen is in. Jonas still out there grinding away. Last rep for him. And with that, the men's competition has come to a close and Justin Medeiros Snatching victory from the jaws of defeat and snatching the title away from Patrick Vellner and looking to become the first man to repeat as champion. Vellner was so close. So close. And he went for it. You know, this is, this is a, a very hard place for an athlete to be in, but there's a point in a workout where you have to choose to lean in and go for it. And he chose to. And, of course, he told the line and ended up on the, on the side that he was not hoping to end up on. Here are your unofficial event results. Jeffrey Adler gets his first career Rogue Invitational win. He had to make up 15 points on Chandler Smith. Unofficially, he's only going to make up 10. Krenikov takes second. Smith takes third, looks to keep himself on the podium. But Adler may have erased the deficit he had to Patrick Vellner because Vellner takes 10th in the event. So still a lot needs to be figured out here. Vellner may have gone from contending for the title to off the podium. Yeah, and, that, and that's really one of the hardest parts when you're towing the line with your threshold. You meet that point of failure and, and meltdown, and that's what it turns into. There's really no recovering until you wait in an event this 
this short, you have to wait too long. Other people are going to open that door of opportunity and kick it down, take those points away. Justin Medeiros looking like he will be the first man to repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion. And Jeffrey Adler, with that event win, may have put himself on the podium. Chandler Smith looking to take second. Yeah, and I'll tell you, this, this right here, this situation that we're in, this is why Justin Medeiros is hard to beat. Is it's rare that we saw him this weekend falter a few times. He had some setbacks, no doubt. But in these moments when the pressure is the highest, he makes it really difficult to beat him because he just doesn't beat himself. You have to give Pat Vellner credit for, for trying and pushing the pace, but just a handful of reps away from completing the event, and then he fails, and that's what allows Justin Medeiros to beat him at the end. And efficiency playing, playing a key role in that. We go back and rewind and watch this rep for rep, which I would encourage young people that want to compete in this sport and perform at a high level or people pursuing the highest level of their own personal fitness. Watch how proficiency sets you apart as fatigue starts to build. That young man right there is proficient with his overhead position. It's, it's set apart. It's, it's about doing the common uncommonly well. And Justin does that with certain aspects of his fitness, and that's truly what sets him apart through the course of a grueling workout or a grueling weekend. He certainly made it interesting. We had six lead changes throughout the course of this event, this competition. And Justin Medeiros looking like he's going to pull this off. And Justin Medeiros has done it. First man to repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion. Was he pointing up to you and I right there, Sean? I thought he might have been. <laughs> Getting congratulated by Chandler Smith. And man, it looked like that was slipping from his grasp there as Pat Vellner had a solid first two rounds and then got to that final barbell. Can you imagine his parents? His mom, hey, you were really stressing me out there. Why wanted I was yelling, why weren't you speeding up? He's gonna say, Mom, I got this. Don't you worry. Oh man. Don't you worry. An exciting finish to the men's competition in what has been a back and forth event for the past four days. It's Justin Medeiros, your two-time Rogue Invitational Champion, and he is with Kiki Dixon. Congratulations on becoming the two-time Rogue Invitational Champ. One of the very first things you did, even though you were tired and you're a little bit beat up, is run to the fans. Why? Man, dude, these people are why we do it. I mean, I grew up in a box. Yeah, woo! Yeah, man, I mean, I was in the, I was in the fans. I volunteered at the CrossFit Games in 2015, so I, I have been there, you know? So, man, it feels so good to compete and uh, share it all with these guys. It looked like a fight this weekend. You had some ups, you had some downs. So what does it mean to you to stand on top at the end today? Yeah, no, de definitely had to battle some things this weekend, but uh, they're going to make me a better athlete in the future. So it was awesome to kind of have those mistakes, but also be able to overcome those and uh, still compete at my best. Now, when you're having those moments, who do you look to for support? You're such a motivation and inspiration to so many people, but you've got to have some people in your corner that you're going to during that time. Yeah, man, this is definitely not one person. I mean, I think you guys heard all these guys up here all weekend. But uh, yeah, there's some of my coaches, Ellie, yeah, everybody. It's just uh, it's so awesome to feel the love all weekend. And all these guys, I mean, I, coming off of a bad event and being able to walk up, everyone's still happy to see me giving high fives, telling me good job. And, and uh, it, it's hard to pout when you have everyone so happy and cheering me up. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Justin Medeiros, your 2022 Rogue Invitational Champion. First man to win back-to-back -back 
titles in the men's division in the four-year history of this competition. 735 points. Chandler Smith gets into second. And Jeffrey Adler leapfrogs fellow Canadian Patrick Vellner for that final spot on the podium. It breaks Vellner's string of finish on the podium every single year here at the Rogue Invitational. Roman Krenikov moves into the top five. Stays there from his last event, and it's Bjorkman Gumanson. Oh, BKG. Followed by Hopper, Quant, Olsen, and then Ricky Garrard manages to finish inside the top ten. It was certainly a blast to watch over these last four days, and we're not even done yet. The women's podium will be decided next as we continue our coverage of the 2022 Rogue Invitational. The men have been through Heavy Grace, presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. Now it is time for the women. Thanks for being with us, everybody, on Sunday here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational at the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway. Kiki Dixon is down on the competition floor. It's a workout we all know and love, but much more difficult for this crew. Much more difficult, not to begin with the fact that it is event 10 of 10 throughout the course of the last four days, but this is heavy grace. It's 30 clean and jerks at 165 pounds for these women, and that just ups the ante just a touch. Your keys to this event. Well, the keys are for the athletes to create a rhythm right out of the gate, build into the intensity as you go, allow a clean power clean to set up a successful jerk and build momentum and speed throughout the race really starts when there's 14 clean and jerks remaining. Ariel Lowen and Danny Spiegel who is definitely one to watch in this event. First of two heats in the final event for the women here at the 2022 Rogue invitation. You really have to like Danny Spiegel's potential here. Cycling a load at 165 pounds from the ground all the way to overhead because of her success at the Texas Oak last night, all the way up to 215 with reserves left. She hit that big lift just to put on a show for all of us here, and it looked like she had some pounds left on the table there and could have continued to go. Spiegel's already through six of her opening 10 reps. work of these. The ladies really minding their initial pace. Of course, making sure, and I'm sure they got to watch some of the some of the men take the floor before, but understand that you start too fast, you dig yourself in a dangerous deficit that falls completely apart on that money bar. Spiegel, the first woman to the second bar, along with Olivia Kerstetter, a 16-year-old. Now Ariel Lowen is there as well. And here comes Matilda Garns in the yellow top along with Emma McQuaid. Danny Spiegel has an event win already in this competition. She finished first in the Texas Oak to close out Saturday night. I say as we watch this, there's a common trap when you're in a single modality barbell. Uh, event where when you drop that bar, it's really easy to want to take a couple steps backward. 
the further you go back, the more justification you can give yourself to rest and hang out, and that's certainly not going to help your time in the finish. So you've got to have some really great self-confidence, assuring words or mantras to get yourself at the bar, back to the bar, hands on the bar to get that thing moving. Right now, Olivia Kerstetter in the bottom right-hand part of your screen is keeping right with Danny Spiegel. Two of them getting set to move on to the third and final barbell. And they are done at the same time. Olivia Kerstetter being a prime example of a next-gen crossfitter coming into our sport, had the opportunity to compete as an individual at the semifinal level this year, turned it down, said, I'm gonna go one more time as a teen, and now she's here with the fittest women in the entire world at the Rogue Invitational, putting on a show with 165 pounds on the barbell. Kerstetter and Spiegel back and forth here for the lead. Now Ariel Lone is on to the final barbell. Five remaining for Kerstetter as she has pulled ahead by one rep of Danny Spiegel. Kerstetter's coach fired up as he watches her cycle these clean jerks. He's got to really love, Jacob Hebner has to absolutely love watching a young, strong athlete that has a very different natural skill set than him as an athlete out there on the floor. I'm sure he feels like a coach in the candy store, if you will, with, with the pool of talent she has. Kerstetter now on her final rep. And Olivia Kerstetter is looking at a heat win as Danny Spiegel has now just cleaned the bar. So Olivia Kerstetter in her individual debut will take the opening heat of Heavy Grace. Now Danny Spiegel is in. Three forty-eight point one one seconds for Olivia Kerstetter. Phenomenal. Anytime you beat Danny Spiegel in a heavy barbell event, you're doing something right. You are absolutely doing something right. Strength, stamina, and mental fortitude. Emma McQuaid is your leader on the field. Now she is done. Tilda Garns on her final rep. Garns is in. Annika Greer, Bailey Rogers, and Carolyn Prevo are on the last barbell. Andrea Solberg is on her second barbell. And Jacqueline Dahlstrom knocked out three reps and has just stopped working. Yeah, and it's it, this is a tough place to be in sometimes as a competitor, Sean. You're not you're not competing for the podium at this point. And I've been here as an athlete too, where you are being put through a grueling series of events and your body's had it. You're at the end of your means when it comes to energy and stamina. And you're just fighting for every rep simply because you are a competitor and you still want to finish as best as you can. Annika Greer is across. Final couple seconds here. Bailey Rogers is going to get in. And Carolyn Prevo has another rep to go, but she's going to come up short. But it's Olivia Kerstetter saving her best performance for last. She wins the heat. Three minutes, 48.11 seconds. Danny Spiegel got out early, but Olivia Kerstetter reeled her in and stayed even with her for most of this event. She really did, and of course, Danny Spiegel would be our natural favorite in an event like this with her success with heavy loads. And she started crisp, she started clean, she was conserving energy, but it was Olivia Kerstetter, CrossFit's next generation, coming up through as a 16-year-old, winning an event with a heavy barbell, showing tremendous mental fortitude, and a ridiculous amount of strength and stamina.
Olivia Kerstetter with her first career heat win. And there are definitely big things to come for that young woman. And there is Jacob Hebner who coaches Olivia Kerstetter. Jacob Hepner, in his time in our sport, known for having one of the best motors out there. Tremendous aerobic capacity, really high level for pain tolerance. When we look at Olivia Kerstetter, his athlete, they've, they've got a, a very opposing natural skill set. I believe that they're going to make a very powerful team as coach and athlete in the future. Results from heat number one, Olivia Kerstetter, sub four minutes, 348.11 seconds. Danny Spiegel will take second. It's Ariel Lowen by two tenths of a second, less than that over Emma McQuaid and Matilda Garns, rounding out the top five. Youth represented well there in that heat is on a career, takes sixth. Now we get set for the second and final heat of Heavy Grace, event 10 presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. A lot of times athletes are going to hear about Grace. It's a benchmark workout. 135 pounds and 95 pounds is the common loading that we'll see 30 reps for a time. But today at the Rogue Invitational for these elites, fittest women in the world, it is 165 pounds. Laura Horvath comes in as your overall leader. 670 total points. She has a 35 point cushion on Annie Thoris' daughter. So for Horvath, just stay close to Annie. She has a 40-point lead on Emma Lawson. In order for that to get a race in one event, Emma Lawson would have to win the event. And Laura would have to finish 10th or worse. Annie Thor's daughter would need to win the event and have Laura finish 9th or worse in order to overtake her for the top spot on the podium. We are underway. 348.11 seconds is the time to beat. John, we've got some amazing athletes on the field for a particular tests like this. We've got Cara Saunders. We have got Gabby Magala. We have got Ellie Turner. All of these athletes with a tremendous amount of capacity and the potential to do well, all chasing after Laura Horvath in the points total. Ellie Turner, fourth place overall, with 585 points. Ten reps on this opening barbell, ten reps on the next one, and then ten reps on the third and final. Some of the focus here being as an athlete. Set up, create a rhythm on your clean. Allow your power clean to be caught high in your throat or on your clavicle to set up an effortless jerk overhead. The more energy you can conserve for these 30 reps, the better. Cara Saunders was the first to move to the second barbell, followed by Turner, Thoris, Daughter, and Horvath. Here comes Amanda Barnhart. Manon Anganez. Alexis Raptis just failed a rep there in lane three. Every woman has moved on to their second set of 10. Yeah, and we see Annie even stutter step a little bit on that jerk. These athletes want to build momentum, not lose it. They want to conserve just a touch off the gate, which is hard to do when it's down to points and you're on the final event, but it's necessary. Cara Saunders, bottom right-hand part of your screen. She is your leader. She has about a rep lead on Laura Horvath. And as long as Laura Horvath just stays with Annie Thoros' daughter and Emma Lawson, she is going to be your 2022 Rogue Invitational Champion. Horvath survived a second to last place finish in event eight. And the reason she was able to do that, she racked up four straight event wins in events three through six and then finished second in event seven, build a big enough cushion for herself for those deficit handstand push-ups. And now she is right behind Kara Saunders for the lead in this heat and ahead of both Lawson and Thoris' daughter. Joined by Ellie Turner there to her left. Ellie Turner's got to make up 45 points on Emma Lawson. get in to the top three. Oh, 
Saunders and Horvath in the lead now, just six reps away from finishing. Great execution here as we haven't really seen her pace change at all. Technically looking the same as when she started, rep for rep. Emma Lawson is behind Laura Horvath and now moving to the final barbell. Ellie Turner is way ahead of her right now. So Turner is doing what she needs to do in order to give herself a chance to finish on the podium. Two reps remain for Laura Horvath. Kara Saunders is in. She's going to win the event. Laura Horvath is in with one rep to go. And that is going to do it. And Laura Horvath is your 2022 Rogue Invitational Champion. What a week for Laura. Annie Thor's daughter trying to keep herself on the podium as now Ellie Turner is across. How much? Who can separate her and Emma? Unofficially, that should be fourth in the event as Barnhart is in. Now, here comes Thor's daughter. So Emma Lawson has five reps to go as Gabby Magawa comes in. And now we have times from the prior heat starting to play in here, so Emma Lawson's got to hurry up if she wants to stay on the podium. Yeah, it's natural to want to look left to right. Of course, she's aware of the situation she could find herself in now, but it's get back to that bar, Emma. Anganese is in. And this is looking really good for Ellie Turner right now. Lawson is done, and she is across. There is Danielle Brandon. She and Alexis Raptus still on the field. Brandon is through. Raptus is done. And with that, the 2022 Rogue Invitational comes to a close. And it looks like it's going to be Laura Horvath who stands atop the podium here in Round Rock, Texas. Just needed to stay close to Lawson and Thor's daughter. Wound up beating them both. That's right. Just like a professional. She knew exactly what situation she needed to find herself in. Kara Saunders came out fast and continued her onslaught of the rest of the field here through these 30 clean and jerks. She is strong, she is powerful. She is an OG in herself and she knows how to execute, especially in the latter part of a few tough days of competition. But it's Laura Horvath who was able to exactly end up where she needed to end up, stay ahead of Thor Stoddar, and of course, the crowd loved to see Cara Saunders end her weekend with a W. But she is going to be crowned the queen of the Rogue Invitational. Laura Horvath is going to take third in this event. Cara Saunders will win. It's her first event win of this competition. And how about Olivia Kerstetter, the youngest competitor in the field, saving her best for last she will take second place. Now, Ellie Turner is good enough for fourth. And on that front page, you do not see Emma Lawson. And that means that Ellie Turner may have just put herself on the podium. What a competition we've seen for the last four days with all of these women. And credit Laura Horvath. She could have fallen apart after that last event, but understood the bigger picture and that she still had the lead came out here and was able to take a third place and put herself on top of the podium yeah and i think there's there's a unique ability there for her to understand 
where she struggles and of course being able to lean into her strengths both in training and preparation even mindset wise hey there's going to be ups there's going to be downs i've got to take points where they're available to me i was really impressed with her last event in event nine the way she managed those ring muscle ups and rebound from the tough handstand push-up workout this morning let's go down to the field kiki dixon is with laura horvath Laura, congratulations on winning the Rogue Invitational. What does it mean to you? Thank you so much. It's awesome. Being here is very good, and this competition is amazing, so I'm very happy to be here. Now, on this final event, that last bar was the money bar. Did it serve as any motivation? Oh, definitely. That bar looks really nice. <laughs> congratulations. What are you doing after this? Take a break, for sure. Go home and relax. We're so happy you joined us, and congratulations on becoming the Rogue Invitational Champion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. You are amazing. Laura Horvath with those four straight event wins from event three to event six. That is why she is standing on top of the podium. There's Annie Thorostadter with her daughter Freya. Great to see Annie back in individual competition. And looking like for the second straight year here at the Rogue Invitational, she will finish in second place. Yeah, it's really great to see Annie and have her back on the individual side. And she openly admitted, hey, I don't know what my intentions are for 2023, so hold tight with that. But I'm really enjoying being back here in the crowd, in this atmosphere, and doing it with all the rest of the best females in our sport. There's Kara Saunders who wins the event, but it is Laura Horbath who wins her first ever Rogue Invitational, Emma Lawson and Jack Farlow. That is the future of the sport right there between those two, and we will be seeing a lot more from Emma Lawson. Gabriella Magawa had a solid competition as well. She came into the event in fifth place overall. We will wait to get you the final standings. That's coming up on the Rogue Iron Game. Stick around, everybody. Pat Sherwood and Jamie Hagia will be with you to wrap up the final day of competition here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. The 2022 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by Beyond the Whiteboard. Fitness is a journey. By GoRuck. GoRuck is the rucking company. They build the world's toughest gear for rucking and training. And by Rogue. Don't weaken.
four days of competition, 10 events done, two more champions were crowned for the CrossFit individual men and women at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. This is the Rogue Iron Game. Welcome to the 2022 Rogue Invitational here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Jamie Hagia, joined here by Pat Sherwood. And Pat, this was an exciting finale, but even then there was 10 events total. Your thoughts on the overall CrossFit competition? It was a great competition. I really enjoyed it. Every now and then you get lucky as a fan to have one where event after event, everything seems to change. The leaderboard is always in turmoil. Sometimes there's big point spreads, then it tightens back up. There's heartbreak, there's drama. The Rogue Invitational had it all this year. It definitely lived up to the expectations. Let's take a look at our men's overall leaderboard. This is unofficial, but we have in fifth place, Roman Krennikov with 690 points. We have fourth place, Patrick Vellner. His fellow Canadian, Jeffrey Adler, sitting in that third place podium spot. Chandler Smith on that podium in second place, but it was Justin Medeiros who weathered the storm and found him, himself in that top spot. How did Justin do this? Here's what I really like about Medeiros. First of all, congratulations, champ. Two-time Rogue Invitational champion. That's amazing. But this last four days, it wasn't easy for Justin. It did not go according to plan. It was not smooth sailing by a long shot. So as I've said in a previous show, I know that he has the physical tools, but what makes somebody have sustainability and really be a champion is they, they're somewhat unflappable. And Justin had that between the ears. He came in every day ready to work and it paid off. We don't have the official results for the men quite yet, but we do have the official results for our women. And here is a look at our overall leaderboard for our women. In fifth place, we have Gabriella Megala with 645 points. A tie, but in fourth place, is Ellie Turner with 670 points. Our 17-year-old Emma Lawson making that podium in that third place positioning. Annie Thor's daughter in that second place. And Laura Horvath, she did it. She fought all weekend. And after a tough event eight this morning, she was able to do it. Thoughts on Laura? Horvath, so impressive start to finish. From the very first event, she was always in the conversation. She had good events, she had bad events, but we never for one second said, you know, I don't think Horvath's gonna be on the podium. She just absolutely crushed it. And credit where credit is due, she had, remember, four events in a row, all first place finishes. So congratulations, she did the work, she earned every single one of it. For more on the champs and the CrossFit competition, let's send it over to Sean Woodland and Adrian Conway. Where spots on the podium for the men and the women come down to the final event, and that's exactly what we got. It is. It's exactly what we got, and I'm not sure if we've been spoiled in the past <laughs> with a Matt Fraser and a Tia Claire Toomey, or if now we're getting spoiled with these head-to-head -head competitions, ups, downs, lefts, rights on the scoring podium, and... and it made it for a tight race and very exciting to say the least. Let's talk about Justin Medeiros because he had not one but two kind of uncharacteristic mistakes earlier in the competition and that's what allowed things to get really close but he shook those off and he delivered when it mattered. Yeah, just like we've talked about throughout the course of this week is that Medeiros is hard to beat because he simply doesn't get in his own way. We've historically seen him at the CrossFit Games come up through an event or a series of tests from about mid-pack and pick away at the points. Rarely have we seen him lead early, then lose the lead, then gain it back, then lose the lead and gain it back. And we saw that this week, and it shows me 
that he's got a bit of an iron mind. And we heard Pat Sherwood mention those four wins in a row that Laura Horvath had, but we were talking about it before the competition ended. The fact that she was able to shake off that 19th place finish and then compose herself and go out there and do as well as she did in the final event speaks a lot to how mentally tough she is. Yeah, not even doing so well on just the final, but that event before, in mm -hmm. event nine, where she finished just a seventh place, it was really great damage control, I can say, on a workout where she wouldn't naturally be the favor to win high volume gymnastics, 49 ring muscle ups, but she really showed signs of a difficult competitor to beat when it comes to something that she can actually control versus something that right now those handstand push-ups almost feel out of her control. So she sees the moment when she needed to, and I think that's, of course, why she's wearing that gold medal around her neck. We didn't get to see Chandler Smith compete at the Games because of what happened to him medically at the Granite Games. First time we've gotten to see him compete in person in a while, and it looks like he has taken the next step. I think so. We were all disappointed to not see Chandler be able to show up at the CrossFit Games this year and, and see him show the best of himself at a semifinal level. But this week, he put us on notice. He's back on the scene. You love to see it. He's an exciting competitor to watch. He's someone that's so easy to want to have good things happen for. He is a former military member. He's served our country. He's a great young man with a great attitude, and you really love to see him be able to give his all on the competition floor and for those results to be in his favor. So it's been awesome. And finally, Annie Thoris' daughter, for the second straight year, finishes second at the Rogue Invitational. It is incredible what she has been able to achieve this late in her career. This late in her career. Now, let's not pretend that she's getting old, Sean. She's just been around for a while and been on the scene since she was young. But as a mother, we've seen this resurgence of a new athlete, and this woman has done nothing but continue to impress us and put the rest of these competitors on notice. Annie Thorstadter has gone nowhere. Said she has not made up her mind about what she's going to do next season as far as competing is concerned, but I think this result maybe nudges her a little bit towards the individual competition, but we will have to wait and see. Congratulations to both Justin Medeiros and Laura Horvath and the athletes who competed here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. For Adrian Conway, I'm Sean Woodland. Let's go back to the desk with Jamie Hagia and Pat Sherwood. Thanks, Sean and Adrian, and thanks for calling our CrossFit competition all weekend long. We now have our official results for our men's overall leaderboard after 10 events. It is Justin Medeiros in that top spot, Chandler Smith in, Smith in second, Jeffrey Adler in third, Patrick Villner rounded out by Roman Krenikov. But let's talk about that third place spot in Jeffrey Adler. He had a great finish to the end of the competition, but thoughts on Jeffrey Adler? Jeff Adler, he could not have, if he created the final event. This is probably what it would have been. I mean, it was just a home run for him. He needed it. He delivered third place at the Rogue Invitational. He was also third place last year. And he's so darn strong that it's easy to just categorize him as the strong guy, but that's so not fair. Just rewind back to the beginning of the competition, that long trail run, he was second place on the trail run. So that breadth of capacity makes him the real deal. Taking a look at our third place on the women's side was our 17-year-old, Emma Lawson. I mean, come on, you, you've already said the most astonishing thing. You know, the, the next generation is coming up and they are ready to bring some fierce competition here. Emma Lawson, so impressive to take third place, her first appearance at the Rogue Invitational. Still a high school student. Her whole future is ahead of her, so the best is yet to come as far as I'm concerned. We're going to take a look at our podium right now that is taking place. Emma Lawson, we just talked about her, but she is going to go ahead and come out with that huge smile on her face. You love to see someone so young, so talented, and so humble out there. She's going to take her position up there on the podium. And not only so impressive her physical capacity, but at 17 years young, to have such poise under the pressure of competition is amazing. Next up is second place on our men's side. A fan favorite here. Chandler Smith does it. He returns to the Rogue Invitational as a four-time competitor. He's going to go ahead and jump up on that much-deserved podium, his best finish here at the Rogue Invitational. 100%. Like you said, he's been here every year since it began, but never made the podium until now. Absolutely well-deserved. Congratulations, Chandler. Love to see that big smile. 
Coming up on our women's side to stand on that podium in second place. She needs no introduction. She is Iceland Annie. She's an icon of the sport. Absolutely tremendous. She has done it all. She has nothing left to prove. You think that she might be slowing down after so many years of such hard training, but she somehow, she continues to not only stay relevant, but make her way onto the podium. She's unbelievable. She has competed in over three different decades. Yes, that is exactly. insane. Older than Emma Lawson. She's only been normal life for two of those. And coming up to the podium, fought his way all weekend long. It was back and forth, but in the end, he prevailed and took that first place spot, Justin Medeiros. I really like the way Justin competes. I've had the good fortune of spending a bit of time with him. He's just a good human being. What you think you see on the screen is what you get kind-hearted, jokes around, trains serious, but doesn't take himself too serious. It's, I wish him nothing but the best. He's so much fun to watch. What does it say about his perseverance, Pat? Oh, like I said, nothing about this event went according to plan, <laughs> but he just, he hangs in there. He doesn't beat himself up about it. He somehow lets it just roll off of his back, rolls up his sleeves, gets to work on the next event, and that's a huge advantage. I don't think you can teach that. He just has it. Looking at our women's side, our champion of the 2022 Rogue Invitational. She had her hardships herself this morning, but still found herself in that top spot, Laura Horvath. Such an accomplished athlete that I have to remind myself, she's only 25 years old. You know, Annie's out there in her 30s, still crushing it. Horvath has so much runway ahead of her that we're just starting to see what she's capable of. Who is an athlete, Pat, that you thought we would see up there on the podium? Oh, man. You know, I, I really was actually pulling for Ellie Turner to be up there. You know, she tied for points, couldn't get any closer. And on the men's side of the house, I have to give honorable mention to Vellner. He poured his heart into trying to do it. Congratulations to our men's and women's side on the podium. What an incredible weekend, 10 events. And a lot of money up there. <laughs> a lot of money, 10 events. Body must feel like it got hit by a truck. They're gonna have a fantastic, well-deserved meal tonight and sleep well, like a rock. What would you do after this? Oh, it would be it would be a meal that would, you know, break social media. That's what <laughs> that's what would occur. Pat, your final thoughts on our 2022 Rogue Invitational. Love to start to finish. Love seeing the strong men, the record breakers, the whole nine yards. But let's just for a moment, event number 10, heavy grace. Those times would have been a great regular grace with 135 and 95. And they've done nine previous events. So when you look at their times, keep that in your head. They blew my mind. That will do it for us here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Congratulations to all the athletes that competed and broke world records here. A special thanks to Bill and Katie Henniger for making this possible. All of the fans, the staff, the event crew, the volunteers, and all of the athletes, we thank you for joining us. On behalf of our crew, Pat Sherwood, Dr. Bill Crawford, Sean Woodland, Big Laws, Adrian Conway, and Kiki Dixon. I'm Jamie Hagia. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next year.